The man was 34 years old, and he began to have some not very pleasant thoughts. He wondered when everything had gone wrong. He thought that if he had found the sword even a little earlier, his whole life might have gone differently, and his sister wouldn't have been sent to the Empire. If that had been the case, he wouldn't have turned into the monster he was now. If that had been the case, he wouldn't have met his mentor who taught him everything. The time he spent with her was the best he had so far. She was able to bring grace into his life. If he knew now that he would regret everything, he would behave better, because in reality, he wanted something completely different. Some young lad came up to the man and pointed a sword at him with trembling hands. He thought to himself about the guy. This poor guy, even in this condition, is holding onto a sword. The man grinned and said that he had already explained to the lad that he would not fight children. The young man said the man killed his father, but he says he doesn't remember it. The boy called the man a monster. The man thinks he's been called a monster so many times that he's overreacting to it. His body is falling apart and aching in pain, muscles clenching. His brain, ready to melt at any second, is sending signals that it's time to vent it all, but the man himself wants to wait a little longer. The man chuckles and says that he killed all the masters, single-handedly destroyed the great Tolkien Empire, exterminated the imperial family, and after that the young man calls him a monster. The man asks if the young man knows how many people were killed by his sword. Hundreds of thousands. That's how many he killed and after that the young man can still call him a monster. He says he's as much of a monster as the guy is a man and there's absolutely nothing to be surprised about. The young guy starts to tremble and clutches the sword tighter in his hands. The man thinks that he is standing in expensive clothes and can barely hold the sword. In this way, he looks a lot like himself when he was young. The man decides to ask the guy's name. The man replies that his name is Jack Stewart. The man says that his name is Jack too, and he has killed so many people. But he doesn't even remember anyone with the last name Stewart. The guy tearfully says that maybe his dad wasn't so good, but he, he still needed him. Jack thought to himself that was amazing, though he was envious. The man said he wouldn't apologize for killing the guy's father, but would do him a favor and let him kill himself. He said that now was the best time to avenge his father and become famous as the man who killed the monster. In fact, the man could have easily gotten out of the situation alive. A broken leg could easily be healed. He asked if the guy didn't want to be a hero. Mutilated organs can be regenerated, but he doesn't want to do that. The young man swung his sword, but at the last moment he dropped the sword and knelt down in front of the man he wanted to kill. The boy cried out. The man thought it was obvious, for the kneeling man in front of him was still a child, and he would not be able to kill him. He raised his hand, and, placing it on the top of the kid's head, said he did good. He said that being a hero imposes an obligation, and he would have to undergo feats all his life. He advised the lad not to live in regrets as he was still young. The man thought it was strange indeed but he felt sorry for the lad sitting on his knees in front of him. He told him to tell the others that the demon was dead and the war was over. The young man asked why, with such power, the man was living like this. He pondered the question, but it was too late, for that was the end of his story. The man fell to the ground and thought he felt his end. He felt himself stop feeling his fingers. His body felt like a balloon deflating. Everything swam in front of his eyes and they began to close in on themselves. Slowly the man began to forget how to breathe and the sounds from outside ceased to exist. In his last moment of existence, he wondered if he could change his sad ending if he started over. Such was his last thought. A man thinks he is having a dream. In this dream, there was a father who always doubted whether his son was his. There was the face of a mother who died shortly after his birth. A sister known for her beauty even outside of the empire and an older brother who constantly pestered him. All his memories came back to the man. He forgot his real name, Jack Ballantyr, and became a soldier who had crossed an entire continent. Thoughts of the past began to overwhelm the man's head, and he couldn't tell if it was a dream or reality. Jack wondered if he had been killed or died himself. Or maybe all that he sees is just a memory before he dies. The boy saw it and said that he could go crazy like that. Jack thought back to the Second Continental War he had started. He remembered his victory in it and his ruthless rule that made him a monster among monsters. Driven by revenge for his sister Jack destroyed the entire Tolkien Empire that dominated the western continent and killed all those who bore the Tolkien surname. The man reflected on the fact that so many times he had started wars and ended them with his victory. Success had always accompanied all of his goals. It was somehow very easy to face death, especially since there was no point in living to him anymore. His heart had already started to stop, but suddenly, 
The boy stood in front of the mirror and groped himself. He could not understand what was happening. He thought that it was definitely not black magic or illusion. Then, there was only one option. He had traveled back in time. But Jack didn't understand how that was even possible. The Marcus of Ballantyre was a prominent family in the Teslam Empire. They were among those who openly sympathized with the ruling power represented by the emperor. Jack was the third child in the family, the youngest. But if the title Young Marquis of the Teslan Empire was enough for him, he would have lived an excellent and happy life. But things were not so simple in the house of the Marquis of Ballantyre. The place where the third son was located was called the Rose Garden. It was a kind of annex to the manor house. The garden looks beautiful, but it was actually a kind of exile place for the youngest of the Marcus Ballantyre's children. This place was to shield the third son from the support of his family and vassals. That's what the Rose Garden really was. A man approached the boy sitting on the floor and said he had brought him a drink. It was the only person in the whole manor who really appreciated the young lord. The boy was constantly supported by their family's butler, Ron. The boy joked that the Ron he knew was always a bit sneaky and asked if he had poured poison into the glass. Ron started to get too emotional saying that he hadn't and he wouldn't dare, but the boy smiled at him and told him he was joking, thanking the butler for everything. The man turned around and left. Jack at this time remembered that there were eleven other people in the rose garden besides him. One of those people is Ron, who had just brought him tomato juice. The remaining ten people are the guards assigned to keep an eye on the boy. In any case, Jack is not interested in anyone else in this garden except Ron. The boy wondered what to do and how to go on, because this was all for real. He didn't know he could go back in time, and it had only been an hour since he realized what had happened. It could certainly be considered a second chance, but at the moment Jack was only 14 years old. Right now there are no wounds on his arms and inside there isn't even a hint of a heart of mana, and if you compare him to other children from noble families. He's at rock bottom right now. Suddenly, a man came up behind him and hit him on the head. Jack didn't understand what was happening, and holding his head, said that it hurt. He thought to himself that he had relaxed a lot, which was understandable, since it had been decades since he had last been hit on the head. Standing with his back to his assailant, Jack said that even a lion doesn't touch animals at a watering hole. Jack turned around and saw his older brother, who asked angrily how he dared to talk to his elders like that. Palin Ballantyre is the second child in the family and Jack's older brother. He is three years older than the boy. By the way, the problem why Jack didn't practice, or rather couldn't practice magic, was Palon and his constant teasing of his younger brother. Standing in front of his older brother, Jack looked angrily into his eyes and thought that it had been so many years, and the older man still pissed him off. Jack remembered a moment from his childhood, when he'd been sitting in the living room with his brother, who'd poured a cup of tea over his head and told him that, if he wanted to, he could kill him any minute. He said that, unlike his sister, he was completely useless and could do nothing with a sword or magic. Palon said that if Jack wanted to learn magic, he would consider it a betrayal and kill him. He added that his brother has Marcus' blood in him, and that's the only reason he's still in this family, so he should be quieter than water and lower than grass, and no one knows how things will turn out. Palon said that when he becomes the head of the family, then maybe he will accept Jack as a younger brother. Jack was very weak as a child and because of this, many in the family mocked him. Conversations went beyond the family and even the commoners mocked him and smiled maliciously at the boy. They said that the third child of the Marcus of Ballantyr is a complete mediocrity. The spread of rumors especially served his older brother Palin and Count Mentis. But even so, now the boy laughs at his older brother. Still, the first child in their family is a girl. She is the only one in the family that can be relied on and the only sibling that cares about Jack. Their sister is one year older than Palon, but she can't take on the responsibilities of the head of the family because she was born a girl. Her fate was predetermined from the beginning. The fate of the beautiful daughter of a Marquis who could not lead the family. She would have to marry someone their father would like, live her whole life in a small manner, giving birth to heirs. Such was and will be the poor girl's fate. And now the man who is most conducive to this is standing before Jack. A man who is ready to sell her to the first man he meets, just to take the place of the hair sooner. The boy thought that if he killed this man, he would be doing the world a favor. Palon was not happy with the way his younger brother was looking at him and swung to hit him. But he couldn't, because Jack intercepted his hand, squeezing his wrist. The older one started to shout how dare the younger brother grab his arm, but the boy deftly threw him over his shoulder. 
Startled, the second son asked what was wrong with his brother. Jack looked at him and asked if he could have a hand to help him up. The angry older man quickly jumped up from the wooden floor and grabbed his sword to gather mana. One of the guards said that something terrible was about to happen and wanted to stop them, but the other one intervened, saying that they would only make things worse for themselves by interfering. The boy thought that of course the guards wouldn't stop them. Ron intervened, standing in front of Jack and asking the older man to stop and not use mana. For that, Palon slapped the butler. Jack didn't do anything about it. He figured there was no point, since Ron had tons of secrets of his own and could defend himself quite well on his own. The second son started yelling that they both Jack and Ron were going to die, but the boy said that he seemed to want to stun them with his yelling. Then Palon, already enraged, did something the younger one didn't expect. He drew his sword. Jack thought that it didn't matter that his body didn't know what training was and couldn't open mana, because he wasn't going to lose. Palon threw a punch, but Jack dodged it and thought that third-round magic was the limit for the older man. No matter how expensive a sword he uses, he's still a child. It was a mistake for Palon to think he could defeat the younger man with that kind of swordsmanship. Jack wondered if he should kill Palon now, but then he decided he shouldn't yet. He told his brother that he needed to visit a healer to fix his head. Jack realized that to use the third circle he needed to fill his whole body, including his head, with mana. The boy grabbed his brother's head and slammed it against the column. He was going to take revenge on his elder for every mockery of himself with a hundred of his. The impact with this stone pillar made Palon unconscious, and Jack put his foot on his knee and asked him if he was dead. The guards came up and one of them wanted to draw his sword, but Jack told him not to unless he wanted to end up like his brother. The guards stopped and Jack took his older brother by the hair and dragged him to the fountain. He said his older brother could use some weight loss, as he was quite heavy. Asking if Palon was hot, he suggested that he freshen up and dunked his head in the fountain. Jack wondered what kind of shock the older man was in, if he wasn't even using the mana he'd worked so hard to save. Come to think of it, he was the reason everything had gone wrong. After Palon sent his sister to the Empire, he poisoned his father and took the title of head of the family himself. He tried to influence the affairs of the Empire as if he had the right to do so. As a result, the house of the Marquis of Ballantyr was destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. Jack didn't care about his father or the house, but he was sorry to lose the opportunity his sister had given them all with her marriage. Sister has always been very intelligent. She has a kind character. How painful it was for her to leave her home, and the boy could not even imagine the feelings that were driving her. The girl traveled to another empire to ensure her family's good reputation. She knew what she was doing, for her fiancé was the fourth prince about whom there were terrible rumors. He had told her during the wedding, when he saw the bride's upset face when she didn't see her relatives, that she was only an illegitimate wife, so no one would come to see her. She had only to listen, nod to everything they said, and remember to smile all the time. For the sake of her family, the girl was willing to do anything, even a relationship like this. If only her father and Palin knew how her sister really felt. Jack caught himself thinking that it was time to stop thinking because it made him want to kill his brother more and more here and now. Palon started to beg for mercy. The boy thought that the look on his brother's face was very familiar, for it was the same grimace of fear of death he had seen so often in the war. The third son sat down beside his brother and put his arm around him, still holding his hair. He told him to think about what he had done to him, or else he would help him, or rather let him feel the abuse on his own skin, so that he would know the importance of family ties. The second son immediately said he was wrong, but Jack slapped him in the face anyway. Suddenly, Ron asked the young master to stop. The boy looked at the butler and slammed his brother's head against the side of the fountain, shattering his head. Calling the guards, Jack said that Palon was still alive, and the guards should take him somewhere. Soon everyone in the house found out about what had happened in the Rose Garden and, of course, turned everything upside down. Palon Ballantyr is Jack Ballantyr's half-brother and would be hair backed by the forces of the influential Earl of Mentis family. So it goes without saying that the sight of his shattered head and newfound fear of the water caused an all-out commotion in a family where it was expected that the title of Marcus would pass to him. Rumors abounded. Pelin got the third round at the age of 17. It was a miracle at such a young age, and everyone wondered how his younger brother had managed to defeat him. Jack had been taught neither magic nor swordsmanship so the younger brother had been hiding his talents all this time. But the question remains why and why showed it now. 
Next year, Palon would be 18 years old and would have been officially introduced as the heir. However, now that the younger brother has shown his claim to be the head of the family, no one knows how this will end. These rumors were heard by Jack's sister and asked the servants to tell everything they know about it. The rumors began to spread further and many people in the manor invented more and more details about what had happened. Soon the rumors reached the Marquis of Ballantyre and he ordered to call his youngest son. Jack even wondered how the head of the family would react to such a thing. Jack sat in his room, thanking Ron for the food the butler had prepared. Suddenly one of the maids came into the room and called the butler over to him and said something in his ear. The lad was surprised and concerned and told his master that he had been invited by the Marcus right away. The younger son got up and putting on his cloak, got ready to go to his father. To Ron's statement that he would go with him, Jack replied that he was no longer a toddler to be stood up for. The butler bowed and told the gentleman to be careful and asked him to return soon. As the boy walked to his father's chambers, everyone was looking at him and he thought that he hadn't felt this way in a long time, that it was as if he didn't exist to those around him. But he didn't care what the others thought of him, the main thing was that this would all be over soon. As soon as he held out his hand to enter his father's chambers, the guards blocked his path with their spears pointed crosswise. Jack looked at the guards and thought they were pretending he wasn't here. How foolish that was. The boy first called out to the knight, but when he didn't answer, he mockingly asked the knight if he was blind or deaf and kicked him in the knee, to which he received a fierce look. Before a look like that would have made him scared and run right back, he wasn't going to do that now. Jack told the guard to give him a simpler look, or he would disembowel him. He told the guard to let him through, after all the Marcus had called him. The guard apologized but never let him through. Jack hit the knight in the knee again, but this time with such force that the grown man knelt down. He said that the Marcus had called him and asked why the knights would not let him enter. The knight replied that he could not answer the question asked. The boy asked if that meant he would have to wait. Then he said that there was no point in standing around waiting to be called, he was nobody here anyway. The boy turned around and started to walk away and the guard asked where he was going. Jack told the guard to tell his father that if he wanted to talk to him, he could come, and he wondered to himself whether the Marcus would ever change or not. Counselor to the Marcus of Ballantyre conveyed to his master that his son had gone, to which the Marcus replied that the younger man had changed a great deal. Jack sits in the garden and wonders where his father is, for he should have arrived by now. As soon as the boy thought about it, the Marcus and his entourage appeared. Even from the Marcus's face, it was obvious that he was a stubborn ass. The boy thought it was amazing, because that's how he remembered his father. Sometimes Jack tries to think that his father doesn't exist at all. In a past life he tried to kill him when he tried to run away from home. He is a man capable of selling his child for reputation, too greedy for power, and too incapable of achieving what he wants. That's what the Marcus of Ballantyre was. The boy greeted his father meekly, not even calling him Marcus or father, for he saw no reason why he should call this creature his father. He stretched out in his chair and looked at the Marcus calmly. The man asked what had happened to his son, and the boy asked incomprehensibly what he meant. Marcus Ballantyre started yelling at Jack, saying how dare he treat the head of the family like that, but the boy paid no attention to her, considering her just a barking mud. Jack suggested that his father come inside as he had traveled a long way around the estate or else talk right here. Having said that, the boy threw the plate away and it shattered. Everyone was shocked at such insolent behavior from the third son, and the Marcus, apparently wanting to find the reason for such insolence, decided to check if his son had a heart of manna. Having ascertained that the boy did not have one, his father asked why his son had not shown his talent in martial arts before. Jack answered that it turned out to be something like that, but the Marquis started shouting at him again, how at such a young age he had so much nerve and was so arrogant. But the head of the house gestured for her to shut up, saying that he used to think that the third son was useless, but it turned out that he was not. The boy stood up from his chair and said that since he was useless, he was not worthy to be called the son of the Marcus. The father asked if the boy wanted to be recognized in this way, but Jack said he didn't care at all. The father said he heard his son and simply turned around to leave. Determined not to let it go, the boy went to the Marquise of Ballantyre, Pelin's mother, and said that after what had happened, she would get a lot of wrinkles on her face. He asked her to take care of her skin. The woman boiled up with anger, calling Jack a little lad. The boy thought that he felt nothing good for the Marquise, but it was very satisfying to look at her angry face. Realizing his victory, the boy bowed and wished the woman a good evening. 
He also asked her to convey his deepest regrets and sincere apologies to his second son. In the evening, Ron tells the young master the contents of a letter stating that Jack Ballantyre, the third child of the family, is sentenced to solitary confinement for 20 days for making a mess in the house. The boy drew quietly, and Ron was angry and asked what had happened in his absence. The third son asked the butler not to yell, because what happened, happened. He said that before, Ron had just stood by and watched Peel and mock them, but now he was suddenly abruptly angry. Jack wondered what this solitary confinement would be like, because he had already been banished to the Rose Garden, and now this. He wondered if they wanted to ban him from going outside for Tecchio. Ron said he had only a month of vacation left at the academy, and wondered why he was in solitary confinement. When Jack heard about the academy, he understood. He was 14 now, which meant he had to attend the Imperial Academy. All aristocrats of the Teslan Empire must attend this academy. Unless the children were disabled, it was a compulsory place of study. The studies lasted four years and started just at 14, so Jack should just be in his freshman year right now. The first semester was already over and summer vacation had begun. His tutor was just connected to the academy and the boy could skip any subject there except hers. The boy said he would not quarrel with the Marcus over nothing anymore. There were 27 days of vacation left, 20 of which Jack must spend in detention. It is six days' ride from Ballantyre Manor to this place, which means that his parents will literally turn him out as soon as he is confined. The boy asked where the imprisonment would take place. The butler replied that there was one place, but it was for criminals who'd done something wrong on the estate. Jack immediately realized that Ron was talking about the prison. The boy was shocked by such a thing and said he wouldn't just leave it like that. In fact, vacations in the academy are given to the shins of aristocratic families not only to rest. This was clear even from Palin, who had his head smashed in. Almost every day from the beginning of the vacation until he got his head bashed in, he attended social events and met with other aristocratic offspring in their families. Jack had no interest in these events or in the affairs of the Marquises, but it pissed him off that the relatives always said there was no room for a boy there or in the family. He decided to go to the prison himself, not waiting for an escort to be sent for him. It was hard to tell from Ron's weeping face as the young gentleman was led away. The cell had a restroom, a bed, and three meals a day. But the Marcus's son didn't understand the point of it. The blanket hadn't been changed in half a century, and even the flies refused to eat the chowder. Jack had a lot of time to think in solitary confinement, but his first thoughts were that it was too much. Aristocrats who have land holdings can punish their inhabitants as they wish, using local laws rather than imperial laws. In fact, in their own territory, aristocrats have the same rights as the ruler of the empire. Jack thought that even though he is imprisoned under the Marcus orders, he is still an aristocrat. Maybe this way his father wants to comfort the wounded second. He wondered if he was using poison or forbidden artifacts as an excuse for the public, though that was over the top. Surely the Marcus and his wife had already come up with some story that Jack Ballantyr, the disgrace of the family, had studied forbidden black magic out of greed, and when his older brother had caught him doing it and ordered him to stop, had used it against him. But even though he was badly hurt, he still decided to honorably forgive his younger brother. Jack thought, Okay, he'd be here for a couple of days, but he didn't want to spend the whole vacation here. He realized that he could get out of here right now, and he didn't care about this place, but he couldn't do that for three reasons. Ron, his sister, and his mentor. Plus right now, he was too weak to survive on his own. The boy was 168 centimeters tall and 55 kilograms of weight, no muscles. He knows the rule of survival in this world, which says that the strong devours the weak and only the strongest survive and the weak become food and die. In his past life, due to his strength, he was not only able to survive, but also to hear what he wanted. Jack doesn't want to cause a massacre in this life, but he still needs to get revenge on a lot of people. This requires only two things, time and power, and they can be obtained at the academy. By studying, Jack will be able to gain more influence and buy time to gain his former power. If everything works out, the boy will protect Ron, his sister, and his mentor. Even though he doesn't like it, he needs to take back what is rightfully his. There are a total of 10 levels of mastery of magic, from the first to the third circle for beginners to learn magic, from the fourth to the sixth circle for experts, from the seventh to the ninth circle for people who possess magic at the highest level. The tenth circle is for masters, or as they are called, superhumans. Anyway, it's a good thing no one's in jail. 
That way Jack could create the first circle in two hours. He thought, such a weakling at this age. In his previous life, he had started studying mana at 17. Remembering something, the boy created the small glowing ball of magic and launched it into the air, twirling it a little with his finger. Catching himself, he dispersed the balloon with his hands, realizing that he shouldn't get caught. Suddenly, he heard the clatter of heels. Jack quickly ducked into bed and covered himself with a blanket, pretending to be asleep. The boy thought the Marquis had come to visit him, but the sound was not so heavy. Suddenly, someone called the boy by the affectionate name of Jackie. Rousing himself from his bed, the boy thought that the person he could only see in dreams in his past life had come to see him. It was his sister, Elizabeth Ballantyre. She asked him if his brother was hurt, and Jack thought how beautiful and kind-hearted his sister was. Elizabeth asked if Jack was hurt. The boy replied that he was fine. Her sister decided to ask him why he used black magic, since she could have taught him ordinary magic. She said that her brother shouldn't have come home, but should have stayed at the academy. The boy cried at that. Elizabeth asked if everything was definitely okay, and if her brother was feeling bad since he was crying. Jack said he was just really glad it was all real. But suddenly the third child gets serious and asks if his sister wants to run away. He said they could run away together to a small village and work in the fields together. He said he knows how the second and his mother feel about the girl. He suggested that they leave everything behind and live in a quiet place. He would find a man who would genuinely love his sister. He asked if it was a bad thing to live in the countryside with a man you love and not be under the oppression of the Marcus. The girl said not to say so, for he was their father and would remain so. She said that the Marcus loved their mother, and from that love they came, so the boy should not say such things. She said she knew how his father felt about his youngest son and would try to change things, but he would have to be patient. The girl had said the same thing in her previous life. Now Jack was convinced that he had indeed traveled back in time. Taking his sister's hand in his own, Jack said how good it was that he could see his sister again. Getting serious, the boy asked his sister to step away from the bars. Using magic, he broke the lock and stepped out to his sister. The girl was shocked and asked how he did it, but the boy just walked up to her and hugged her, apologizing. The girl pulled her brother away from her a little and asked if he was really okay. The boy hugged her again and told her that this time it would be different, not like before. He said they wouldn't have to go back again. He would give her the life she deserved. Afterward, Jack learns the truth about the fourth prince who took his sister in a past life. And that truth will be far more horrible than he thought. It will make him a much bigger monster than he was before. The truth was that his sister's life had been a living hell that no one knew about. In a past life, Jack had tortured the fourth prince for what he had inflicted on his sister and vowed revenge not only on him, but on the entire family, no, the entire Tolkien Empire. In his previous life, Jack had run away from home at 17, but even after another 10 years he realized that nothing had changed there. The Tolkien Empire was gone, and with it the Marquesses of Ballantyre. After this event, the Teslan Empire became the largest empire in the western continent. The Ballantyre family house still continued to exist nominally, but the entire Marcus family was imprisoned. After learning this, Elizabeth begged the fourth prince to save her family. She was no higher than an ordinary concubine, so the prince rejected her request, but the girl could not leave it like that. For three days and three nights, she begged the prince for forgiveness, standing in the rain, and then the imperial family listened to her. That's how the story was told across the continent. But only Jack knew the real horror behind those words. The girl was very grateful to the prince for saving her family and promised to do whatever he wanted, but he pushed her back against the wall and said that the girl seemed to misunderstand everything. He said not to forget that the prince could destroy her entire family at the snap of his fingers, but not now. As long as the girl obeyed him, everything would be fine. From that moment on, Elizabeth literally became his toy. The third prince and the emperor controlled her as they wished. In this situation, the recognized wives could not stand aside. What happened afterward was obvious. The fourth prince eventually lost interest in Elizabeth, and the girl literally became a hostage in the annex. It wasn't long before the house of Ballantyre was finally destroyed. For revenge, Jack had to become a demon in order to destroy all the Tolkens and everyone connected to them. The Empress, the Princess, the wife of the Third Prince, the wife of the Fourth, the families that supported them, even distant relatives. Jack wanted to wipe every trace of the Tolkens from the face of the earth. However, that was too horrible a future. Now standing in the prison of the manor, he held the hand of his sister, 
who told him that he needed to watch his health and she would talk to his father herself. Walking through the mansion to her father's chambers, the girl thought about how much her brother had changed. Before, he would have just put up with all the taunts, but now he had decided to retaliate. She didn't know if that was good or bad. But what she didn't care for was the rumors that he was rumored to be using black magic. With her sixth circle, the girl hadn't seen any trace of it. Although she figured that her father with his seventh circle could see better, the girl was convinced that it was the words of the Marquis. Going to her father, the girl immediately asked to let Jack out of jail. When her father asked why did that, the girl said that he hadn't studied black magic. She said it was very complicated and he definitely wouldn't be able to handle it. The girl thought that the father just didn't want the truth to become public. The girl said that Jack didn't need the title of head of the family and realized that it was a warning to herself. Elizabeth had long ago realized what fate awaited her. A life of a toy created to elevate the status of the house awaited her, and this warning was true for her. What would happen to Jack if she refused to follow the path she'd been set on? Marcus Ballantier said that the girl herself must realize that the youngest child was not suitable for their family. He said that when Jack became of age, the Marcus would announce his death and send him far away to live under another name. The girl rejoiced and asked if what her father said was true. The man replied that it was true, but until then she must not forget her duty and after that too. The head of the family said that it was still very strange that the youngest was able to defeat the second. After all, the older one already had the third circle, and the younger one didn't have one at all. The girl was surprised at this and could not understand, if Jack has no circle, how then he was able to break the lock on the bars. The father said that in principle it did not matter, and the girl could let the younger brother out of jail. The girl thanked her father and left his chambers. As she walked out the door, she cried, remembering her brother's words about escaping. She said that it was impossible and there was no escape from fate. Jack woke up this morning, thinking that yesterday had caused him to have nightmares about his past life all night. Maybe this place was giving him bad dreams of its own. The door to the boy's cell opened and a guard entered. The man said that the young master had been released. Jack was a little perturbed that a common guard addressed the Marquis son as you, but he decided not to do anything for the time being because he could not be provoked by such behavior. The guard held the boy's things in his hands. Jack tried to take them away, but the guard wouldn't let him, saying that there were no shoes, and that the Marquis son would have to go on his way without annoying him. At this, Jack was already angry. He threateningly asked the guard if the Marquis's son was a friend to him to treat him like that. The guard immediately started to justify himself and said that the boy had misunderstood, but Jack had already gathered his mana in his fist and hit the guard. Upon returning to the Rose Garden, Jack was met by a worried Ron. When he saw the blood on the boy's clothes, he asked if his master was hurt, but Jack replied that the blood was not his and Ron had nothing to worry about. He noticed that there were more guards in the garden than usual, ten guards and one iron blood knight. Jack thought he felt sorry for the knight. Surely his dreams and plans didn't include looking after the young offspring of a wealthy family. He thought it was sad to even look at the knight, but at one point the young man looked at Jack. The boy realized that the knight was aware of what he was in jail for. The knight walked over to Jack and Ron, and bowing politely to the third child of the Marcus, asked him to tell him what had happened in prison. Jack was surprised and wondered why the knight was being so polite to him. The knight said that he had been told that he had attacked a guard, broken the poor man's finger and gouged out his right eye. Ron objected why a young lord would do such a thing. The knight said he just needed to know why the young lord had done that to him because he had no right to do it. The boy grinned and asked the knight if he was sure it was okay to use the word right in such a situation. Jack analyzed the knight. Judging by his movements, leg position and posture, he has at least a fourth circle. The knight is probably Mentis's dog, but at least he knows his place. The knight moved another step toward the boy, but Ron blocked his path. The knight said that the young lord was crossing the line, to which the boy asked what was wrong with addressing a dog as a dog. The boy decided to clear things up and said that the knight was just assigned to watch him and was given no other orders. Therefore, the knight would be the one to deal with the consequences. Jack told the knight not to dare talk to him about rights if he wanted a promotion. The knight asked what would happen to him if the boy continued to make a fuss. Jack said that was about it and the knight should plead with him that the Marcus' youngest son would not do anything in front of the knight. The knight apologized. Jack said it was good that the knight could think. Jack turned around to leave and told the knight to deal with what happened, 
and then come back and report everything. And if the knight had any problems, he could go directly to the Marquis of Ballantyre, for the boy would not see him as a knight. He said that the young man would be a chicken. As they approached the castle, Jack said he was hungry and asked Ron to cook him some meat. Jack was in his chambers happily eating meat and praising Ron for his excellent cooking. The boy realized by the look in the butler's eyes that Ron had something to say, but when the butler replied that it was nothing, he suggested that he eat together. The boy asked if Ron was hungry. He said there was plenty of food and they might as well eat together. The butler said he didn't think he could share a meal with his master, but the boy told him to sit down as he had a conversation to have with the butler. Ron obediently sat down and said he would listen to his master. Jack asked how his sister was doing. Ron replied that Mistress Elizabeth was doing as well as usual. Jack said that Ron was no fool and understood better than anyone what his sister was really like. The butler said he didn't know what his master was talking about, so the boy decided to start at a distance. Ron had always been an excellent cook. Ever since he was a little boy, all of the boy's memories were filled with the butler. When Jack didn't have a care in the world, he would often run to Ron to see if he was cooking something delicious. Ron said he knew that, but Jack said there was something he didn't know. The boy said that Ron was a ninth circle mage, and then the butler's look became more serious. Jack went on to say that since Ron had been at his mother's side, you must know what she was like. Jack himself had not had a chance to be with his mother, for she had died the day he was born. They say that Elizabeth is like his mother, which means she was a good person. Jack said that he knew that Ron had tried to protect his mother. He also knew that there was a ninth circle mage in his mother's retinue. The boy joked that if this had been a novel, he would have complained that the plot was too unrealistic, but it was all true, not a novel. In his previous life, when Jack Ballantyre ran away from home, he was not alone. Ron was singing with him, and they were trying to escape from the guards sent by the Marquis of Ballantyre. They were knights of the Iron Blood True, like the one he had met in the Rose Garden. The Marquis had sent them to kill his own son. The commander of the squad was a ninth circle swordsman. Ron died that day defending his master. Jack said that it was hard for him to accept the fact that all this time Ron had been a ninth circle mage and belonged to his mother's retinue. But Ron might have known that the woman was not an ordinary person, and not even Ballantyre knew that. Although, Ron might not have known that. However, Jack can't pretend that he doesn't know anything and the most important thing for him now is to realize what kind of person Ron really is. The butler says he doesn't understand what the master wants him to do. Jack then said that he can't trust anyone but Ron and his sister, so Elizabeth needs to be protected. The butler said that Mistress Elizabeth has a sixth circle in her 16 years, so she is quite capable of protecting herself on her own. Jack said she is too kind and is even willing to die for others. But dying for family or honor is not the kind of fate he would want for his sister. Only a Marcus would like that. The boy said he would go to the academy tomorrow and wasn't going home yet if everything went well. Jack asked Ron to stay with Elizabeth for only four years, and then he could live his own life. Ron didn't understand his master's words about his own life. Then the boy said that then he could not hide behind his master's back and be his shadow, but find what he wanted to do. The butler asked why three years, then the boy said that during that time, he would learn and be able to protect his sister. The boy wanted to say something else, but there was a knock at the door. The boy was unhappy that someone dared to interfere with their conversation, but still allowed the guest to enter. The knight approached the boy and began to report that the guard who had been injured in the prison had been treated and sent to the healing center. Jack asked if that was all, and the knight said that he and the other knights had found out that the victim had carelessly mishandled his blade during training and had cut off his finger. Also, while in a state of shock, he accidentally knocked out his right eye. When the young gentleman saw this, he was frightened and ran away. That's the story the knights will tell. The boy praised the knight and asked if, since he was the Marcus of Mutt, he should be given a goodie for a good job. The knight said he shouldn't. The boy wanted to address him as chicken, but the knight interrupted him and said his name was James Cantor. The boy seemed to let that pass and said that he was going to start fencing training and he needed a wooden and real sword for that. James said that wasn't his responsibility. The boy was surprised and wondered if the knight still had any self-respect left. Out loud, he said that he knew the knight didn't like him, so a training the boy would give James a chance to beat the crap out of him. Ron and James were shocked, and the knight decided to ask again if the young lord was serious. The boy said he was quite serious and showed his hands as proof. The boy asked if he could hold a sword with those hands. Jack said it would not be difficult to defeat him. 
James then asked if that meant that the young gentleman was asking him to be his fencing teacher. The boy laughed and said that he had only heard something so delusional three times in his entire life. The boy said to carry swords. The butler asked Jack if he was all right. The boy didn't understand the butler's question. Ron said that the knight had a fourth circle. The boy asked what the big deal was. The butler asked if the young lord was confident in his abilities and said he was worried about the lord. Jack then offered to bet on whether he or the knight would win. Ron said that in that case, they should bet not on losing, but on how many bruises the young lord would have after the fight. The boy found the butler's idea interesting and asked what he could bet. Ron said again that the knight's level was much higher than the lord's and asked if he was really willing to go for it. The boy said that if the knight hit him even once, Ron would win. The loser would have to do the winner's deed. Ron got a little bit sad and said that if the young master likes, he can just give the order after all Ron is just a servant in his house. The boy said he only trusted Ron and his sister in the house, pointing his fork at the butler. Ron was pleased with this attitude, but to avoid showing it, he told the young master that it was not nice to point a fork at another person. Jack told the butler that if he was so pleased about it, he shouldn't hide it, especially since he was bad at it. But the next moment, the boy became serious and said that the butler must have misunderstood him, for he was telling the truth. The boy does not order his men, but only asks them to do something. So he asked Ron to look after his sister. The butler said that since the Lord said so, he could not refuse him. Suddenly there was another knock on the room. James came in and got down on one knee in front of the boy and said that he had overreacted and if the master needed an assistant for training. He was ready to offer help and asked him to forgive his insolence. Jack thought that too many people like that straddler in the jail disrespected the third child of the Marcus. But indirect insults and direct abuse are different things. James is afraid of the consequences, so he gets down on one knee and says all this. Jack says that since his chicken agrees, they should go to a deserted place, unless, of course, the knight is afraid of losing to the boy. Jack asked Ron if there was such a place anywhere nearby. The butler thought for a few seconds and said he knew one. They came to the basement of the mansion, and Jack was surprised that there was such a place as a fully equipped exercise room. The boy asked if this was where Ron exercised. The butler replied that Mrs. Noel, Jack's mother, had equipped this place for her two children. The boy asked why he didn't know about it until now, to which the butler replied that he had never been interested. The boy noticed in his thoughts that, although this place hasn't been used in a very long time, it's quite clean. It looked like someone was always cleaning the place. Jack realized that Ron had been doing it all along and thanked him for that. Then he turned to the knight and asked why he was standing there. The boy told him to hand him a wooden sword. The knight wanted to say something, but the boy said that he wanted to start training faster, and it would be better to start with the wooden sword. James handed the young lord the wooden sword, and the boy took it and immediately got into a fighting stance. The knight noted that the boy knew how to hold a sword. Jack smirked at such words and thought that if James had known how many people had been killed by his sword in his past life, he would not be smiling like that now, but he still thanked the knight for the compliment. He said he wanted a fair fight and immediately lunged at the knight. James fended off the blow and thought it was a simple attack and a rookie will always be a rookie. He thought that he should try not to hurt the young lord. Literally in the same second, the boy's sword was at the knight's neck. Ron was surprised at this turn of events, and Jack calmly said that if it had been a real sword, the knight would have been dead by now. He said he had asked for a fair fight, not a submission. Shocked, James couldn't understand how the boy knew such techniques and whether he already knew how to handle a sword. Ron watched the training and didn't understand what had just happened. The knight was able to easily repel the attack, but the young lord was somehow miraculously able to reach his neck. Butler didn't think that at the age of 14, the boy would already be capable of such a thing. He had expected the fight to go something like this. The knight would immediately knock the wooden sword out of the young lord's hands knock him to the floor, and it would end like that. But in fact, it was not like that at all. Jack's stance was excellent, and his defense and attack were correct. Ron realized that if he had a real sword in his hands, the knight would really die. Ron wondered if something had really happened to the young master. He had never seen him with a sword, much less in training. He thought that maybe the young master was talented, but then he thought that all these techniques were too good even for a genius. The tired boy suddenly asked the knight if it was true that he was in his twenties. James replied that he was twenty-three. The boy then asked what time the knight started training with Mana. The knight said he started training at eighteen. 
The boy realized that in five years, James had gained a fourth circle. Jack thought that a fourth round at 23 was pretty good considering he started training quite late, which meant he had talent. Applying magic, Jack looked at James. The boy realized that the knight might have a seventh or even an eighth round. He could reach that level if he practiced harder. He could have gotten the title of captain of the knights with that kind of strength. The boy walked over to the rack of real swords and pulled one out and thought it was funny. Because with such talent the knight had to be a babysitter and look after the child. Jack said he was beginning to like the knight. James said that the young lord could hurt himself with a real sword. The boy laughed and walked over to the knight and said he would give him some advice. There is a difference between confidence and vanity, and James thinks what happened was an accident. That's why the young lord calls him chicken. He told the knight to attack, and he immediately rushed into battle. The boy thought that naming this trait was hindering his development and easily knocked the wooden sword out of James' hands and put the blade of his sword to the knight's throat. The boy nonchalantly said that this was the second time the knight had died today. A surprised James asked how the young lord had done it. The boy said he merely changed the direction of his sword during the attack. James said he realized that but didn't understand how he did it. The boy said it was an advanced technique, and if James wanted to, he could show it again. The knight said that in that case, he would take the real sword too. While James was taking the sword, Jack turned to Ron and asked if he had won the argument. The butler said that of course he had won. The boy said that in that case, his wish remained unchanged and asked if Ron would fulfill it. The butler bowed and said he would lay down his life to fulfill it. James walked up to the third son of the Marcus and said that things would be different now. Jack said he was interesting and said he could even use mana, because the boy would do it too. The knight told the boy to attack. Jack lunged at the knight, but he blocked the attack. However, he couldn't hold the sword for long and eventually the sword flew out of his hands and the knight himself fell to the floor. Jack put his foot on his armor and asked if that was it. Shocked, James asked if the boy was already on his third circle, for such power was simply impossible on the first. Jack thought he could imagine how disappointing it would be for a knight to lose to someone with a first round. But it's really quite simple. Normally, mana is distributed all over the body to increase physical strength, but Jack decided to concentrate mana in one spot so that he could strike harder. The boy asked James if it was true that he wanted to become an official knight. James said that he didn't have that status yet. So what would the young lord order him to do? Jack said that hunting dogs are very loyal. James marveled at such words and the boy continued. He said he wants the knight to become his loyal dog and serve under him. He was sure it would be more fun than the normal life of a knight. Jack tells the knight that he can become his faithful dog and serve under him. The boy is sure that it is much more fun than the life of an ordinary knight. James asked what the benefits would be to him if he decided to accept. Jack chuckled and said that isn't it customary to ask what one would have to do to get started. The boy said that if the knight became his lapdog, he would get the strength and the power he needed. James then decided to ask about his duties. The boy said that he would have a soft spot for killing those that get in his way and protecting him. James and Ron were surprised by this, and that the knight asked who he would have to kill. The boy said to think for himself, for his first target was obvious. It was his older brother, Peel and Ballantyre. The third son of the Marcus said he would give the knight one twenty-four hours to choose the right side. The knight agreed to think about it. In the mansion after his bath, Ron asked the young gentleman if he was being too careless. The boy asked what the butler meant, and Ron said he could not trust the knight, for he could report to the Marquis. The boy smiled at that statement, and Ron said that now was not the time to smile, for it would only benefit the Marquis. If that woman found out Jack was leaving tomorrow, she might do something about it. Maybe even try to kill the boy. Ron asked if the boy wasn't worried about that. Jack replied that the Marquis can do whatever she wants, because she won't succeed anyway. It's been a few days since the incident with Palon but he's still afraid of the water. Of course, the Marquise wants Jack dead, but she can't do it yet. Right now, the Marcus is watching Jack very carefully, because he needs him alive to be able to influence his sister. Can the Marquise go against her husband and kill the third child in a situation like this? Jack said that would be very foolish of her. Ron asked if the young master was sure of that, and what he would do if the Marcus himself allowed her to do it. The boy said that he was leaving for the academy anyway, which meant there was no point. Oh, and moreover, this woman could hurt but not kill. The boy thought that so many people have tried to kill him, but the Marquis. Beings like Lady Harpy, Lord Ockrove, Lord of Dragons have tried to kill him, 
but no one has succeeded. So could the Marquis' wife succeed? The boy laughed and thanked Ron for the massage, and said that he would need to practice more to get his muscles working. Standing up from his chair and turning to leave, the boy told the butler that unless he wanted to die himself, it wouldn't happen. The butler asked what his master was thinking, but the boy said he'd rather not know. He also said that if Ron was curious about what would happen next, he could follow his master. Ron was surprised and asked if they weren't riding together. The boy said he wasn't allowed to go, and that was an order. If the butler wants to, he so wishes, he can watch from afar. The boy was almost out and remembered something. Ron asked if the young master needed anything else, and the boy said he wanted to create a second circle. He asked the butler not to let anyone in while he was doing it. The butler was surprised at Jack's decision and asked if he thought it was so easy. The boy said it would be easy for him, and Ron said he would do as the Marquis' son asked. Walking down the corridor of the Marquis Ballantyre's mansion, James reflected on today's training session with Jack. No matter how much he thought about it, the boy had skills that were clearly not first round, but at least third. He thought the third lord was talented, but still his request for the knight to be his tame dog is ridiculous. He doesn't have much support, such as from the Counts of Mentis and no personal knights. The boy alone but still offered to be his hand dog, and said it would be much more fun than the life of a regular knight. These were two strange words for a child. The knight decided he should tell the Marquis about his hidden martial arts talents and their conversation. James decided this was his chance. This way he could show off in front of the Marquise and the Marquis. No matter how talented the third lord was, he would never be able to defeat the Marquis unless he was a monster. These thoughts seemed reasonable to James. In the Marquis' room, Elizabeth sits on one of the armchairs opposite the mistress of the chambers. The Marquis' wife told the girl that his commoner mother had at least left the girl a chance for a good life. She said that talent and the title of Archmage were all unimportant. The woman said Elizabeth was her daughter and had nothing but looks. But the woman immediately told her not to get upset and offered her a glass of wine. Elizabeth refuses the glass of wine her stepmother offered her. She said she could not drink in the presence of a woman. The Marquise then drank the glass of wine herself and said that Duke Mellon's eldest son was interested in the girl. Duke Osimbel's middle son also found her pretty. The Marquise said that the middle son would not be suitable for Elizabeth and she would find a better match for the girl. The woman said that the girl needed to be meticulous about herself and asked if she had a crush on someone. The girl replied that there was no such person. The Marquise said that was good, because if there was someone, she would have to remove him quietly. Suddenly the woman said that Junior had thought of something busy. Elizabeth asked what exactly her little brother had come up with. And then the Marquis said that he had tried to lure the knight assigned to him to his side. The woman said that it was ridiculous that he had allowed the idea that such a thing was possible. In fact, that knight had been on the second son's side for a long time. The woman laughed and said that it was amazing how much he wanted to destroy them, and thought these ideas were utter nonsense. The girl thought that it was because of her stepmother and father that Jack had such thoughts at all. But pulling herself together, she thought that she should be more careful, otherwise their hatred towards the third child might become even stronger. Laughing, the woman said that she hadn't had this much fun in a long time. She also said that she was glad that Elizabeth understood her. The Marcus's wife said that she herself would continue to look for a suitable partner for the girl, so she only had to follow her own path. But she decided to repeat one thing one more time. Approaching the girl from behind, she put her arm around her shoulders and causing fear on her stepdaughter's face, said in her ear that if she suddenly started seeing a man behind her back and without her father's knowledge, she knew what would happen in such a case. The girl said that the Marquise need not worry, for she remembers everything. The woman said that Elizabeth had done well. It was getting close to lunchtime, so the girl could already go down to the dining room. Almost all of the Marquis Ballantyre's family is gathered in the dining room, except for his youngest child. Everyone is eating in silence when suddenly the door to the dining room swings open and Jack enters. He asks why everyone at the table is so gloomy, because everything is calm in the country now. Everyone present had different emotions about the boy's appearance. Palin, as well as Elizabeth, were frightened, but each for his own reasons. But the head of the family was clearly unhappy to see the child here. Ignoring the relatives, the youngest said that he was still his father's third son and there was no room for him in the dining room. He said that for once they should have a full dinner. A few minutes ago, there are two basic ways to manage mana. The first is to distribute it throughout the body. This method helps improve the body's abilities, senses, intelligence, and of course, physical strength. 
The second way is to materialize mana by creating a formula. Fireball, Ice Arrow, Demonic Fire, and other types of magic. Ron is a ninth circle mage, and James is a fourth circle knight. There are two reasons why people who can use magic are divided into mages and knights. Jack is a knight, and of course that means he can use magic as well. When he had finished opening the second circle, the boy lay back on the bed, hugging his knees, and looked at the butler to ask why he was looking at him so strangely. Ron said it had taken him two months to create the second circle. Jack thought it usually took at least four months to go from the first to the second circle. But Ron had done it in two. He didn't go back in time, unlike the young master, so Jack could imagine how much effort it had cost him. The boy smiled and said he was doing a great job, because two months was very fast. Butler said that was strange to hear from a man who had created a second circle in only five hours. The boy asked what time it was, to which the butler replied that it was 5.48 p.m. Jack jumped out of bed and said that it was dinner time. Ron asked if the young master needed to cook the steak as usual. The boy said that was not necessary and remembered that the rest of the family would now have to sit down to dinner. In one second, the boy made a decision. He ran to get his clothes. Ron asked if he was going to go down to the others in the common dining room. The boy said he would just let his relatives know he was leaving tomorrow. The boy was sitting at a table in the common dining room eating a chicken leg. He said that he didn't know that the main hall had such a sumptuous meal. He said the food was certainly good, but what Ron cooked for him all the time would still taste better. Jack was approached by his father. The Marcus asked his son what he wanted to say. The boy asked if there was any other reason, because otherwise he wouldn't have come here for nothing. Marcus believes that Jack would be ashamed to appear at the table with his family, uninvited. However, he was not ashamed of it. Jack, in turn, asks why the Marcus speaks so badly of him and compliments that so, he only spoils the atmosphere. Tension was felt at the table. Elizabeth, in fear, asks our protagonist to come out to talk to him alone, and compliments him if he needs anything. Marquis, interrupting Elizabeth, asks for silence. Afterward, he tells Jack, talk if you have something to say, but Jack smiles at Chittickly, and tells them that he's going back to the academy tomorrow. He added that he couldn't bear to be in such a horrible environment. Marquise, clutching a glass in her hand with anger, she glared at Jack. His father had said if he wanted to go, fine, let him go. Jack smiled and thought as if he needed the Marcus's permission. Then he stood up and thanked him for his consent, and lastly he asked his brother how he was feeling. The latter in turn was very frightened. Jack asked his brother if he could not drink anything for fear of water. Holding a bottle of wine in his hand, he said he could imagine how thirsty he was. Jack mocked his brother saying, you may have treated me badly all my life, but brother is a brother. His brother was terrified. He clenched his hands, sweat poured down his throat. When Jack asks if he knows how sorry he is, he adds that the bottle is not water, but wine, and asks him to have a glass. Then our hero spills the wine on the table. His brother screams in fear. The Marquise from anger hit the table, jumped up from his seat and shouted at him, Little scoundrel, how are you not ashamed to make a scene here? After these words, Jack turned and walked away, saying that again the mutt was barking. He added that he had nothing more to say to them. There was a strong sense of discontent at the table, and his stepmother was furious, calling him a vile brat, and that she would not forgive him for that. And Jack in turn, hearing this, in his own manner replied that he would wait for her further action. After our hero had gone, his stepmother shouted that she could be heard all over the manor. She shouted, You bastard, you should have thrown him out long ago. The servants were surprised at the younger master's behavior, but they hurried to clean up the mess on the table. But no matter what his stepmother said, the bite went smoothly. Unless, of course, you count the reprimand from his angry sister. The next day, the third son of the Marcus went to the academy. The cordage looked very modest, one carriage and a couple of knights. But Jack was grateful that the seating was at least comfortable. To the right of the wagon was Reed Chun, a knight of the sixth circle, who was in charge of the cordage escorting our hero to the academy. He was afraid to even look in Jack's direction, but when he did, he smiled and looked back at him. But Jack thought that Reed John must have gotten special orders from the Marquis about him. Knight Chickadee rode beside him, eyeing the wagon warily. On the other side of the wagon rode Elizabeth on a white horse. She called out to her younger brother and asked if he was sure he would be all right and why she could not ride with him. Jack, however, responds by saying that everything will be fine. Elizabeth is concerned and thinks that surely the mother of the second is up to something, and it will be better if she goes with him. But our hero is confident and repeats that everything will be all right. 
Smiling, he said, is that a change is coming. He then tells his sister that she is aware that he is definitely not going to die. Elizabeth said yes, and after a moment of silence, Jack asks his sister to go back, and asks her how much longer she is going to go after him. Elizabeth, reluctantly, agrees and tells her brother to be careful. She heads back to the manor. Afterward, Ron asks if everything is going to be okay. The atmosphere at his house is not good right now. Jack, thinking that Ron and Elizabeth have the same facial expressions, tells Ron that everything is fine. Asking him if he remembered the deal they had made, he whispered the word, tonight. Without thinking long, Ron replied, of course, sir. Then the knights looked at them apprehensively. Ron says he remembers, because it is our hero's request. Then Jack asked him to take care of his sister, and told him to go back, because Elizabeth should not be left alone. Ron asked Jack to be careful, turned his horse around and headed back to the manor. Ron would watch the procession from afar and witness what was about to happen. It was his gift to Ron, who had served him for so many years. Afterward, Jack was tired from the warm weather and decided to take a short nap. Seeing that the third son of the Marcus was asleep, Regin looked at him with a contemptuous look, thinking of something not good. The sun went down, everything went dark, and the light of the moon penetrated through the window of the carriage. Our protagonist slept all this time in the carriage. After he woke up, Jack saw that it was already evening. He wondered why no one had woken him up. Watching the people pulling things out of the wagons, he'd assumed this was where they would be spending the night tonight. As Jack strolled along, he met Knight James, who was clearly not happy. They looked at each other. Jack smiled and said, My chicken, that's the decision you've made. He replied that it had happened. Jack, in return, only laughed. After that, our hero says that it is his choice, and he cannot do anything about it. But what could be expected from a chicken? Jack accepted his decision. Afterward, a crowd of knights gathered in front of the carriage. That knight region says that since he's understood everything, there's no point in long speeches. But Jack in turn asks for an explanation, and adds that he will listen to them. Region begins to explain that every night during the four days of the trip to the academy, they will camp out. To which Jack asks, and then what? Region makes a grimace and says that, in the meantime, they'll be breaking his ribs. And when it's time to move on, they'll heal him with a potion. Jack then says leisurely, that's how. Regent adds that the Marquis has also given them separate orders. She knows that our hero possesses the circle of mana, and that's why they're going to destroy him. Jack was shocked, as destroying the mana circle of the heart is like death. Of course, rebuilding it is possible. But the chance of filling it with mana again is one in a million. Plus, the shock puts a person at risk of becoming disabled. And they want to do it to Jack. Rejon says that James has told them everything, that he's not only good with mana, but he's also good with a sword. Rejon says that's nothing. He adds that while others may be wrong, he knows that Jack is nothing, since you can't change anything with just mana and the sword. Taking out his sword, Rejon adds that our hero should not resist, or it will hurt him. From outside, the peasants were discussing what was happening, but they did not interfere as if nothing was happening. Jack's mind was spinning with the thought of a familiar atmosphere as if he had returned to his homeland. But fortunately or not, he had experiences from his past life. No matter how peacefully and well he lived these few days, the wounds in his heart still hurt. More precisely, experiences from the past can't just disappear. Jack asked, Ron, you're here. The rustling of leaves could be heard in the distance. And Jack started to say, does Rejon know that he spent ten years in the mountains? Rejon doesn't understand and asks what he's talking about. Jack goes on to say that's where he met his mentor, that he learned a lot from her. But when he came down the mountain after she died, Jack learned that a lot of things had changed. The Belantier family and the whole country had been destroyed. Then Jack thought he didn't care who died or why. Rajan, not understanding any of the above, asks what Jack is carrying. And then our protagonist slowly exposes his blade and goes on to say that he only cared about one thing, what happened to his sister. After all, she's smart and talented. He hoped that she would at least be lucky to have a husband, since the family didn't turn out so well. Elizabeth went out on the terrace to look at the starry sky and wondered if Jack was all right. And Jack began to confess further that she was okay. He would forgive them for all the deeds. Rajan and the rest of the knights thought our hero was out of his mind with fear. So Rajan says to the one, come on, try to defeat us with that toy sword. Jack turns to Rajan says that revenge is sweeter than he thought. It's so good, it's maddening. Rajan, you were right. Talent and a sword alone won't get you anywhere. 
but great power and great talent can turn things upside down. In his mind, Jack wondered if they could break his mana circle. Our protagonist loudly declared that he would show them how fast the storm was, and at that moment they felt in their gut that if they didn't kill him, they would die. Raising his sword above his head, Jack said, Strong and destructive wind, destroy everything in your path, and at the same moment, like an angel of death, he rushed at them. Up until that moment, James had been sure he had made the right choice. Choosing a second lord with strong support from outside was wise. It was better than choosing someone who wasn't even noticed. But now, in that moment, James felt like time was stopping, and the world was ending. The sword in Jack's hands fell apart, killing all the knights in an instant. Jack called out to Ron. Ron was puzzled as to why he had killed even the servants. Jack was having a hard time breathing. He used the swordsmanship technique he learned in the state of transcendence. It was one of the eight techniques divided into characteristics of four. Our guy could tell Ron, but he still wouldn't understand. Ron says he can't know everything about him. But it wasn't like a technique anymore. It was more like a method of controlling magic. Jack was getting worse. He asked if Ron had at least one potion. Dropping to one knee, he was spitting blood. Ron worriedly shouted, Mr. Jack in turn saying that everything was fine, and asked the man to give him a potion. Ron silently took out, from his suit pocket, a scarlet-colored potion, and gave our boy a drink. Ron says if he didn't have the potion, Jack would be dead. Jack says he won't, and he knows Ron always has a potion on him for emergencies, and that he'd rather give it to him than to himself first. Ron looks at his master's face with sadness in his eyes, his teeth clenched, and Jack remembers that in a past life Ron did the same thing. He tells Ron that in his haste he couldn't say thank you. Why on earth did those words seem hard for him to say? In a past life, Jack was a fool. Ron says that Jack knows the future, that's what he kept from him. Jack, on the other hand, compliments that it's more accurate to go back in time. After coming to his senses, Jack slowly gets up off the ground. Ron asks him if he's okay. Jack has gotten better in such a short time, the potion must have been expensive. Jack replies that he seems fine. Getting up from the ground, he walks towards the dead knight and picks up a sword from one of the knights. Telling Ron that it was okay, he took off his white cloak. Looking at James' dead body, Jack tells Ron that the chicken is dead, stepping on its head with one foot. Jack thought he could grow something good out of it. Ron, on the other hand, says he made the right choice as a knight. But that's why Jack thinks James is a chicken. He shouldn't have expected anything from him. Jack tells Ron that he wasn't surprised when he told him about going back in time, and asked if he was curious. Ron is a little puzzled. Jack continues and asks if he's curious about the future of his sister and the Marcus. Ron says that about the latter, he thinks Jack's family will be destroyed. And judging by his reaction, it seems like it would be horrible. Jack asks that Ron pretend it never happened. But if he was curious, he asked him to ask him. After smiling, he asked if he would like to ask a question. Ron didn't hesitate long enough to say no, to which he immediately received the answer, how boring you are. Our hero asks if he is curious about his future. Ron replies that he doesn't know and assumes he'll just live somewhere. Ron, embarrassed, says that it's not that easy to kill him anyway, to which Jack replies sharply, simple. Ron was surprised, and Jack compliments that it was easy to kill Ron. Ron, slightly disappointed, says, I see. Jack asks not to be upset, and he went to his carriage to rest. Ron examined the corpses of the slain knights and covered their eyes and mouths. He thought that with one attack, Jack had killed 25 men. Although it was hard to call it just an attack, he had destroyed their hearts without touching them with his sword. Ron wondered how that was possible. Turning around looking at the carriage, he pondered what Jack's life was like then. Ron wondered if everything would be all right with the young master as he worried about him. Ron called out to our hero. He startled awake, cold sweat running down his face. Ron asks if he really felt better after taking the potion. After Jack comes to his senses, he looks at Ron and calms down saying to Ron, it's you. With heavy sigh, Jack says, well that, and that the pain can make you pass out. Ron, holding a pouch full of something in his hand, replies, I see. He tells the young lord that he had collected the things from the knights. They had five elixirs, sixty-three and thirty gold pieces and forty shillings. Jack looks at all this and marvels that these fellows carry so much money. Ron asks if he would like to drink another elixir. He replies that there is no point now. Jack takes three elixirs and gives them to Ron in exchange for the one he drank. Ron thanks Jack and thinks to himself that these potions are not made by alchemy 
and to exchange one high-end potion for three middle-class ones. Jack takes his suitcase and leaves the carriage. Ron asks what Jack will do with the corpses. He replies that he will leave them here. Either the wild animals will eat them or someone else will clean them up. Ron adds that Jack will be suspected unless he is here. Jack asks, puzzled, suspect, but by whom? To which Ron says, of course, the Marcus. Jack opens his suitcase, puts the bag of money in it, and says, let the Marcus do what he wants. Ron says if he were the Marcus, he'd call him in right away. To which Jack replies, I'll bet. Ron refuses as he doesn't want to lose anymore. Jack, slightly disappointed, tells him that he is very clever. Ron looks at his master and says that he really believes he has his reasons for thinking that. Jack smilingly asks Ron, no one knows he's here. Ron replies by saying, right. After Jack asks if Ron is sure, Ron tells him that he used illusion magic, and it's probably cleaning up the yard right now. Illusion is a magic only available to the Ninth Circle. Usually those who know how to use it, or at least distinguish it, work in the demonic forest, but he can never be sure. Our boy tells Ron that there's a chance the Marcus will question Ron about what happened. If he feels threatened, Jack asks him to say it was all his fault. And if Ron realizes the Marcus wants to kill him, to tell him what he said, Ron asks what words. Jack replies if Ron or his sister dies, the entire Marcus family will be destroyed that same day. There is a moment's silence. Jack says that this is for last resort and you don't have to look at him like that. Ron looks at Jack and says how can you not be worried? Jack hoping everything will be okay. He will give the Marcus one last chance to act like his sister's real father. Ron asks if he's sure he has to go to the academy. To which he gets an affirmative answer. Ron asks if the Marcus will call you. Jack tells him that he knows what the rules are at the academy. First of the semester, unless it's the death of a relative, you can't leave. Ron replies, I see that I'll go. But you could tell by the look on his face that he wanted to go with him. Jack would have been happy to go too, but it wasn't time yet. He cheers Ron up and tells him not to run into any monsters on the way back. Ron asks if that means they'll see each other after four years. He replies, who knows what will happen? and tells him to keep an eye on his sister. After Ron left, it was just a matter of getting there. To the academy from the Marcus estate, you can camp three times on the mountain. But if one took the road, it would take four days, although the mountain path was about the same. To say that the mountain path is more difficult cannot be said. It's not much different from the road. Jack, thinking there must be a village nearby, finds a horse and tries to saddle it. Jack doesn't succeed the first time because of his height. After saddling the horse, he set off. The night was peaceful considering what happened. Jack is not going to go straight to the academy. He is ashamed in front of Ron and his sister, but right now he needs to focus on his mentor. Valentine Mellos brought our hero back to life, gave him the strength to carry out his revenge, and made a man out of him, who everyone thought was nothing. Let it be forgotten at this time, but it is she who is one of the strongest black mages, and for those who remember, she is the worst memory. It's been a long time since Jack's heart fluttered like that. Arbolo is the province of Viscount Arbolo, vassal of the Duke of Osimbol. Jack wondered if he should stay here for the night. But looking at the smiling faces of the children, he thought it was a good place to stay. Jack stopped at the first inn in town. It was really, really fun. Our hero was greeted by a dog with a red scarf around his neck. Jack hoped he wouldn't get into a fight with anyone. The innkeeper approached Jack and asked him if he had come to have dinner or to rent a room. Jack's mind was spinning with the thought, the innkeeper is more like a mercenary. Giving three shillings, he asked for plain water, food, and a room. He added that he'd left his sword at the horse and asked him to take it there. The servant took one shilling and said it would be enough. She told him she would bring him the famous Arbolo apple pie and a steak, and she asked him if he wanted milk to drink or if he wanted beer. To which Jack replied, Milk would be fine. She said she'd be right back, and she left. Jack thinks it's a pretty good place to live. He may not be from here, but she didn't try to get more money out of him. That's understandable, since it's pre-war. The dog likes to be petted by Jack. Jack looks at the dog and says he has no idea what the future holds. Well, there's happiness and ignorance. On the side, the mercenaries were talking about how this time the Empire. They plan to get rid of all the demonic monsters and it seems that they are even recruiting more mages to deal with them all at once. What's the point? Even Tolkien isn't doing anything about it. And with 20,000 mana users, what's the point? It's like they're laughing at them. Jack already mentioned the Iron Blood Knights who are on a mission in the Demonic Forest. 
Under the emperor's order, knights were selected from the guards of each noble family to go hunting in the demonic forest, along with a squad of iron blood knights. This vast forest stretches on a high mountain range called the Grand Canyon. This neutral zone may seem ordinary to many, but it is home to ogres, orcs, goblins, elves, harpies, and even dragons. The blood of trolls is used to make potions. The tendons of ogres are used as bowstrings, and iron monsters, pareki, serve as material for weapons and armor. Harpy feathers are used for ladies' jewelry, and elves are kept as pets because of their appearance. In the demonic forest, all these creatures pose no threat, so all that happens there is stupid human greed. Jack remembers that those will lose, and the squad of Ironblood knights will lose a third of their men. Also knights from the guard of aristocrat families will die. A big loss. Because of this incident, the emperor would lose the support of the people and noble families. Jack thought that must have been when the problems in the imperial family started, and about a year later, a civil war would break out. One of the mercenaries got very drunk and shouted that the emperor was the problem. When he started to say, here's a stupid man, his friend covered his mouth. Because, for insulting the emperor or his family, many people lost their heads. Then they remembered the Marcus of Volantir's youngest son. They began to talk about the rumors that said he used black magic, and that he was imprisoned because of it. They didn't realize that the Marquis son was sitting at the next table. They scoffed and said who he learned it from, because all black magicians are dead. The innkeeper came up to Jack with a tray of food and asked him what made him laugh. Jack was laughing without realizing it. She asked him if he would like to tell him a story, since everyone here was bored. Jack began to tell her that it was nothing, but that the third son of the Marcus was a big fool, judging by what they say. So he laughed. The worker said, that's what people are like. They gossip about things they can't hear or see. Jack asks, what about you? How do you judge people? To which she replies that she personally has to see everything to decide for herself. After all, rumors are just rumors. To which Jack said is that rumors are sometimes true. She innocently asks if it's true. To which Jack replies, of course. Jack then takes a bite of the pie and tastes it. It doesn't taste as good as Ron's, but it's not bad either. The worker still thinks that if the third son of the Marcus is not a bad enough man in life, then the rumors were not true after all. Jack was pleasantly surprised, an employee asking if something was wrong. And Jack looks at her thinking, the scars on her face, the pumped up body, and the mercenaries around her. The worker says she sliced the pie to make it easier to eat. Jack asks her if she is the leader of the Adventurer's Guild. She was surprised and smiled back at him. Of course, he said it for a reason. There are many mercenaries in this village who are looking for a way to make some extra money. They can join the local guards, be sleuths when required to find a lost cat, or become hunters and catch a monster. Such tasks are given out in the Adventurer's Guild of any province. That's why such guilds usually offer lodging. Jack thinks she has too much free time on her hands, considering she has to run an inn. The buildings near the inn belong to the guild. The guildmaster eventually says there's not enough work there, so she pays more attention to the inn. She has to live on something too. Jack rightly thinks it's some sort of front for the Adventurer's Guild. Jack tells her she's doing it for nothing. After all, he is known as the disgrace of the Marcus family, the story of our hero's family, a simple tale for the local mercenaries over a beer. But still, how was she able to recognize him? The guildmaster is so skillful, he thought. A few minutes ago, when Jack arrived at the village, he was stopped by the guards at the entrance, asking him why he had come here. Jack asked why they wanted him here and showed them his family's coat of arms. He asked if that would be enough for them. The guards apologized to him and led him through the gate, wishing him a good journey. Jack remembered understood and said, I see you learned everything from the guards. But no matter how important the information is, it is dangerous to trust unverified sources. To which the guild leader asks if he's worried about her. Jack answers her that for now, yes, as long as she's okay with him. Despite all the rumors, her attitude towards him is better than his half-brother and those knights. She thanks him and extends her hand, saying she should have introduced herself earlier. Her name is Jane Arbolo, master of the Arabas Guild in Arbolo. They shook hands, and Jack thought that Arbolo was the name of a village, and she had a similar last name. When Jack realized, he asked if she was the first or the second. She said she was third, and her older brother was the lord of the village. Jack's surprised that aristocrats do this kind of thing. He asks her if she wasn't supposed to be married off, since she's an aristocrat. She replies that she didn't mind, but her family would never sell her to anyone. Jack even felt bad that his family wasn't like that. He tells her that they have an interesting family. 
Then she asked what the Marquis' son is doing alone in their village, and in addition asked where his guards were. In reply, she was told that the disgrace of the house does not need a guard. She was surprised to hear such an answer. Jane says that he is not what the rumors say he is. It will be difficult for Jack to reach his destination alone, so he is looking for an escort. Only five people are needed, with experience in camping and good cooking. When Jane asked about payment, he replied that he will give two gold pieces as a down payment and three when they arrive at the site. She says enthusiastically, You are so generous. Of course, usually only 30 shillings per person for an escort. Imperial money is simple enough. 100 pennies equals 1 shilling, 100 shillings equals 1 gold. Jack thanked Jane for the food. She says it will be ready by morning. She asks him if he will pay for the food and the night's lodging separately. Taking his sack from his suitcase, he gave her three gold pieces and added, if there is a horse and carriage, it will be fine. Jane says to her dog, we have such a rich guest. Telling Jack not to worry and that there were people with experience here, she gave him the keys to the room. Jack took the keys and thought that when such a woman was the master of the guild, he wouldn't have to worry about the welfare of the village. He then went up to the second floor and opened the door to the room and lay down on the bed. Jack said that he was very tired, that he would wash up and then go to bed. But he was already in the arms of Morpheus. In the pitch darkness, someone is crying and sobbing. The cave is illuminated by moonlight, and someone says, Poor child, and holds out her hand to him. She asks him if he plans to live his whole life in helplessness. That whiny boy was Jack. The woman says it is not wrong to be good, but it is a sin to be weak. Jack, with tears on his cheeks, listens to her intently. She asks him if he wants to change. The woman was shrouded in white chains. Jack says he wants to change. They held hands and she told him okay, and added that he should call her his mentor from now on. Jack woke up, with tears in his eyes. It was morning, the peasants were going to work. Our boy lies on his bed and says it's morning. Jane comes into his room and says, good morning, everything is ready. Jack grudgingly tells her to at least knock. Her dog runs into his room and jumps on Jack and spits all over him. Jack wonders why he's been getting this all morning. After Jack comes down from the second floor, Jane meets him and asks him if he's down and adds, I see the sleep was good. Saying that she had prepared a fine carriage for him, she introduced him and the people who would accompany him on his journey. They were the same guys who were talking about him. They were embarrassed to say hello to him. The biggest guy in the squad extended his hand and introduced himself as John Doe, captain of the fire ants. The name John Doe is given to unidentified corpses. Jack realizes it was an alias. Shaking his hand, Jack says he has a pretty interesting name, for which John thanks the man for appreciating his name. Afterward, John begins to tell him that it will be a long way from our below of a stone mountain. They will have some small villages along the way, so they plan to camp twice in secluded places. And next he started to say that they have a great cook with them. Also, everyone is great at setting up camp. Jack interrupts and says that he means he doesn't have to do anything. John Doe smilingly replies, yes, of course. Jack hands over his suitcase and says, great, let's go. He's tired enough as it is. Jack turns around and asks Jane if the guys are experienced. To which she says with a wink, they're very experienced. Jack looked at John and thought that would be enough for a regular mercenary. Jack's body is weaker than before, but his senses and eyes are the same as before. Ron now has a ninth circle. Although he hides his real powers, it's hard to call him an ordinary person. But a mercenary with an eighth circle of mana. Suddenly that's his full potential. Jane asked Jack if he didn't want the best of the best. Jack replies that he did. Whereupon Jack says that they will see each other again. To which Jane asks if that's true. And adds that they could have a mug of beer then. Jack smilingly replies that it's only on her. She wished her little guest a good trip. And they at the road. The weather outside was beautiful. Jack thought to himself that he was feeling much better compared to yesterday. John stared at Jack. He wondered what he was staring at. After Jack decided to talk to one of the guys, he asks if the guy has heard who he is. The guy replies that he has and adds, You are an aristocrat is all I know. Jack, on the other hand, asks if that's true. And the boy says that the master said so, that he travels the world. Jack had a question, so he took the family crest out of his pocket and gave it to the guy, and asked him if he knew what it was. He asks him if it's an aristocrat's coat of arms. Jack tells him it's pretty much right, and adds that somewhere out there is the estate of the Marcus of Ballantyre, and that their bloody house is about to be destroyed, and tells him that this coat of arms belongs to them. 
Jack started to tell me that he had heard that there was a total loser in the family. Smiling, he asks the guy if he knows about it, because he knows better. I mean, he even went to jail a while back. The guy's hands shake a little, afraid he's facing a loser. Jack says, funny, isn't it? The rumors about Jack going to jail for using black magic were true. Jack reveals that he does know a little about black magic. After all, it's not hard since it was his mentor, who is one of the best black magicians in the world. He may be a swordsman, but it's impossible not to know about black magic. However, why would he use it when he has his fists? After he started talking to the guy with the scar over his right eye, Jack asked why the guy just stood there while his friend said those things about him. Don't they know what happens when you speak ill of aristocrats? He asked him if he felt sorry for him. After that, everyone in the room was completely confused. All except John Doe. The guildmaster must have been the one who told the truth to the captain, and everyone else was unaware. They said it was all in the past, because they were to be together for a few more days. Come nightfall, they lit a fire and made camp. At dinner, the boys say that now they are convinced that the rumors are just rumors. Jack, not understanding, asks what they mean. They tell him that he doesn't look like a typical aristocrat, because usually they are afraid to let a drop of water fall on them and spoil something. And they add that Jack is not like that, because even the dishes he washed himself. In Jack's mind, he apologizes to Jane, for the beef pie is much tastier than her apple pie. For dinner, they had Yorkshire pudding, pie, and sausages. Jack wanted to employ them in his kitchen as their food was very good. In the end, even Ron's cooking lost them to her. Jack says that for a good dinner, you have to pay for it. After all, it's usually not easy to please him. Jack asks who will be on guard duty at night. The mercenaries say they will draw lots and asks if he wants to join them. But Jack says small children need a lot of sleep to grow well. Will the one take the responsibility if he stays small? Whereupon the mercenary says then he doesn't have to. After a couple minutes, Jack got bored and suggested telling tales. He decided to start first thinking long enough to tell them such a thing. He asked them if they knew how many dragons existed in the world. They asked Jack, dragons, didn't the founder emperor destroy them all centuries ago? After all, that's what the founder myth tells us. In a nutshell, it says that the founding emperor, Julius Teslin, along with two companions, killed all the dragons that inhabited the western continent and built Teslin in that place. As time went on, the empire grew smaller and smaller and was no match for the Tolkien Empire next door. That's a truth everyone knows. But Jack tells of two dragon lords on the Black Sea. A small dragonborn living in Tolkien Castle and five dragons in the Forest of Monsters. Eight polymorphs that Jack knows personally. That's a minimum of sixteen living dragons. Everyone fell silent, finding it hard to believe. After all, dragons are usually only talked about in myths and legends. In reality, no one had ever seen one. Jack asked them if the story was interesting. Dragons don't invade humans, since they are bound by an oath that makes them unable to go near places that threaten their lives. To which John asks, so the founding emperor didn't kill the dragons. Jack answers his question that not all of them. The emperor founder found a way to negotiate with them. Though it would be more accurate to say that it all worked out thanks to his two associates, whose names are lost to history. John asks what these dragons are doing now, and Jack says that their continent isn't really the only one in the whole world. Besides the western continent, there's an eastern continent across the Black Sea. The little dragons don't have much to do, but the dragon lords have one mission, to protect the border on the Black Sea. Jack himself does not know exactly at what time the border was created, since it was created many hundreds of years ago and separated the western continent from the eastern continent. All dragon lords must protect it. Jack himself was curious about the dragon world on the eastern continent. Everyone fell silent after the story, and afterward they all laughed. They didn't believe Jack's story, but he didn't expect them to. Jack tells them they may not believe it, and retreats to the carriage. They ask him if he's going to bed. But Jack replies that he is going to wash up and change his clothes. The mercenary wants to go with him since he is his guard. But Jack tells him that he doesn't need to, as he can wash himself. Diving into the lake, Jack thought about those stupid mercenaries who didn't take him seriously. They might not have believed him, but they were not worth the ridicule. Jack didn't understand why he let them mock him. A protagonist who is forced to hide his true powers, boredom says Jack. Jack's concern right now is John Doe, because there's a chance he's a spy for the Tolkien Empire. A suspicious type, and his behavior raises even more questions, Jack thought. This situation was like a huge jigsaw puzzle. Surprisingly, our hero asked to provide good mercenaries, but
but among them was the owner of the Eighth Circle. Eight circles is a lot since the captain of the Iron Blood Squad has the same number of circles. In other words, such a cater would be ripped off. But he's just the captain of some unfortunate and unknown squad. I wonder why. Jack had better things to do than think about this man. He'd already recovered a little with the rest of the carriage and the elixir. Well, that shouldn't be a problem, Jack thought, since he had to go to his mentor anyway. After getting dressed, Jack took his sword and decided to ask directly if John Doe was a spy for the Tolkien Empire. The mercenaries see him and ask, Oh, are you ready? Jack replies that he had to hurry as there was an urgent matter. When asked what's wrong, Jack asks if John has any idea. Raising his sword, he declares that John is the cause of his worries. How a man with an eighth circle can work as a mere mercenary? Jack says he's going to a very important place and that he's not going to bring a man who's hiding something. His partners are surprised that the captain has an eighth circle, as they had no idea about it. John Doe, asking for silence, replies that yes, he has an eighth lap, so what? But Jack says that he has told them an interesting story, and now they would like to hear John's story. Jack asks him to tell him who he really is and what he's doing here. When asked, what if I don't want to? Jack replies, then he'll die, and adds, maybe you're a spy for the Tolkien Empire. When Jack starts talking, that woman named Jane says the next time they meet, they'll have a drink. But maybe he should suspect her too. But John got angry and said he didn't understand why he brought her up. Jack asks if he really doesn't understand and asks if he's interested in buying her a drink before he kills her. Jack asks, well, things are getting interesting. Jack has gotten this far, but he doesn't use magic, John thought. John doesn't understand if it's on purpose or if Jack is up to something. He's better off. If Jack had used the mana circle, then John would have killed him. Jack tells him that he's not in control of himself, so there are two choices, die or stay alive. It's simple. Jack gives you one minute to think about it. Earlier in the day at Jane's pub, she told John about an interesting young man. When he asked who she was talking about, she asked if he knew about the third son of the Ballantier family. His family almost abandoned him, but he's not what the rumors say he is. You could see in Jack's eyes that he was hiding a lot. Jane told him that he asked to find him an escort, so it would be better for John to find out what's what. Who knows, he might be able to change their fate. John thought that he really wasn't what they say he is, hardly looking into his eyes could tell that Jack was hated by his own family. John wondered what to do, for the aura around Jack didn't like him. Jack wondered if they didn't have enough minutes. John felt like he was like a deer meeting a lion. All his senses were screaming danger. The whole situation was strange. John didn't understand how our hero realized he had an eighth circle. He wondered if Jane had told him, but she wouldn't. I mean, she would have told him if Jack was prying. Jack says there's 40 seconds left. John responds by saying that Jack himself admitted that he's on lap eight and asked him if he could kill him. Looking into Jack's eyes, John wondered why there was so much bloodlust in that kid's eyes. In that moment, he wondered if the kid standing in front of him was really a kid. He wondered if he should try to get out of it or tell the whole truth the guy on John's team, asking him to explain why he's on lap 8. John Doe had lived his whole life as a mercenary, and now all the choices he'd made in life were flashing before his eyes. He was very lucky, so he decided to continue to rely on his intuition. When Jack says his time is up, but John decides to tell him what's going on with Jane first. They start at the beginning. His story is short. A love story between an aristocrat and a commoner. You hear it everywhere. When John was 19 years old, then in his seventh circle, he met Jane. They fell in love with each other at first sight and haven't been apart since. Jack thought that was the reason why she hadn't married yet. Even if it was the bond of a commoner and an aristocrat, he could be a pillar of the Teslin Empire with his eighth circle. It's odd that he's still working as a mercenary. He looks perfectly normal. The boys were surprised. Although, given Jane's character, it's safe to say that her family isn't interested in increasing their power through marriage. Jack says that Jane is the master of the Adventurer's Guild in this small province, and he is a mercenary. It was hard to believe, but it was true. Jack pondered whether he could believe it, for such a simple story was easy to make up. He decided to ask if they remembered the story about the dragons. He added that he wondered what the Tolkien Empire would do with a dragon. John replies, how would I know about mythical creatures? Jack smiled and then began to tell me that wizards are those who carry the ten circles of magic on their hearts. But even wizards don't know that there is more to the world than that. Monsters that use not mana, but souls as power. Transcendence. Jack told him that in two years, the captain of the Knights of the Tolkien Empire, 
Heinz Beggerman, would become a master and be named the strongest knight on the continent. He will help the forgotten stories of the transcendence become a reality once again. But the funny thing is, he'll never get to be one himself. It's an interesting story, Jack said. John asked him to continue. Jack said that Beggerman would replace half of his blood and bones with dragon bones. He would become half human and half dragon. It was clear from the look on their faces that there was no fun to be had with this story. John asked what this story had to do with what was happening now. Jack continued his story, saying that there was only one dragon in the Tolkien Empire so far. Even though they're practically immortal, you can't do much experimenting with one dragon. So the Empire sends its minions to other countries to gather information. And to find other dragons, they laughed back, not believing Jack's story. John said that the story was like something out of a novel, and asked how they could believe it. He advised Jack to tell the story to the other mercenaries to see if they would fall for it. Well, from John's reaction, it was hard to tell if he was a spy or not. John asked if his doubts had been dispelled. After he answered in the affirmative, Jack wished him luck with the guild master. He added that he was expecting an invitation to the wedding. When John tried to draw his sword, Jack put the blade to John's neck in a split second. Since he was the first to suspect him, he would keep him alive. Taking John by his cloak, he told him to his face that this would be his last warning. If he ever decided to do anything against Jack, Jack would turn everyone, including John, into dust. The guys asked them to calm down, put their swords down, and talk. Jack thought they were getting closer, but he must have pushed them away from him. I can't help it, because that's the way it is between employer and employee. Jack's found a bed in the carriage. Everyone is quiet. One of the guys asks what's going to happen now. John says he doesn't know. One of John's subordinates asks why he'd want to be a mercenary with an eighth circle. Two years ago, John said he had a fourth circle. The guys were offended, but John was a really good captain. One of the guys says, surprise, eighth circle, He's the best mercenary captain on the whole continent, and offers to be king of the mercenaries. John is embarrassed and thinks, what a stupid title. Since when is it possible to become a mercenary king with the Eighth Circle? As far as John knew, there are as many as four mercenary masters in the whole world. The boys were surprised that the boys' words were true. The youngest of the team asks why he couldn't do anything. Even now John's hands were trembling. He felt like he was on the verge of death. He would have shat himself with fear. They found the boy interesting, though he was dangerous. At the moment, the continent was on pins and needles because the Tolkien Empire was fighting for the throne. Having spies and dragons in the current situation would only make things worse. A couple days later, Jack is riding in a carriage and offers to tell another interesting story. The mercenaries are curious as to what our guy will tell this time. Jack asks if they know about the orc lord who lives in the magic forest. Basically, they didn't know anything except that he has the ninth circle of mana. Jack says not, no, it's probably 10th by now, I think. But we'll know for sure someday. Jack wanted to tell a story about the past anyway. John asks what kind of past we're talking about. Imperial time, it's about 23 years ago, Jack said. He started his story with the Orc Lord, who was very fond of weapons. And Jack asked them if they knew about the Orc Lord's relationship with Lady Harpy. They said they didn't. Because it's generally accepted that Orcs and Harpies are not on good terms. Not bad, but on the brink of war. But Jack thought that the mercenaries, who are always in the forest for money, should know something. After all, these two races are considered the strongest in the magical forest. They are even called the protectors of the forest. There is one reason why they were given this nickname. It's terribly simple. They're very strong. Jack tells them, it must be strange to hear that an orc lord and a lady harpy are in such a relationship. And tells them that originally they weren't enemies, just neighbors. Then Blackman became Orc Lord and began to build up his power. But did they know that trouble started for them five years later? Jack was asked what kind of trouble they were talking about. Our hero smiled broadly and continued his story as everyone learned about the relationship between Blackman and Lady Harpies. Humans, Harpies, and Orcs, all races ultimately seek the same thing, power. They desire it. Some Harpies and Orcs desire to overthrow their rulers. Of course, the overthrow operation had to take place in secret. But in the end, their foolish plan went awry. He asked them if they knew they were still ruling today. To which he gets the answer, they do. And John asks why things haven't improved between the races. Jack says that after the internal rebellions ended, the Blackman and Vili decided that their nations were more important than love. John doesn't know if Jack is lying or not. But one thing was certain decades ago, harpies and orcs, 
were not as dangerous as they are now. John wondered when exactly those two races had begun to grow in strength, and after ten years ago they were first proclaimed the strongest. The harpies were able to steal and copy the orcs' secret finding techniques, and the orcs in turn learned elementalism from the harpies. This is how the biggest and largest races inhabiting the forest were able to learn each other's secret techniques. Blackman and Willia directly contributed to this. After that, the two races completely distanced themselves from each other and became the main ones of the magic forest. Jack advised them that if one day they encountered orcs or harpies, to try and tell the story. Then, maybe they wouldn't kill them right away. John doesn't know if it's true or fiction, but he decides to pretend to believe it. And he replies that if he does, he'll try it. John offered the meat to Jack, and he didn't mind, as it was very tasty. At the Marcus estate, the Marcus received a report that all the guards accompanying the Third Lord had been found near the province of Arbelo. They have investigated, but they speculate that the guards were most likely killed by high-level magic. The Marcus pondered that this happened just when the Iron Blood Knights weren't around. He wondered if it was the Emperor or the Duke, and if not, then who? He felt it was worth a personal investigation. The Marcus told Gonzalez that they must find the culprit. To which he replied, of course. Then the Marcus asks why he didn't mention his youngest son. Did he really survive? asks the Marcus. Gonzalez replies that they didn't find him among the corpses, and thought he might have escaped. The Marcus tells Gonzalez to use all his strength and find out everything. He thought Jack was useless, but in fact, that was not the case. The next day, they arrive at the beginning of the mountain range. Jack gives the rest of the reward to the mercenaries. He gives them almost all the money. John Doe says it's still too much money. Jack in turn says that ten gold pieces and the elixirs will be enough, and the rest is their tips for their work. Jack had a lot of fun on the way and apologized for suspecting John, and then Jack said goodbye to them. But they weren't going to leave. John realizes he might say too much, but he offers Jack a job as a mercenary. After all, being a mercenary isn't as bad as it sounds. When asked what, John replies that he doesn't know everything, but he'll say what he's sure of, his father's third son, rejected by everyone. John doesn't want to brag, but he's seen the end of a lot of people who were in the same position as Jack and Jack asks if he wants him to be a mercenary. To which John repeats what he said, that it's not such a bad thing. If you avoid dangerous tasks, you can tell the whole world and make good money. Where else can you get such invaluable experience? Jack says to John, they may not understand, but you figured it out. That night, if I'd wanted to, you'd be dead. He must know, even if Jack isn't an eighth circle mage, he must have sensed the nearness of death. John says he knows, and that's why he's asking him to join the mercenary ranks. John adds that Jack doesn't realize the magnitude of the possibilities yet, and he's not worried about what's happened. In a world where everything is decided by whose sword is sharper, many people hide their true powers and intentions. John thinks it's largely his fault since he shouldn't have kept it a secret. Jack thanks him for saying so, but he pretends he didn't hear anything. And lastly, he decides to tell John that in a few years a great trouble will come to the western continent, and that he had better hide. He may not understand Jack's words now, but he asks him to remember them. For this is going to be a very serious mess. That's why Jack said not to sell himself for a few gold pieces. After all, money is important, but not more important than life. They said goodbye, and when Jack was leaving, John asked if he could ask him his name. Jack replied that he knew his name, and why should he tell him anything? But he told him to just call him Jack, and asked him to remember it that way. In response, he asked about John's real name. John said his name was Dynasty. Jack suggested we meet again sometime, so he left. Jack jumped up the mountain, using mana. But Jack was getting a little tired, because his body was still small and he couldn't jump that far. Finally, he reached the entrance of the cave. Walking forward, Jack found the stone wall behind which his mentor was located. In the past, he had discovered this place by chance. I want to leave my family. It's too hard. Too much pressure in the past, all of Jack's thoughts had been about this. Pouring water from the bottle, Jack cut his hand and sprinkled it on the stone. Until he returned to his 17 years, Jack had just been hiding and running away. Losing Ron had left him with nothing else to do but drag out a miserable existence. He cried at the very wall out of helplessness. Tears pooled with the blood and hit the wall. It lowered suddenly. Stumbling upon the hidden entrance to the cave had been a great fortune for someone like him. But right now, Jack didn't understand why on earth he felt so strongly about it. Although it was obvious decades had passed since then, Jack was finally there, 
He reached the stairs that went down to the bottom of the cave. After descending the stairs, he finally met his mentor. She was small in the shape of a toy doll, shrouded in chains. Jack bowed down and said to his mentor, Do you think it's possible to make living things immortal? Everyone in this world wants to live as long as possible. Orcs, dragons, emperors, but they will die someday. It's natural and right. For his mentor, too. And yet she has lived for 400 years, thanks to what separates the soul from the body. Magic is what keeps them connected. The only problem is that process is about to end. In her last life, after she met Jack, she only lived 10 years. But this time, things will be different. Since they'd have a little more time in this life, 13 years, she asks who are you. Jack replies if she wants to guess. She thought he was making fun of her, threatening him. She says she won't ask twice and orders him to answer. Jack says to her, oh, my dear mentor, you used to be so mean. With that answer, he pissed her off more. Jack tells her that he missed her a lot, which made her ask if he missed her. After all, she doesn't know him at all. It was weird, but still she asked if he knew who she was. Jack tells her that of course he knows who she is. I mean, how could he not know? The time they spent together was no illusion. Of course, Jack is the only one who remembers everything. He tells her that she is the heroine of their world, who brought an end to the Age of Honor and began the Age of Humanity. Valentine Milos, and tells her that he is her apprentice from the future. His mentor didn't believe him, as she doesn't like predictions. She asked him if he knew she didn't believe in predictions. To which Jack replied, of course, because any prediction is subjective from the point of view of the one making it. She then asked why he would say it that way. She asked him to answer her. She asks Jack, child of the future, if in this future in your life it really is me, what would be my response in such a situation? Jack replies that she would tell him to disappear. In response, she says he's not bad and advises him to open his fortune-telling tent. Jack says, what's your problem, counselor? She replies that she's nothing to him. She's still the same person Jack remembers her to be. So Jack decides to free her from her shackles and apologizes for having come this far. Jack's mentor watches him use his soul aura. Jack realizes he's been acting wrong and says she can punish him later. Valentine Malus realizes what Jack is about to do. She tells him if he destroys those chains, this place will. Before she could finish, Jack told her that he knew what would happen if he broke the chains, the place would collapse. But he had no choice. Julius Teslin, whom everyone calls a hero, locked her in a cave, promising that he would return one day. But he betrayed her and didn't keep his word. After 10, 20, 50 years, she finally realizes she's been left here forever. Jack cut the chains made of dragon bones, thus freeing her. She was amazed at how he managed to do it. Jack catches her and tells her he's not like Julius Teslin, and he would prove it not with words but with deeds. The walls began to collapse one by one from the impact, so Jack asked her to grab onto him. He began to recite the incantation, The land I stand on belongs to me alone, so let nothing on my land block my path forward. It was one of the four basic defense techniques, the mountain of the four great elements. When Jack thrust his sword into the ground, all the stones flew apart and half of the mountain was broken. Valentine Mellis asks who he is. Jack had already told her he was her apprentice. She asks how he got so much power at such a young age. Jack replies that for her apprentice, albeit from the future, such powers are nothing. And he complimented that for the next 13 years, they would be exploring the world together. She reached up and took Jack's cheeks in her hands. This was the way she always tested whether a person was lying or not. But Jack is not sure if this technique is accurate. Valentine asks if he's really from the future, to which Jack clarifies that he has returned to the past rather than coming from the future. Valentine believes our hero. He fell to the ground exhausted. The mentor tells him that it is strange to begin their relationship with so much power. But if Jack had not done so, she would hardly have believed him. She asked if he really thinks they can be friends after what happened. But Jack saw nothing wrong with being friends as mentor and apprentice. Despite your pain, you can still argue, she says. Jack replies to her that she taught him at herself. He finally tells her his name, and said he hopes they can do well together in this life too. Five days later in the province of Osenbal, Jack hasn't spoken to his mentor in five days. He asks her if she is still in contemplation. He receives silence in response. Jack asks her if her words pay. She answers him that at first she had no idea he was from the Tesla Empire. She also doesn't understand how he can control soul magic at such an age. To get that kind of power, Jack thinks she wants him to finish the sentence. 
but if he doesn't say anything, she's going to punch him once, like she did in a previous life. And Jack says that there are powers that only a few people have. She says that's true, but Jack has a thousand dead on his mind. Jack just chuckles. He wishes he could tell her what happened in his past life, but since she hasn't spoken to him in five days, he can't tell her anything. She says there is more blood on his hands than on hers. Valentine asks him if he ever wondered why he was given the chance for a second life. He has, hasn't he? He's been thinking about all sorts of things for days, but the fact of his return. He thought about it and came up with nothing. His mentor looks at him, and it was as if she had idiot written all over her face. Jack asks her not to look at him like that, as if he had brought himself back. Maybe whoever did this has a purpose, and if he has a purpose, then he'll show up. And if he doesn't, then Jack will just live. He looks at his mentor and says that the time he spent with her is the most important thing to him. Valentine tells him that he knows how to pour honey in his ears and asks what his plan is. To which Jack replies that he should first find some companions, because he needs people. Then, five days ago, when he took his mentor with him, he almost died. He'd had to drink two top-grade elixirs, but the pain didn't stop for another five days. Jack, at this point, has a bad body, so a good defense will be needed. Jack offers to go shopping, and the mentor agrees. While Jack was saying what he needed to buy, a village girl came upon him, holding a basket of beautiful yellow flowers. She herself was quite pale and thin. She asked for forgiveness, to which Jack says that nothing happened, because he wasn't looking around, and asks that she's all right. Jack wonders if he should start with her, and he asks her if she would like to work for him, or rather with him. The girl doesn't understand, so she asks if she'd like to work with you. Jack says yes and gives her a bag of gold coins. When she saw how many coins were in it, she was surprised and tossed the bag. She thanked him for the offer, but she can't accept that much money. Jack figured it was a fortune to her. He asked how much she wanted then. The girl replied that one shilling would be enough for her. Jack gave it to her. Handing over the basket of flowers, she hurried away. After apologizing again, she ran away. Here Jack had found his first female companion. The mentor says she hasn't seen a vampire in a long time. Jack, in the spur of the moment, says he didn't expect to find a vampire here either. Afterward, he interjects, uncomprehendingly, a vampire. His mentor asks him if that's why he chose her. But it wasn't. Jack thought she could reach the tenth circle. His stupidity is astounding, Valentine Milos, and she says she will have to teach him a lot. Of course, Jack hoped she would live a very long time and teach him a lot. In response, she says it's up to him. He says that she hasn't changed at all. To Valentine, the little girl's face looked familiar. She had seen a similar person before. She remembered, but she didn't think that the forest dwellers appeared here. So many amazing things have been happening lately, she thought. She told him she knew where she could buy a sword. To which Jack suggests that they go together to their common goal. Vampires are a special race, just like dragons. A girl in a black dress with long brown hair was talking about a sword that was light enough to travel with. But a short guy with light brown eyes and medium length brown hair wasn't listening at all. He was thinking that ten years ago, there was a war between dragons and vampires. And the reason for that was the struggle for power over the demonic forest. Of course, it had ended with the dragons winning blood pools and corpses were the result of the war. Most of the vampires had to leave the forest. Surely that girl had escaped from there too, or she was the child of those who had. But the boy wasn't particularly interested in the wars. He was scrutinizing the sword he was about to buy. The girl said about how it was an excellent choice, and this sword was made by a special blacksmith from a special material. In response, the guy said he was taking it. The joyful shopkeeper praised the customer for this choice, put the sword on the table, and wished him good use. The boy handed over the gold coin and told his mentor, a little girl with green hair and dark green eyes, who sat on his back, that he had already decided who would be his first companion. Then he walked out of the shop, the little girl with green hair, not quite sure what all this was for, and asked his friend if he was sure of what he was doing. The man replied that he understood her doubts. He also added that maybe he wasn't the only one who was lucky, but it would help the blonde girl open up. The girl behind him snidely asked, isn't he doing it for his own plan? The boy said nothing and said hello to the market vendor. The girl asked for a reason. It was 400 years ago. Since the mentor who sold the sword has dragon blood, many people, including the emperor himself, made a pact with her. Namely, no race should interfere in human affairs. It was after this agreement that many races moved into the demonic forest. 
but that was 400 years ago. The emperors who upheld the treaty have long since been buried in the ground. After all, no matter how strong you are, time is much stronger. But even after the agreement expired, the other races couldn't get out of the forest. The dragons, who had been bound by the agreement for two more years, began to forbid other races to leave. If they couldn't go, the others couldn't go. They kept a very close eye on everything. The mentor's law was still in effect, so they had to kill all the dragons. Maybe in this life, I could have saved them. The market was quite noisy. A large man was giving goods to a small blonde girl, and the girl was amazed at his height. The guy turned to the little girl from behind and asked her as a mentor not to burden herself with the responsibility. The blonde-haired girl with sunken cheeks held out the coin with her skinny hand and asked the man what he even knew about her. She looked very sickly and seemed to have no idea what food was. The man replied that he knew quite a lot. The boy was a student of his mentor from behind. She said in an unwilling voice that it was as he said and then added that the boy should not feed his blood. He didn't realize what she was talking about at first. Then the boy noticed that his blonde-haired traveling companion was still a baby, so she should be fed yummy treats. At this time, the skinny girl remembered how she met him. They met at the market one hot summer day. He handed her a sack and asked if she wanted to work for him, or rather with him. What was she supposed to say? He wanted her to be his assistant after all. The girl had a jug in her hands, which the man had given her for one coin. She had never seen such generous people. If her mother drank this or blood, should she feel better? Her mother had told the light blonde, since she was a child, not to drink the blood of humans or any blood for that matter. Not to drink any blood except the one her uncle gave her. The girl went into her house and thought about her uncle. She hoped he would come today. She told her mom that she was home, but there was no answer. Maybe she was asleep. The skinny girl went to her mother and asked if she was asleep. She told Charlotte that she had a visitor. But Charlotte didn't see anyone. Then someone behind her asked her if she had just arrived. She turned around frightened and saw the guy she was supposed to be helping. She asked him how he had gotten here. The guy only smirked snidely in response. Then his green-haired mentor told the girl's mother to get up and show herself normally. The woman pulled herself up and sat on the bed. She told her mentor that they hadn't seen her in a while. The girl asked why she was in such a state. In fact, the woman who was lying in the bed was named Vivian de Royal. She was a vampire of noble blood. Charlotte and the short boy, who was a little taller than her, were passing by gray brick houses. All the houses in this village were very similar to each other. Little white birds sat on the girl's shoulder and finger, and she, in a fragile and gentle voice, told them that she would give them more food. She smiled broadly and sincerely. The boy didn't understand why spend so much time fiddling with some birds. He looked up at the window of one of the houses and thought about how this could have been over with Mana a long time ago. He hoped nothing would happen. The old woman, Charlotte's mom, also looked weak and helpless. Her thin face seemed completely lifeless. Her thin dried hands were incapable of even holding the dishes. She sat on the bed with a blanket covering her legs and asked the girl with green hair sitting next to her who she was after all. She assumed she was a vampire hunter. The girl who was sitting behind her slowly turned around and asked the woman if she had forgotten her face. The woman paled dramatically and her face showed all the horror she had experienced in a second. Her eyes started to run in different directions. The woman assumed that she was Valentine Milos, whose entire clan had been forced to leave the forest. To this the girl replied that she should remember after all, she couldn't forget such a thing. The woman, still with the same face, which suddenly twisted with horror even more, said that then, just as she was about to say that, she began to cough very hard and clutched her eyes. Then she clutched her stomach and lowered her head. Her throat was torn from that terrible dry cough. The coughing was getting worse and worse. When she calmed down, she asked the girl who made her look like a toy doll. She replied that it was a curse, and she could only live like a normal person once a month, one night. She then looked at the woman once more with her cold gaze and said that it was completely unimportant and to answer her question. Also, she asked what the vampire elite had forgotten in such a backwater, and the woman continued to cough very hard. The mentor girl said that she could clearly see that Charlotte's mother hadn't drunk blood in a long time and asked why she had to go that far. The woman asked if the green-haired girl felt sorry for her. The woman replied that it had been a long time, and the woman used to be very strong, someone who was feared by everyone, but that she no longer had her former vivacity, and that if it were not for her, they might all have died at the hands of those fanatics. The woman said sharply, answering her question. 
she said that there are five creatures in the demonic forest. Behind their backs, standing and controlling them, are two lords. In the past, vampires had had to leave the forest to escape their oppression. Her daughter was just a baby then and also, the dragon, after killing almost all the vampires, said he felt sorry for Charlotte's mother, so he had mercy on them. The girl questioned if he had, indeed, done that. The woman replied that yes, and added that in the village where she was now, she lived next to cows and pigs, but she and her daughter were getting by. For that, to raise her, they moved to this place. The mentor replied that she felt sorry for them, for Charlotte's mother was an aristocrat, with the blood of lords flowing in her, but she was in such a miserable village, just waiting to die. At that time, the girl Charlotte asked the boy when they would leave, because their uncle was coming soon, and he did not like guests very much. The boy asked what kind of uncle, and then told the girl that he had an important question for her. She was alert and ready to listen. When the girl asked him what he wanted to say, the boy replied that he wanted her to tell him more about her uncle. The girl was very surprised. Tell her about her uncle. Charlotte was wary and replied that the boy was not his type. The boy, with an equally wary face, asked if that was what she had indeed thought. He then said that he was bored waiting and just wanted to hear stories. The girl replied that she had no trouble and then began to ponder where she should begin. She said that her uncle was rich. She didn't know much about him. He had bought a house for her and for her mom. The boy asked for more. The girl added that he brings them food every three days and that he is a very good man. The boy wondered what kind of food she was talking about. Probably the blood of pigs and cows. The boy changed his face and told the girl to listen carefully, because her uncle. When Charlotte asked who, the boy made a surprised look and looked back behind her. Behind the girl stood her uncle, a tall and very handsome man with long gray hair. He had a red crystal on his forehead, and his eyes were pink with green pupils. He asked Charlotte if this boy was her new friend, for this was the first time he was seeing him. The girl exclaimed joyfully that her uncle had come. The boy smiled and said that the man must be the uncle. The man noticed that the boy seemed to be an aristocrat. This uncle was a dragon. He asked the boy what brought him to this humble house, then looked at him with a very strange and piercing look. Without waiting for an answer, he went to the entrance of the house and said that there were a lot of guests today anyway. At this time, the woman was lying in bed. She asked Valentine to get her daughter Charlotte. A male dragon with long gray hair said that there were a lot of guests here today. He and the boy met eyes. The boy looked at this uncle disapprovingly and apprehensively and realized that they did have a visitor. The boy heard a voice in the dracone's head that said to bring the child and this man. The dracone wondered what the man was muttering to himself. The boy ran up to the entrance and opened the door and said that his mentor had called him. Then he told his uncle to come in, for he had come here to talk to the toy. The sick woman heard a creaking sound and told Charlotte that mommy was coming now. Then she cried out in terror when she saw the dragon man and turned pale. The man then grabbed little Charlotte's head and asked the woman why she was so surprised, as if she had seen a ghost. Then he said that he had just come for a visit and they could have a chat. Then he opened his eyes wide and opened his mouth with long, sharp white fangs sticking out and said that he promised not to make a scandal before she died. The woman's pupils shrank so much that they were no longer visible. The girl crying ran up to her mother and asked what was wrong with her and if she had gotten worse. The mother only quietly said her daughter's name. The girl, choking back tears, said that she had orc blood and that if her mother drank it as soon as possible, she would definitely get better. The woman, who also had tears coming out of her eyes, said that she didn't need anything and had prepared a birthday present for her daughter. Then she apologized for not being able to give her daughter anything in her lifetime and not being able to even give her a gift. The girl leaned her mother's hand against her cheek and sobbing loudly, called out to her mother and asked what was wrong. The dragon man stood behind her and grinned contentedly, amused by the whole thing. And the kid looked at the mother and daughter with a sad look. He felt very sorry for them. Originally, he and his mentor weren't supposed to see this. They had bumped into Charlotte and followed out of pure interest. They had no reason to keep an eye on her. The boy abruptly approached the woman and addressed her as Lady Vivian and asked if she would trust him with her daughter. He decided to create that reason right now. Charlotte didn't realize what was happening. The boy sat down on the chair next to the woman's bed and took her hand. He said there was not much time and he would get straight to the point. He asked what Vivian wanted for her daughter. He asked if she wanted Charlotte to become a full vampire, to have the whole world at her feet if not, if she wanted to avenge all vampires and slay the dragon. 
a man with a red crystal in his forehead with long gray hair, began to smirk even more his grin, was like a predatory beast playing with its prey. Then he opened his mouth in pleasure, and his white fangs were visible from far away. The woman finally weakened, but replied that yes, she would indeed wish for a different fate for her daughter, and she had nothing to wish for except for her to smile all the time. That would be enough. The girl stood looking at her mother with a piercing gaze. Tears fell from her eyes without ceasing. Vivian asked the boy to say his name one last time. The boy happily replied that his name was Jack Ballantier. The woman cried and kept saying that he had a very nice name and asked him if he could protect her Charlotte. Jack replied that he could and wished the bearer of noble vampire blood to rest in peace. When Charlotte heard those words, she didn't believe at first that her mother was dying. Her face had no sooner dry than the tears rolled again. Her face and then her body began to crack. She thanked Jack and called out to her daughter, taking her cheek with a weak hand and telling her that she would always love her. In a moment, there was nothing left of the woman. Charlotte beat her hands on the bed and begged her mother to come back and not leave her. Jack picked up his mentor and held her tightly against him. The dragon, who wasn't going anywhere, started laughing loudly and shrilly. The boy looked at him with a murderous look. The uncle stated he was about to die laughing. He didn't understand revenge, happiness. Did the guy really take responsibility for a child who was about to die? For that little vampire girl, it was hilarious. Jack didn't want to hear it and swung his fist with such force that the dragon flew away. He didn't understand what the hell had happened, and he was twisted with anger. The man used the force and flew into the air, then accused the guy of attacking the weak. He is a very rude young man. He added that Jack was unlikely to be a good friend to his trauma. He would have to teach him, teach him a lesson. But then the dragon's face changed dramatically. He stared at one point, his pupils dilated. He wondered what kind of weak magic he had just sensed. Next to the guy, he saw a little girl with green hair. She looked at him blankly. Is that a talking toy? The mentor said that if you took out the two lords, five dragons, but this man was not among them. She also added that the dragon was about 200 years old, so it must have been born somewhere in that span. The man didn't answer anything, then focused his gaze even more on the baby girl who sat in Jack's arms. After a second, the crystal that was in the dragon's forehead began to glow, and the man's eyes turned red. He was very angry, and his grin became more bestial. In a creepy voice, he asked the mentor how she knew this and who she was. The dragon wanted to know how she knew all this and who this girl was. Jack looked at the man very annoyed. He was angry that the mentor was called a girl. How could he? The girl told the guy to let her go. She could handle herself. Moving closer to the man, she said to Valentine Milos, a sorceress from the past. The dragon was amazed. He recognized her and didn't even believe her at first. He called her an immortal necromancer. He replied that he was right, and in ancient times, that was her name. The dragon accused Valentine of deceiving him, and that he was not stupid enough to fall for it. To this, the girl said only one phrase Bahamuth and Balamuth. The man was out of his mind. After all, Mahamut and Bolamut are two dragon lords, and their real names can only be known by those who have personally known them or are dragons themselves. The dragon said that he now believed Valentine Milos. Then he added that he, too, is a dragon and his name is Valactus Machiavelli. He was surprised. Who knew you could meet such a person in this backwater? He had only wanted to play with his second toy after the first one had died. Valentine told Valactus to leave immediately. The dragon, his face twisted with anger or laughter, said she dared not order him to leave. He asked her if she had forgotten what had happened, because they, the dragons, were the ones who had surpassed humans in everything in one. And does she really think she can give orders to a dragon? Milos replied that she thought the man was imagining things, but did dragons outdo humans in everything? It was she who did it, not the dragons. The man was shocked at the news, and Valentine added that he had forgotten that it was she who had separated them from the humans, because because of their deaf ego, the world began to crack at the seams, but the dragons stubbornly continued to think themselves better than everyone else in a rampage. The dragon tried to laugh, but it was heard that he was very angry that he was told the truth in the open and told the girl not to talk nonsense, because what does she even know about the past? Jack, who was standing nearby, grinned and called the angry uncle a lizard. He was very angry with the guy, but he wasn't scared, he just said that the lizard needed to stop talking and listen to what he was told. The guy also asked the dragon, since he was so fearless, why'd he tremble when he heard his mentor's name? Losing all control, the man jumped high up and declared that he was about to show Jack his place, 
giant sharp claws grew out of his hands. The dragon was about to attack, but the boy jumped back and then, bouncing off the high wall, he lunged forward and pushed the dragon with his foot, sending it flying backward, lurching and hissing like a snake. Then Jack stepped toward the man and lifted his chin up with his foot, telling him in a commanding tone not to think himself better than his mentor. But the enemy didn't stop in a low squeaky voice, saying that he was a dragon, which meant he was better than all of them, and humans were nothing. The boy responded by threatening the dragon that if he kept this up, he should let him close his eyes, because he would kill him. The dragon declared that Jack was just a nobody, then grabbed him by the leg and threw him into the wall of the house and told him not to hide behind Valentine Milos and think he was better than him. Valentine glared menacingly at Valactus and Charlotte, not realizing what was happening, cried loudly. Jack lay covered in dust on the debris of the wall and roof he had hit. He noticed that it was pretty messy and Ron would have fainted by now. Jack told Charlotte that he realized who her uncle really was the last lowlife on earth. Then he took the crying girl by the shoulders and told her to look at the wretch. He wiped out her family, killed her father, and played with her mother until she died. The girl didn't understand how that could be. Jack said her mother gave him the answer, but he needed her permission. Drawing his sword, he told Charlotte that everything depended on her word, and he would show how responsible he could be and how much power he had. Jack had a sharp sword in his hand. He was determined. With a couple of lunges, he almost succeeded in attacking the dragon, but the dragon was quick to dodge. Both knew they would not rest until the enemy was defeated. The man and boy made a run-up and ran straight at each other, but neither was injured after the skirmish. The dragon noted that the expectations were so high, but his technique turned out to be a triviality. Before he could say it, his hair flew down. Jack said he didn't want to ruin his face, and his new hairstyle suited him just fine. Dragon was torn with anger. He declared that he wasn't going to hold back any longer. That was the last straw. He used a wind technique, then a slash, but the guy used the ball to repel every one of his attacks and remained unharmed. The man didn't understand what it was, how it was. There was a look of utter incomprehension on his face. Valentine, though she didn't show it, was very surprised that Jack was able to repel the dragon's attack. Before the short-haired uncle could realize it, the boy had hit him from behind, and he fell to the ground exhausted, grunting, and coughing. He looked weak and very helpless. Jack turned to his defeated foe and said that he remembered what he had never realized, Valactus Machiavelli, Aka the son of Luca Machiavelli of the Forest of Monsters. The dragon turned pale and began to shake. He asked how the boy knew his father. He replied that Luca Machiavelli was one of the five dragons controlling the Forest of Monsters. In a previous life, it was Jack who had blown his head off. But this dragon, who is now at his feet, he had not seen in his past life. The dragon couldn't find his place. Perhaps someone had killed it or it was just hiding somewhere. Jack noted that in personality, the man looked a lot like his father. When the dragon asked him who he was, the boy was very surprised, like who? He was the first and last apprentice of Valentine Milos, whom the dragon had mocked. Valactus didn't understand how the man was able to stop his magic. And the boy didn't understand, was he really a dragon? The strongest creature in the world. Putting the sharp end of his sword to the dragon's face, Jack gave him five seconds. He told him to apologize for everything he had said about his mentor. The man, trembling slightly, covered in sweat, asked what would happen if he refused. The kid replied that then he would just wipe him into a powder that no one, ever, anywhere would be able to find. Simply put, he would do to him what the dragon had done to others over the years. Jack began the countdown. Five, four, the dragon also sat. Three, two. Valactus stated that he didn't like it, and then, spreading his wings, he flew high into the air. He wanted to get away quickly and report the incident to the other dragons. Jake was amazed, had the dragon really escaped? He didn't want to go that far, but Valactus had forced him to use his powers. Well, what could he do? He used his soul sword ability, concentration. At that moment, a giant blue tornado appeared where the guy was standing, kicking up a wind so strong that the dragon had trouble working its wings. Then Jack used the first of the four techniques, Heaven. Along with the tornado, a white light began to appear that burned with its brightness. The dragon panicked. Who the hell was he messing with? The dragon tried to leave the damn place, but his sword abilities wouldn't let him do so. He began to really worry about his life, which was so dear to him. Jack looked at him with a look full of flames of hatred. He truly wanted to get rid of the cowardly dragon, but he was flailing about in fear, wondering what he should do. Once again, trying to escape, he tripped and fell. He was really scared and wild at the same time. 
The guy with his sword came closer and closer, and almost caught up with the man with short hair. But he begged him not to come closer and to stay still. The guy held out his hand toward the dragon, and the dragon screamed shrilly. Jack woke up covered in sweat. He thought he had dreamed it. He looked around the bed he was lying on. The room he was in, he didn't know at all. The interior was completely unfamiliar. Velvet linings, carved wood windows. The room looked very rich. But the boy was only interested in where he was. A tall man with his blonde hair slicked back came into the room, wearing a shirt, tie, and beige cape. He asked what had happened to the gentleman since he had just woken up. Jack recognized the man, it was Ron. Then, the man came over and started pointing his fingers and asking if the boy was okay, if he recognized him and how he was feeling. The boy replied that he was fine. He also added that he wasn't a kid anymore and Ron should stop doing that. The boy also asked what Ron was doing here and where he was. The man hesitated to answer that question. Jack asked if the man had seen the toy and the girl with him. Ron replied that they had washed the blonde girl properly and put her to bed. She was in the next room. He added that when he saw her, he didn't realize what had happened to her. But from the look of her, something terrible. And when asked where the toy was, he pointed his finger at a little girl with green hair who was sitting next to him and asked if that was what he was talking about. Jake winked his eye, made a cute face, and said good morning to his mentor. He replied wryly that it was evening. Ron asked the boy if the toy could talk. Valentine made a very annoyed face and Jack asked if she was mad at him. She pouted even more and asked why she should be angry, since he was the only one who was hurt. The boy smiled and asked his annoyed face not to say that. Ron, who had been standing nearby the whole time, asked the boy if he was talking to the toy. It had been sitting unmoving for three whole days. Calling Ron over, Jack said he would explain everything to him later. But he should remember one thing, this toy was his mentor and Ron should be careful how he handled it. The man with the blonde hair bowed politely and said that Jack probably had a reason for saying that and that he would be careful from now on. Afterward, Jack asked Ron to tell him what had happened. The story turned out to be quite trivial. The rider, who was traveling with Jack, was found dead on the mountain. The Marcus found out what had happened. He hired a knight to look into the matter and find him on the trail. And there were many sightings of the boy in Arbolo province. After that, there were rumors that Jack was in the province of Osimbol. The knights saw a fight between a dragon and a human and immediately realized it. And eventually he was found unconscious. The boy asked if he had told everything. Ron replied that no one knew what condition the boy was in, but his wounds were serious. They moved him here and administered treatment. They had to give Jack three top-rate elixirs. The boy asked if the elixirs were strawberry-flavored. Ron replied that they were. The boy replied that the man still remembered that he liked the strawberry flavor and that was a good thing. But then the boy asked Ron why the man was here and not protecting his sister. The man replied that the lady also went to go looking for him, but the Marcus wouldn't let her in and they sent him instead because he knows him well too. The boy was surprised. Had the Marcus himself sent Ron? And then he said that their daddy was a fool. The blonde-haired man wanted to argue, but the boy said he was really glad Ron was there for him. All this time, there was a tall, large, muscular man standing in the doorway. He had red hair and green eyes. Jack, who the hell is this guy? But the man only called him third master and greeted him. The tall, red-haired man introduced himself as Gonzalez, the deputy commander of the Iron Blood Knights. He hastened to add that the guy had probably already heard of him from his servant Ron, that he was the one in charge of investigating the incidents. He also had a question. He asked if Jack didn't know that it wasn't proper for the third son of the Marcus to travel around the provinces and play with the local commoners. Okay, it's a lot for the third hair but he's still the Marcus's son, so he can't do that. Ron said that his lord was still sick, and a knight dare not behave like that. But Jack stopped him and said he was ready to hear the man out. Gonzalez said he wanted to ask the boy some questions and wanted him to answer them honestly. Jack remembered Ron's words that this particular knight had bought him three elixirs of the highest quality, so he would try to endure three questions from the man. Then, staring directly at Gonzalez, the boy told him to ask his questions. The man didn't understand why this boy was looking at him so strangely. Still, the knight asked. Jack was the only survivor on that mountain after all. So what happened there? He answered that nothing had happened, but his trusted personal guards had received a strange order to maim him. And then it was necessary to give him the elixir. The boy, eating the knight's eyes, asked if he knew about it and why he was looking at him like that, if it was the first time he heard about it. 
Gonzalez turned visibly pale and drops of cold sweat began to run down his face. He told the boy not to translate the conversation and to continue the story. Jack convinced himself that he had two more times to go. He began to explain further. The knights stood beside the boy and drew their sharp swords from their sheaths and told him not to take offense, but they had said so themselves. They were to stop somewhere four nights on the way to the academy and all those four times. The knights were going to break Jack's bones and in the morning give him elixirs and so on the rest of the way. Then he asked if these knights weren't really terrible guys. Gonzalez told the boy to go on. The boy added that there was even a sixth grade knight with them, but he couldn't remember his name. The knight asked if he was talking about Rijon. The boy said that exactly yes, this Rijon believed himself and was going to destroy his manicure. Ron was shaken. He asked the Lord what he was talking about. With his next sentence, he made Gonzalez turn white with horror. He said that he had killed Rijon. The red-haired man didn't want to believe what he was now hearing and asked again. Jack asked if he was deaf and added that he had killed them all. Gonzalez was very stunned. He could not understand how the Lord had managed to defeat a whole troop of knights single-handedly. His eyes widened. He wasn't sure if it was even possible to do that. The boy slowly approached the knight and told him that he could certainly turn a blind eye to many things, but not to these insolent men who had tried to kill him. In response, the knight asked if the boy was mocking him. Making an even more caustic and sarcastic face, Jack inquired. Did Gonzalez really think so? Then he told the narcissistic knight that he should be careful, for no matter how much Lady Elizabeth loved him, the young lord would not turn a blind eye to such things. Ron turned to the disgruntled Gonzalez, who was very skewered with anger and suggested he speak privately, touching him on the shoulder. Showing maximum squeamishness, the man replied that a mere servant should not touch him and Ron should get off his back. Jack was very hurt by this prank, and he clenched his hand into a fist and drove it into the knight's face, sending him flying back a couple of meters. The boy called Gonzalez a bastard and said that he had already restrained himself three times, and that he had had enough. The use of physical force made the boy dizzy. Ron picked him up and told him he wasn't fully recovered yet and he shouldn't do that. The boy collapsed on the cold floor, and a man with blonde hair crawled over to him and worriedly began to ask what was wrong with him. The boy replied that he was just a little dizzy and called for a helper. Ron answered and gently placed the boy on the bed. He told him that the knight was probably a seventh circle, and it was amazing that he was bullying a common servant. Ron looked at the boy with a grateful yet caring look and Jack grabbed the man by the tie and asked him not to live like this anymore, for he was too stupid. He said that he had thought that he would feel better around Ron, but he thought differently now. Then he rested his head against his chest and added that since Ron was his human, he should live as a human. The man looked at the young man with an affectionate and soft gaze and said that he had never said that before. Then Jack asked if Ron wanted to live an ordinary life, not serving in the palace. He replied that he didn't want to, the boy exhaled a sigh of relief. Then the butler slowly walked over to Gonzalez, the deputy captain of the Iron Blood Knights, the third most powerful man in the palace, and told him that even though Jack didn't know him, he remembered him well, then he threw off his beige cloak. The boy asked how many minutes the man should be given, and if five would be enough. Ron started to warm up, and answered the boy that he should know what he was capable of, a minute was quite enough. Everyone probably knows by now that Ron is a great cook. Really good. Is it appropriate to talk about food right now? Of course not. You can tell from his actions. He was hitting Gonzalez at breakneck speed, attacking left and right, knocking out his teeth, pulling out his hair, tearing his face bloody. He wanted revenge on that scoundrel. His long hair that had been licked must stop, but it was still as beautiful and silky. The knight got up and wanted to punch the stupid brat for hitting him, but no sooner had he gotten up than he was again thrown to the ground by the heavy hand of the handsome butler. The maids came running to the sound of the fight, whispering and not knowing what was going on. The knights stood in the doorway, wondering if they should intervene in the carnage. Jack sat on the bed and watched the fight carefully. He didn't want to miss the slightest detail. Ron's movements seemed painfully familiar to him, and it was no wonder, because he'd seen Ron fight before. He could fight on his own, or he could use his powerful strength. But even on the ninth circle, the basis of his power was magic, not physical strength. Wasn't it strange that Gonzalez, a seventh circle mage, was losing to Ron, who was pretending to be an ordinary servant? He has a lot of experience in close combat with stronger guys. Plus, you can always tell he's a spy for the Tolkien Empire, which is why Ron killed him, although Ron's not likely to kill him. 
While Jack was thinking about it, he didn't even notice that Gonzalez had taken a sharp sword from one of the knights standing nearby and wishing the butler dead had run to attack him. But Ra was not so simple. When the knight was about to approach him, he intercepted the sword and threw it back with a slight movement of his hand, hitting the man with his knees so hard that a fountain of blood spurted from his face. The boy knew he was holding back because of him and not showing his true power. Jack called out to Ron. The man turned around as if nothing had happened and smiled sweetly and called back. The boy reminded him that he had asked him to prepare the dish and how long he had to wait. The butler was a little embarrassed at first, and when Gonzalez came up behind him and tried to throw a punch, he made a walking chop with his fist and told him it was ready. Turns out the kid had timed the fight, exactly one minute and fifteen seconds. He told Ron he needed to be a little faster. The man made a sad face and agreed that wasn't his max yet. Jack threw a glance in the direction of the knights and said that if they'd had enough, let them go about their duties. They bowed obediently to the third lord and left the chambers. The boy slowly approached Gonzalez, moaning and coughing with pain, and taking him by the hair, offered to talk to him in private. The knight spat up blood and called pitifully to the third lord. The boy, without responding, noticed that the man had a cool name Gonzalez. His fighting skills were not bad either, and his father trusted him. The poor man first started talking about the boy, then about his crazy servant, and then he started coughing, as his respiratory system couldn't work steadily. Jack looked at this sight as if he had a piece of garbage in front of him that needed to be gotten rid of and then asked if the knight still didn't understand anything, but then reassured him that he didn't have to answer that rhetorical question. He also added that the man came to him to find out what happened then, but now, because he knows who is behind it and how it all happened. Interesting, Marcus' favorite, third knight, over thirty, deputy captain. It's a shame to kill him so easily. Jack turned to the knight, who was trembling, sweating, gritting his teeth. The boy asked Gonzalez if he wanted the eighth circle. The man, leaning on the boy's hands, almost jumped up and made a surprised look. Jack whispered to him if he wanted to be captain instead of being a deputy. The boy pretended like he was just a sweet little angel and told him they could make a deal. Ron looked at all this and was sure that his young master was up to something again. Then he began to smile and marveled at how mature his master was and how proud he was of him. Ron was so engrossed in his thoughts that he didn't notice Valentine poking his foot with her index finger to make him notice her. The man got down on one knee and bowed courteously to her, saying that he had heard his master call her mentor. He asked her permission to introduce himself, also without raising his head. The girl looked at him with a stern look, as if not noticing his pallidness and courtesy, and then asked Ron if it was an impulsive outburst. The man with long hair didn't know how he should react to such a statement from the little girl with green hair. He was very dumbfounded by such a thing. The butler, who was in complete shock, was very surprised. The little girl only said 19, and then corrected herself no, not 20 years ago, Ron already had a ninth round. Getting it in his third decade of life wow. His skills should be higher now. She wondered what such a person found in being an acolyte. Ron didn't answer anything but was amazed. She also added that this butler could have gotten as high as the tenth circle, or he could have become an archmage. Then, she looked at him and asked, wasn't twenty years old enough for him? A cold sweat ran down Ron's face, and his eyes started running in different directions. Pretending he didn't know what she was talking about, he asked what she meant. She repeated the question, but this time, asking if twenty years without using magic wasn't enough for him. Nineteen to be exact. Ever since Jack and Elizabeth had arrived at the Marcus Manor, Ron hadn't used magic once, and recently, he'd only had to do it once to save Jack. Did it matter now, though? Valentine wondered if the butler with the long blonde hair was sorry for the life he'd given up. She placed her small right hand on his knee and said that all these people were weaker than him, so why should he receive such treatment from them? He doesn't need to turn a blind eye to his own desires and dreams or he is still going to live for this child. She also added that it's now clear where Jack got his skills and magic from. She wondered if Jack knew how much power he actually possessed. The man didn't know how to respond to what Valentine Milos had said. Ron told her that his young master had once told him that there was no point in looking back on the past, no matter how hard it was. He'd also said that Jack was probably aware of his abilities, because he'd pointed it out to him many times. If Jack had heard this conversation, he probably would have pretended to be a stranger. What? Magic? But Jack didn't really know that much. At the same time, the boy was talking to Knight Gonzalez, 
asking him to remember that he wouldn't repeat himself twice, and that he would gladly kill him, but he would need him, so Jack would keep him alive. The knight's hand was shaking, and the boy, as if not noticing it, said he would ask again whose side he as captain was on. Gonzalez grimaced in unrelenting pain. Drops of cold sweat dripped from his face, and his teeth shook and clattered against each other. He tried to get a word out, but he failed. Jack sat on his chest, blocking his breath, and looked at him disappointedly. He said he was very disappointed, which was what he'd expected in the first place, but he looked. Then, in a rougher, quieter voice, Jack told him that if he didn't want to be hurt, he should try not to move or use mana. Then the guy stored enough energy in his right hand and started healing the knight's wounds. He pressed hard on his chest in the heart area and injected some of his mana there. It penetrated his heart and blood and made it circulate through the blood vessels faster, and thus he was able to find the seven crystals that made his heart beat, and he had told the bastard to surrender at once. With the help of his magic, he started sliding one crystal at a time. From the contact with the magic, they began to glow brighter than any lantern. The frightened man asked Jack what he was doing. The man grabbed his arm. He looked at him with a hard and cold gaze and told him to sit still and keep still, because he could kill him at any second. He agreed with him, didn't he? The man kicked and grunted. He didn't want to lose to the boy until the last minute. Jack was as focused as possible, thanks to his magic. He managed to create a crystal that was similar in shape and appearance to the ones in Gonzalez's heart, but it was different in color. It was black. Then, after giving the man some more pain, the boy carefully attached this crystal to his heart and now, instead of seven circles, he had eight circles of crystals. The bright light from the knight's chest lit up the whole room. He even thought he was about to die. He was preparing himself for the worst. But then the boy abruptly announced that they were done. When he looked at his chest, he saw a heart and eight crystals. Jack said that the crystal he had created would work for three to five months. The surprised knight didn't understand why the boy would make it stronger. And who was he that could do such a thing? The boy replied to Gonzalez that he didn't think it was worth asking questions. The man didn't know what to answer. He had mixed feelings inside. Jack smiled sweetly as if nothing had happened, and by doing so, he made the knight worry even more. Also, he told the knight that he now had no choice and would have to do what the young lord said. He added that Gonzalez should realize what would happen if he refused. He would die. A horrible death, a death so horrible you can't even imagine it. The man was shaking with fear, he feared the young boy as if he were dying. And outside the window he could see the rays of the rising sun. It was dawn. At last it was the morning everyone had been waiting for. Jack smiled and asked Gonzalez if he knew what the rumors were now. He then answered his own question. He is a master of black magic. That's what everyone is saying now. Back when Jack beat up Palin and went to prison. Some of the rumors that were circulating among the people got to him. A lot of people thought the guy had black magic, and indeed he did. The young lord, the third heir of the Marcus, was telling his victim Knight Gonzalez that these were not rumors but the truth, and he did possess black magic, although the man probably guessed it himself. The boy then pointed his index finger at the man and ordered him to kneel down in front of him. The man, knowing he had no choice, obeyed. Jack sat in the chair in the posture of a true ruler, and told Gonzalez that he had better turn on his brain and listen to what he was telling him. One, he needed to get back to the boy's father. Second, when he got back, he had to tell him that the third lord did not know what had happened on the mountain. The knight replied that he understood, and the third. After three months, Count meant his supporters, the knights on the Marquesa's side, more than forty people, must definitely be eliminated. He nodded his head obediently at first, and then looked up at the boy with a startled expression. Jack only ordered him to obey. He remembered that there was one black, shining thing in the knight's body. Gonzalez got down on one knee and assured the boy that he would obey. The boy looked at the man approvingly, and then, putting his arm around him, began to laugh and told him not to be so sad, because he should have listened to him right away. Then certainly no one would not be hurt. Then the boy touched the bewildered knight on the cheek, and he looked at him questioningly and did not understand what was happening because a couple of hours ago, he almost killed him. Jack pointed to the man's chest. A violet light was visible on the left side of his heart. The boy encouraged Gonzalez, saying that he had become an eighth circle mage in a second. Then, looking at him like a maniac again, he told him to obey him and do whatever he said, then everything would be fine. That's much better, isn't it? Or maybe he hadn't been beaten enough after all and didn't understand. The man swallowed a lump in his throat and said nothing. 
Jack tapped him on the back and told the kid to relax a little, because everything was okay. But there was something else. All his conscious life, Gonzalez had been really bugging poor Ron, yelling at him, throwing his food at him, and he had to keep quiet and endure. Now it was his turn. Jack decided to put it more simply, namely that Gonzalez would become Ron's rag. He asked the knight if he understood him. On the butler's face he read great embarrassment. He felt sorry for the man, but at the same time, it was totally deserved. Jack, even more amused, ordered the knight to ask Ron what he needed and fulfill everything. Then, he gave him a kick in the ass and threw him out of the room and told him to disappear. The boy contentedly closed the door behind him. He was glad that now, he had another chick. The first one, blonde and pumped up, was a jerk, but the second one would still have to obey him. Meanwhile, Ron was applying bandages to Valentine's knees. She asked for the disgruntled look if he was done. He replied that he was done and smiled broadly. Jack said he was so hungry he was dying to die. Ron asked if the boy was going to leave like that. The boy looked at the butler questioningly and asked what he was talking about. Ron ran over to the drawer that was next to the bed and said that he knew that his young master would say that and he had prepared all the essentials, he just needed to wait a bit. Jack wondered what Ron had prepared for him. Since all of Jack's clothing luggage had been lost, he had taken him some clothes. The boy smiled broadly and thanked his older friend warmly and put on a clean white shirt. Now he was very hungry. At this time, Charla came running into the room. Her long blonde hair was washed and neatly gathered into a small white headband. She was wearing a soft pink dress with short sleeves. On her feet, she had white tights with black sandals. She hugged Jack tightly with her small arms and rested her face against his chest and told him that she was very worried about him when he couldn't wake up. The boy looked at her with an affectionate look and hugged her back. The boy told Ron to go make breakfast and he would come over later. The man bowed courteously to the young gentleman and said he would be right out and wished the boy and girl a good conversation. Charlotte looked very tired. Jack assumed that the girl was exhausted because she had not drunk blood for a long time. She grabbed him by the neck and was not going to let go. Jack asked if she could loosen her grip, but she just wrapped her arms around him more. They stood on the balcony where they could see everything around them. Jack looked guiltily at Charlotte and apologized for destroying her house. The girl, a little embarrassed, said it was all right and she wasn't angry. Her silky hair, which was developing in the wind, looked and very beautiful, it was shiny and gathered in curls. The girl said that her home was where her family was and since her mother was gone, it made no sense for her to live alone in an empty house. After these words, tears rolled down from the girl's eyes, but in spite of this, she smiled broadly, just as her deceased mother had wanted. Throughout the palace and garden, the wind dispersed the petals of pink, fragrant roses. Charlotte walked briskly through the garden, not noticing its beauty. Something was bothering her. At that moment, Jack caught up with her, and taking her by the arm so that she would not run away, told her that he, too, had lost his mother very early, and he was so small that he had not the slightest memory of her in his mind. And yet, he always had Ron by his side, and now his mentor was also by his side. He told the girl that even in the most horrible life, happiness could always be found. Then the boy sharply summoned sharp blades with magic. He cut his hand very hard with them, and a small trickle of blood flowed from it. Charlotte was very frightened for Jack and cried out that he was bleeding. But the boy, as if not noticing her anxiety, put his hand to her mouth. The boy motioned to the girl to come with him. She didn't answer anything, but from the look in her eyes, it was clear that she liked the boy's blood very much. The girl bit Jack's arm with her fangs until it bled, and then sucked the blood greedily leaving large bruises and wounds on the boy's arm. The boy noticed that Charlotte was insanely hungry, which was why she was drinking so much. After feeding some amount of blood, a bright yellow light started to appear around the guys. The girl's body began to gradually enlarge. At first, she didn't realize what had happened to her. But then it became clear that her body had just recovered very well. Vampires have shielded themselves from dragons, as they have one ability. To regain their power by drinking special blood. Charlotte looked at the boy incomprehensibly, she didn't understand why he had done that. But the boy smiled and asked her if she felt any better. The girl thanked him and told him that she was fine now. Jack's look changed as he asked the girl what her impression was. Charlotte didn't quite understand what impression he was talking about. The guy asked her how she reacted to how he was willing to fight the dragon to save her. The girl remembered what he was talking about and said she was a little scared. Jack smiled contentedly. Also, Charlotte added that she was very impressed and didn't expect that. 
Then, she looked at him with a soft look, and a slight blush appeared on her cheeks. She said that her brother was very cool. Jack was a little confused as to why she called him bro. Although, he realized that he needed to face it, he was getting on in years. The boy replied that he'd rather be the boss. The girl looked at him strangely. She didn't understand what else boss was. Jack told Charlotte that she better call him boss instead of brother. The girl was very discouraged, but at the same time, elated at his awesomeness. She smiled widely so that her little white fangs were visible and told her boss that she would. Jack sat at the big table and devoured the food Ron had prepared for him. He looked surprised and even a little worried as he asked about the adult dragon that Jack had fought and defeated. The young man replied that it was true. The butler looked at the boy as if he was talking nonsense. The boy guessed that Ron didn't really believe him. Because when a dragon turns 10 years old, it already has a mana heart of about level 4 or 5, and by the time it reaches 50, it becomes a master. In addition, dragons have abilities. Giant individuals can shrink down to the size of small humans, and it's not quite the same as polymorphs. A dragon's body is already fundamentally made up of magic, but turning into a human is usually used in combat. And if that Balactus had been a little smarter, if Jack had given him a chance for a good attack, he wouldn't be here now. Ron noticed that the young master was only eating meat and told him there were vegetables too. But the boy only waved his hand and said he would eat them later. The boy added that since he was here now, the dragon was very foolish. The butler hesitantly asked in what way stupid. The boy replied that no matter how hard he tried, he still only had a maximum of a second round. He then looked at Ron carefully to see if it was normal to defeat a dragon of the tenth circle or higher. Ron was very surprised and didn't manage to answer anything interesting, except that this situation was quite surprising. The boy continued. He said that the dragon was inexperienced and didn't know how to use his powers properly, and his fear clouded his judgment, so he died. Abruptly, the boy stopped talking and slowly turned around to the butler and noticed that he had a rather strange reaction to their conversation. The man didn't understand what the boy was talking about. The man replied that another man, upon learning that Jack had killed a dragon, would have started laughing like those silly mercenaries earlier. Biting down on his fork, he added that it seemed perfectly normal for Ron to allow the idea that he was able to defeat a mage of that level. So, how did that happen? Ron was embarrassed and didn't know what to say to that. He started to mumble something and then asked the guy if he knew about something. When asked by the guy what exactly, he clarified about the past and all that. Jack irritatedly asked Ron what he meant, and then yelled that the butler was hiding something from him. Ron told Jack that there was something he didn't know about. He warned that it would be a long conversation and asked if Jack was okay with that. Sipping wine from a large crystal glass, the boy said he didn't mind. No matter what, Ron was very dear to him. In his past life, even when they had run away from home together, he hadn't told about his past and it was better that his secret remained a secret further down the line. But there was only one thing the boy wanted to know. Jack called Ron over, and when he started to listen to him carefully, he said he would ask him a single question. The butler replied that he was willing to listen to anything. The boy asked, in a rough and serious voice, if Rogue was connected to the Tolkien Empire. The butler interjected what he meant by connected. The boy assumed he was a spy. In a serious voice, he replied that none of that was true, and he had nothing to do with them. Jack eyed the man suspiciously with a stern look. Then, he exhaled, smiled, and said that once, it was okay. But still, just in case, it needed to be clarified. Still, the boy wanted to make sure he wasn't putting too much pressure on Ron, and hope he wasn't. Then the boy smiled and noticed that the butler was smiling too, so basically everything was fine. Jack told Ron that it was time to develop circles of mana, by driving his fork around a plate that held chunks of marbled beef and a slice of pineapple. When he used magic, but he almost died. The guy needs to develop physical fitness and mana circles like before to become stronger. He needs to study at the academy first, and then we'll see. Valentine appeared in front of Jack and said that he was indeed her student since he was able to use the power of the Black Crystal. The Black Crystal. In this world, only Jack and the mentor know of this black magic. No one else knows about it. That's because it was the mentor who created it during a time that made her world famous. In other words, during the wars. That's when Valentine Milos began using the Black Crystal. If you engraved a vow on a magic circle and didn't honor it, not only the circle, but the entire body would explode. This terrible magic made Jack's mentor more famous. Valentine asked the boy, so what kind of vow he had engraved on his circle? 
and what he wanted. He replied that it was just a safety net for his sister and Ron. The butler turned concernedly to his young master and said he had no idea what he was talking about, but thanked him profusely for doing it for him too. Ron also noticed that Jack had become more emotional since his conversation with his mentor. Charlotte suddenly entered the room. The girl was still wearing the same soft pink dress, and her long blonde hair was gathered into two small ponytails. She turned to her boss. The boy looked at her questioningly. She started that the maids were wearing her out. They said she was very nice, asked why she was alone, and suggested she braid her two ponytails. The guy laughed and then said that Charlotte was just about the time and told her to sit down next to him. The girl blinked and did as she was told. Ron came up to her and asked if she was hungry. Charlotte replied that she wasn't at all, and it was all thanks to her boss. Jack told the butler that he would like to send the girl to the academy. He asked if it was possible. The man replied that sometimes his young master forgot that he was only a servant. The boy clarified that yes, Ron was indeed just a butler, but an unusual one, and then asked if his omnipotent servant could arrange for Charlotte to get into the academy. The man looked embarrassed and quietly replied that he didn't even know. Jack smiled and said that since he did, he would arrange it himself. The man reminded the boy that you can't blackmail people. He replied that it wasn't blackmail at all, because he wasn't some bandit. The girl got up from her chair and leaned on the table and asked if she was going to school. Jack replied that yes, she would. Charlotte didn't believe it at first, but her boss declared that he wasn't kidding. It would be a shame to waste such talent. Although the young vampire has no mana circles yet, he will be able to help her reach even the tenth one. And then the girl will become as capable a mage as he is. We'll have to talk to Gonzales and get Charlotte into the academy. The only problem is age. You can enter the academy from the age of 14, but the girl is only 11, so it won't be easy. The boy tells Charlotte not to worry, because she will study there anyway. A few days later, the boys arrived at the academy. Ron handed over the luggage he'd packed for Jack, and he thanked him. Also, the butler told the boy to keep an eye on his health, and if anything happened, to write to him right away. The boy told Ron that he wanted to leave all the chores at home to him. The man asked if that meant Jack wanted to focus entirely on the academy. The boy pointed to Gonzales, who was standing with the other knights, and called him very stupid. And that was true. It couldn't be said that he had an outstanding mental capacity. You could even get rid of him. But the guy said that he had found him a job and Ron would have to supervise its execution. The butler was very surprised. He asked the boy what he needed to supervise. Jack answered that he would take out all the trash from the house, but gradually. Ron became even more agitated and asked the boy with a frightened look if he was referring to the vassals and family of Count Mentis. Jack replied that that was exactly what he meant. The man began to speak in a trembling voice about Lady Elizabeth. The boy did not wait for the butler to finish, and said that his sister was a very kind and trusting girl, and she would not dare to do this, and he wanted to help her change. Jack was afraid that the atmosphere in the house might have a bad effect on her, so Ron needed to look after her properly. The butler obeyed and nodded and noticed that the gentleman had changed a lot. The boy was embarrassed and started to prove that it wasn't true at all. Valentine told Jack that he had very good subordinates. The boy corrected her. Ron was his friend, not his subordinate. Then he made a cute face and said that his mentor was his friend too. She only made a disgruntled face and asked him not to make her laugh. When the guys approached the Ectimion, they saw a giant white building with many windows, and with a large green courtyard, fountains, and tall trees. Charlotte ran back and forth and squealed with delight. She told her boss that she had never been to a place like this before. The guy replied that she would have to get used to it, because she would have to come here often. The girl agreed and smiled at him, flashing her white fangs. A woman came up behind Charlotte and asked the guy if he was Jack Ballantier. The girl leaned against the guy in fright, and he said that yes, he was. The woman in a maid's costume bowed and said that the director was waiting for him in his office. Without wasting a minute, the boy went up to the building and came to the office of the director of the academy. A man with a strange wooden cane with green crystals on top said that he had heard about the boy. He was an aristocrat who had destroyed several buildings and killed a group of people. He was even published to the newspaper. The boy noticed he hadn't been here in a while. The headmaster of the academy, an old man with long gray hair and a beard, Rommel Einhardt Essenbel, the father of the current Duke of Essenbel. And here nothing has changed at all. It had been the same in Jack's previous life. He was sitting there with his head, covered with bandages, asking the headmaster if he could do an experiment during his visit to the academy. 
The old man replied that it was okay. If he was on the list of the best students, he wouldn't be expelled. The boy was very sad and broken. The headmaster added that his inconsiderate father and brother could have finished him off before he came of age. He honestly said that he told a bunch of guys like Jack. The boy lowered his head and asked how he was going to live his life. The headmaster gave him a pat on the head and said he'd have to decide for himself and if he wanted, the dormitory could give him a private room. The old man had a special weakness for unhappy children. This time, Jack sat in a defiant and commanding posture. He asked Rommel if he wanted to make a deal. The man told the gentleman that he didn't quite understand. The kid reminded him that he had a duty to his teacher, so he was willing to save his life, but only if he honored his request. The director smirked and noticed that Jack hadn't been as sharp-tongued the first time they'd met. It was amazing how much a person could change in a month. A month for the principal, but for the kid, it was twenty years. Even a river changes its direction twice in that period. So, how could a man be worse? The director noted that what the boy said was quite curious, and he was willing to listen to him. Rommel asked how Jack could save him. The boy answered rather oddly. He said that from his memories, the Teslin Empire fell in a war against the Tolkien Empire. It happened about a month after the war started. Time dragged on very slowly. There are over thirty sword masters in the Tolkien Empire. Among them, there are half-breeds who have dragon blood and bones, and over a thousand people with seven circles of mana. In comparison, the Teslin Empire only has two swordmasters and about a hundred mages. There's also a big difference in location, and it lasted a month. If Jack had been captain of Tolkien's army, it would have been over in three days. The Teslin Empire would have lasted that long because of him. There were over seven hundred men in the unit of battle mages led by General Rommel. They appeared suddenly and began to fight for Teslin. If the guy had been fine, the empire would have lasted two months. Nothing happened, it was just a betrayal, most shocking and horrifying. Then the guy called out Blutus' name. The director was electrocuted, shouting Jack's last name and first name loudly, and yelled at him, asking him how dared he say his name. The boy went on to say that he was a spy for the Tolkien Empire. Blutus Marco. He currently works as an assistant instructor at a fencing school. He's a knight of the Sixth Circle and a vassal of the Duchy of Osinbol. Rommel said he is very loyal to him. The boy looked mockingly at the Strick and asked if that was really true. The headmaster gloomed and asked the boy if he was now accusing Osinbol's vassal. The boy asked not to make him laugh and said that in a few years he would stab the old man in the back. But of course, Rommel should not believe the kid, but he would regret it very much later. The director of the academy replied that he warned Jack not to do anything he couldn't take responsibility for, and the old man pretended that the conversation never happened. Then, he sent the boy away. He wasn't very surprised. He was trying to save the old man's life. Putting his hand on the table, the boy added that he wasn't some crackpot, and if he didn't understand anything right now, he could call him when he was ready. Rommel called for Blutus. Jack complimented him, but told him not to send any more information to the Tolkien Empire. The man grimaced and asked what that meant. The boy replied that okay the assistant's head was not working, but what happened to his hearing or was he being deceptive? Blutus only called the boy a problem son. He not only has problems with his body but also with his head. He also added that the principal sympathizes with him but treats him like a spy and punishment is sure to follow for this accusation. The boy did not tolerate it and walked with his fist on the man's face. As a traitor, Blutus talked too much and paid for it with his face. The man with the abrasion on his face asked the director to explain what was going on now. Jack at that moment kicked Blutus hard in the stomach and he flew backwards. In response, the man yelling asked the guy how dare he behave like that in an educational institution. The man tried to punch him, and when his fist was near Jack's face, he quickly dodged. Blutus didn't understand how the boy managed to dodge such a glancing blow. The boy could see with his abilities that the man was overflowing with six circle mana and that was his greatest weakness. The guy threw swift blows. Blutus didn't have time to catch his breath before he struck again. That master watched worriedly, but didn't interfere. Jack asked the man if he was hurt badly, and then began to gather energy in his hands to use against his opponent. He told the exhausted man that it was now time for him to come clean. Blutus coughed and grunted in pain. He looked pathetic. Jack looked at him without an ounce of regret, and Riley called him poor man. Then he sat down beside him and said that it was rather silly to agree, for to pretend further would be foolish. The man was very angry. 
He looked at the boy as if he wanted to kill him and asked him what he was talking about. The boy only smiled sweetly in response and touched his hand to his chest. Using his powers, he saw six blue crystals in his heart. The sixth circle, it can only be obtained by going through great pain. If one destroys something that one has worked very long and hard to achieve, it would be forever etched in his memory. Then Jack said he would ask a question. He added that if Blutus lied, he would destroy all the circles one by one, leading to a slow and agonizing death. The man turned visibly pale. Large drops of sweat were rolling off his face and his eyes were running in different directions. He asked fearfully what it meant. The boy, without moving his hands away from the man's chest, thus making him even more nervous, asked the first question. He inquired if Blutus was a spy for the Tolkien Empire. The man was shaking and shrinking with fear, his body not listening. His hand was shaking very badly. After a little while, he irritably shouted that it wasn't like that at all, and he didn't understand at all why this kid was going on about spying. After his words, Jack used the force and the entire office filled with a bright blue light. The boy stated that the answer the man gave was wrong. Jack shattered one blue crystal, thereby causing the man very severe and unbearable pain and said that he only had five laps left. Then he looked at him with a look full of full readiness to make another attack and break another crystal and asked again if Blutus was a spy for the Tolkien Empire. Tears streamed from the man's eyes in pain, he was shaking even harder, he could pass out at any moment. There was no answer to the question Jack had posed. Poor fencing assistant, it was very hard for him to say the truth out loud. Jack asked Blutus if he was going to keep quiet and think everything was just a bad joke. Then the boy said that when you lose a circle, you almost have to die to get it back however, he's not that kind, so he placed his mana in his heart. And if the man wanted to create a new circle in his heart, he would be pierced by a terrible pain that he could not get rid of. He asked the man if after all, death might be better than all the agony he would have to endure. The boy smiled wryly and told Blutus that the most interesting thing he didn't even realize was that he wouldn't be able to get the mana circle anymore. But although as an option, there was one way to restore the destroyed circle. Jack Ballantyr told Bluthus that there was another way to restore the circle that had already been destroyed. The young master was so kind that he agreed to tell him about it. He asked the knight to listen carefully and not miss anything. You can infuse it with dragon blood and replace its bones with dragon bones, and then perhaps his lost circle will be restored. The assistant instructor asked in surprise, how did he know about this? Jack suggested that he try to test his true identity. After that, he sat on Bluthus's stomach and held out a palm that took on the color of the blue sky. Jack Ballantyr said he knew about the dragons and the test. Isn't there a lot of information in the sixth circle? Bluthus Marco exclaimed, who the hell is he? How did he know about the secret research in Tolkien? With that involuntary question, Bluthus gave himself away. The young man smiled and said, it's true, where did he get so much data from? After that, he used his technique to strip the knight of all circles. Jack Ballantyr got to his feet and said solemnly to the motionless knight that he now had zero laps. Then he turned to the headmaster of the academy and asked him if he was willing to comply with his request. At this time, Marco, who had regained consciousness, whispered to Jack Ballantyr that Tolkien would never leave him alone now. Every day of his life will be filled with pain. At this point, Jack interrupted the knight's rant with a kick and told the headmaster that he would have to spend some time cleaning up. Rommel Einhardt Assemble did not understand. This youth was nothing like the boy he knew. Jack Ballantyr remarked to the director that a lot of things can change in a person in a month. Isn't that enough? Rommel closed his eyes wearily and said that he wouldn't ask him about it, but he still had some explaining to do. The young man interrupted him and asked, what about their deal? Doesn't he know about the situation on the continent? The war is already slowly beginning. In the Tolkien Empire, the entire struggle for the throne is being waged. Between the Silence faction, led by the second son of the Imperial family, and the Cruelty faction, led by the current Crown Prince. The latter will win, which will affect the life of the entire continent. Jack Ballantyr had spent ten years in the mountains with his mentor, so he didn't really know what was going on down there. The young man turned to the director and said that he was ready to save the life of Blutus Marco because he knows a lot about dragons and in general has useful information. He can question him thoroughly. For both him and the emperor, this would be the best option.
The old man asked, And for the emperor? Jack Ballantyre nodded. For his majesty. Although he'd like to call him a complete bastard. Jack Ballantyre, looking at the motionless body of the assistant fencing instructor, wondered where this mediocrity got so much information. He had heard in his previous life about the theory of creating half-humans and half-dragons, which was just beginning to emerge in the form of experiments on humans. He was convinced of the reality of this, saw the details of the study. However, even in Tolkien, this information is classified. Jack Ballantyre turned to the director again and asked him to return to the contract. Rommel asked the young man what he wanted. Jack Ballantyre replied that he had a request, so now he has two requests. Since he has a lot of money, the first request is to buy him a house near the academy. Better with a garden. The director tried to object, saying that all students live in a dormitory. Jack asked him to ignore the conventions. He believes that it is possible to ignore one rule, given the help he provided. The director sighed and asked about the second request. Jack Ballantyre replied that he needed to take another student to the academy. Rommel protested and said that the second semester had already started and new students were only being accepted for the first. The young man made innocent eyes and noticed that after all, he was the headmaster of the academy. Rommel panted, then asked if he was talking about the girl who was sitting at the door of his office. The director also asked the young man to answer what kind of relationship they have with her. Jack said he was like a guardian to her. Reluctantly, the director had to agree to both of Jack Ballantyre's requests. As soon as Jack Ballantyre left the headmaster's office, a delighted Charlotte rushed up to him with her mentor in her arms. The young man sympathetically asked the girl how long she had waited. Charlotte asked her boss in disbelief, can she really study here now? He patted her head and said that she was an academy student starting today. Then he saw that the girl looked sad. He squatted down in front of her and asked her why she was so sad. Charlotte replied that she hadn't expected to be accepted at the academy at all. After all, the academy is only for selected people. But she's not even human, and he knows it. Jack said it didn't make any difference. Is she ashamed of being a vampire? Would she like to be human? Jack Ballantyre had no right to say that to the girl, but he felt very sorry for her. After all, she came from a family of aristocrats who ruled over all vampires. However, now her family is almost all killed. Her father was killed, and Charlotte was left with only her mother. But now there is no mother either. Jack Ballantyre looked the girl in the eye and ordered her to stop worrying about her background. No need to separate humans and vampires. Charlotte de Royal is her current name. He had to keep his promise, and she had to remember that he was responsible for her. If she wants to be queen, he will make her queen. If he asks her to restore her race, he will help her in this. If there are any problems, he will solve them. Therefore, she must not allow such thoughts to occur again. The girl thanked Jack, but said that, according to her mother, there is nothing free in the world. Jack Ballantyre agreed with this statement. Then the girl said that she had nothing to give him. The young man replied that so far, indeed, she had nothing, but one day he would ask her for a favor and she would have to fulfill it. Charlotte happily said that of course she would grant her boss every wish. She would help him. Jack suggested that the girl carry her things and then go for a walk. He recalled the events that had taken place in the academy headmaster's office a few minutes ago. After their request for Charlotte was made, the headmaster promised Jack that he would be able to get the girl into the academy today or tomorrow, and he also promised to arrange a house for him near the academy in two hours, but he noticed that it would be difficult to live alone in a large house, so he would send him a few people to help. The young man thanked him for his concern and concern. As the two young men strolled along, Jack Ballantyre suggested that perhaps the principal was using the people assigned to the house as an excuse to keep an eye on him. The mentor noticed that he said very correct words. In his views on racial differences, respect for the individual comes first. She thought he was a pompous fool, but he wasn't. When they reached the spot, they saw a young man practicing with a sword. They sat down on a bench and watched his actions. This guy looked to be about 17 years old. He was very tall. Jack decided to see how much mana he had. When he took a closer look, he even exclaimed in surprise. Is this really true? 
Jack Ballantyre watched the young man's training session with interest. He had the fourth round, and he had the same strength as with the second round. It looked cool, but in fact, it turned out to be completely different. He asked his mentor why she was interested in him. Valentine Milas snidely asked the young man if he was worried about her taking on a new student. The young man replied that he was actually interested in what she liked about this guy. She said that Jack could see the general characteristics well, but nothing else. He asked her if there was anything else he could do, maybe a physical form. Charlotte said that this guy has been studying for a very long time. It seems like he might lose consciousness at any second. She asked Jack to pay attention to the bruises on his body. His mentor asked him again if he still didn't understand what she was implying. Jack finally realized that one of the man's circles was broken. Milos agreed with him and said that it was difficult, almost impossible, to restore the destroyed circle. It's hardly anyone's doing. It was as if he had tried it himself. That's what she likes about him. She paused and said that she saw something else, but didn't want to talk about it anymore. Jack Ballantyre smiled enigmatically. He guessed what his mentor was talking about. It wasn't just his physical strength that caught her eye. The basis for any black magician is death and destruction, and endless revenge. The tenacity to rebuild the broken circle, the willpower to raise the sword again and again, despite the great wounds and the hatred hidden inside. Jack moved closer to the boy, feeling his eyes on him intently. He explained to the young man that it was also important to focus on your breathing and control the speed and strength of the blow. You don't need to strain your arm too much, it can lead to injuries. Jack Ballantyr advised the big man to work with moderate effort and gradually increase it. Besides, he's too focused on the broken circle. Wouldn't it be better to protect your heart first? Let him try to change the attitude to what is happening in his head. The big man surprised asked who he was. Jack replied that he was just a spectator and in turn asked the guy if he was not ashamed to be a weakling with such a physical form. The young man looked confused. Then Jack Ballantyre took a small bottle out of his pocket and handed it to the guy. Then he took a potion and asked Jack if it was an elixir. He replied that it was a top-level elixir with great flavor. The guy asked why he was giving it to him. The young man replied that he was doing it just like that, but he thought to himself that he could easily give away one elixir, because that idiot Gonzalez was quite rich. After that, Jack wanted to know the boy's name. He replied in confusion that his name was Thanos. Jack Ballantyre wished Thanos a successful training session and wanted to leave. However, the hero asked him to give his name. The young man introduced himself and said his name was Jack Ballantyre. After that, he said goodbye and expressed the hope that they might see each other again. The teacher grumbled that only he could talk so badly. Charlotte, on the other hand, admired her boss. She said he was really cool. When the two young men and the mentor were out of sight, Thanos remembered where he had heard that name, Jack Ballantyre. This is an imbecile, a stupid brat, the son of a Marquis who can only eat and breathe. I think that's the kind of rumor that goes around about Jack Ballantyre and at the beginning of studying at the academy, he had no equal in academic performance. Thanos couldn't understand it. In the first semester, he had units in all subjects. The young man thought, maybe it's not him. Some time later, Jack Ballantyre, Charlotte de Royal, and Valentine Milos found themselves in a posh estate near the academy. This manor was built especially for the Duke's guests. The headmaster's servant approached them and said that if they needed anything, they could inform their servants. Jack noticed this man, whose name was John Doe, the same name of a man who was famous for his cruelty. However, Jack Ballantyre stopped thinking about it and said that the Duke's estate was on a completely different level. It's a house for aristocrats, but it feels like it wants to interfere with the inheritance of the title in the Ballantyre family. Is it so? John Doe replied that his personal feelings were not important at all. He does what the master commands. Jack remarked indifferently, of course, because he was just a servant. But is that polite? After all, he hides his true identity. I wonder if the director knows about this. Then there's the strange hood that covers his face. Why is he getting so many assholes lately?
As far as he knows, there are very few holders of the ninth circles in the kingdom, and apparently he is very lucky, since such people come across him at every turn. Jack Ballantyre asked John Doe if he was a spy too. The man who called himself John Doe laughed and asked Jack how he knew that. After all, he even stopped the flow of mana in his body. He admitted that the director's request to look after him surprised him. He was actually the master of the Teslin Bellamy Craig Empire Tower. Jack remembered that during the Teslin Tolkien War in his previous life, he was the one who stayed by the headmaster's side until the end. Craig turned back to Jack Ballantyre and asked him how he knew he was a polymorph. The young man replied that he would not have guessed it before, but only recently he had killed one polymorph. Bellamy Craig made an aggrieved face and said that he was the owner of the tower and a teacher of the magic department, and he was just a student for now, so let's be more polite. Jack told him that then he should have given his name right away. Or does he prefer to make fun of people and then demand respect for himself? Doesn't he have the right to do so today, at least? Wasn't he the one who revealed his real identity? Bellamy Craig conciliatingly said that he was right. He should have introduced himself right away. After that, he offered the young man to learn magic personally from him. Jack Ballantyre replied that he already had a mentor. Bellamy Craig suggested that it was Elizabeth and agreed that she had excellent abilities. He even wanted to make her his disciple, but she also refused. However, he's not going to give up so easily this time. He urges him to become his disciple. Jack had to tell her again that he already had a mentor. Craig did not let up and offered himself as a tutor. Jack Ballantyre asked him, does the magic tower allow this? Milos suddenly turned to Bellamy and asked him his name. Craig, looking at the toy perched on Jack's shoulder in surprise, asked if it could really talk. Jack introduced Teslin Bellamy Tower's owner Craig to his mentor. She said that this person could easily reach the tenth circle. In the past, when he wanted to get it, someone attacked him. Craig wondered how she knew that. The mentor replied that the shape of the tenth circle was still inside it. She can see the remains of it clearly. Bellamy Craig suggested that apparently everyone with a broken mana heart has the remnants of the circle. Valentine agreed that Bellamy had a theory. She advised him to study. It is difficult to develop further at this age, but he has already tried to do this, which means that his chance is higher. You just need to try, at least not for your own sake, but for the sake of your tower and those who are in it. He has to show his best side. Bellamy Craig asked her what her mentor's name was. She said he didn't want to know. Jack told her to go, because Charlotte was already waiting for them. Then he turned to Bellamy Craig and asked him to tell the headmaster that he would come to see him on the first day of school. Valentine reflected ruefully that she sometimes felt sorry for people. Some people don't have the talent, but they try hard to the end, and some people have the talent, but they don't want to develop it and just sit around doing nothing. Jack asked his mentor, then why didn't she tell him anything? This is very disappointing. The mentor asked, is there anything? He had used Dark Liberation on Gonzalez, so she had nothing else to teach him. Indeed, Dark Liberation was the last technique his mentor had taught him. Even the owner of the tower came to watch him, but let him watch as much as he needs. A young servant of the tower master asked Bellamy Craig what he was thinking. Bellamy wanted to know what she thought about it. The girl assumed that the director had said something to him. The owner of the tower replied that it was only natural. The servant asked a new question, is it true that he will listen to the words of that boy? Bellamy Craig, answering in the affirmative, added that this guy is good at making deals. A short time later, Bellamy Craig was sitting in the headmaster's office, hands folded under his chin in thought. Rommel asked him if he liked Jack Ballantyre. Craig replied that he didn't dislike him, but that he was too good for his age, even though he only had the second round at most. How did he manage to defeat a sixth circle mage? The master of the magic tower assumed that this person was very dangerous. The headmaster sighed, setting down his cup of tea, and asked Craig if that was all, all he understood. He expressed bewilderment, and the director with a mysterious note in his voice said that this guy brought a girl with him and said that now they will attend classes together at the academy. Bellamy Craig was genuinely surprised and asked Rommel why he trusted him so much.
The old man took another sit from his teacup and said that Jack Ballantyr might cause a war with the Teslin Empire. He needs to hurry. Over time, it will become clear exactly where it will lead them. Bellamy Magic Tower Master Craig agreed with the headmaster's words, but he still expressed his concern about the young man's problem. However, if the director thinks so, then he agrees with him. Then he decided to add one last thing. Craig said that he didn't want the headmaster to get involved in the Marquis House's feuds. Rommel asked Bellamy if the Ballantyre family hadn't already chosen an heir. Bellamy replied that he knew the Ballantyre hairs very well. The first is Elizabeth. She can become a master, but this idiot uses her in his political games. The second has a third round at the age of 17. Their academy is full of them. He's not particularly smart, and he's never seen anyone waste their life like this before. The director asked suspiciously, what is it leading to? The owner of the tower replied that the headmaster was already old, and he asked him not to get involved in politics and give up the title of Duke. Why would he want to get involved in such a complicated matter? Then he said that for skipping classes, Jack Ballantyre could have been sent to single rooms in the dorm, but the headmaster gave him a house outside the academy. This is very similar to favoritism. I'm sure there will be rumors spreading around the city. The director smiled and told Craig that they had known each other for more than 30 years, and he understood what Craig was going through. But he's really old, and he has a hunch that something important might be missing out on this guy. Soon his house will be ready. Bellamy Craig can go there and check it out in person. The master of the Teslin Empire Tower nodded in agreement and thought that this guy was giving you goosebumps. He knew exactly what the director meant. The servant of the tower master asked him why he was smiling. Craig replied that everyone was entitled to a smile. At the house, Jack Ballantyre was informed that in addition to the maids, there was one cook and five guards. The young man expressed the hope that they will work hard, and he will also help them. First of all, he loves steaks. He always needs a full breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Vegetables must be used fresh, without magic, and everything should be on the same level. Jack added that he likes strawberry and tomato juices and needs them every day. The servants swore that they would do their best, and then the boy thought that since they were already here, he should make the most of them. Then he turned his attention to the cook, whose name was Guinness. He looked like a complete idiot, and Jack didn't think he'd be much use. He looked at his employees and wondered if he could remember all their names. He decided that he would call them the Five Musketeers. Maybe they weren't all murderers or informers raised by the old man. Apparently, just like that guy, they also have broken mana hearts. Jack Ballantyre told them that it was possible to make a new circle at the academy after it was destroyed, not perfect, but still. One of the servants bought into the young man's words and requested that Jack ask the headmaster to do so. He smiled and said that maybe he would do it if they worked well. At that moment, Charla came running into the room and enthusiastically told him that the house was very spacious and she really liked it. Jack Ballantyre smiled at her and told her that they were going to explore their mansions together. Jack Ballantyre was in high spirits. Lying on the plush four-poster bed, he idly pondered. The headmaster gave him the house on the 9th of August. Studies at the academy begin on the 16th, and today is the 14th. These five days have gone just fine. He and Charlotte bought clothes, saw the city, ate great local food, and enjoyed a performance at the local theater. It was a lot of fun, except for two things, and it was a great time. The first moment occurred a few days ago at noon. Perhaps it was his belligerent attitude. Not only is he not very good at mana, but he's also too weak physically, so Jack decided to do regular runs. This time, Charla expressed a desire to run with him. He agreed and asked her to hurry up, or he would run without her. After they ran a few kilometers, they sat down to rest. Charlotte asked Jack if they were going to see that guy again tonight. The young man laughed and answered in the affirmative, the second point. That guy showed up at the same place every day for sword practice. Jack had been looking at him for five days straight, and he was trying very hard. Although this guy had no talent, but even with such tenacity, he could become the first in the academy. Jack Ballantyre wondered why he was so interested in him. He had always preferred women, and his interest in this young man was on a completely different plane.
Jack noticed the man's injuries. Why are there more and more of them every day? He asked him directly about this. Thanos unfriendlyly asked his master why he needed to know. Jack Ballantyre suggested that apparently he never took the elixir he gave him last time. Thanos said that this elixir is worth 40 gold pieces. Jack agreed and asked the guy, so what? Thanos replied that he would definitely pay him back, and the young man thought worriedly, why didn't this guy drink the elixir? After all, his injuries are serious. I'm sure he's got a few broken bones. My legs are also damaged. Just a little more, and he won't be able to move them. After taking a short break, Thanos continued his training. Jack Ballantyr thought that this man was working out despite being in extreme pain. Every day for almost a week. For an ordinary person, this is simply impossible. Does he spend all his days like this? Why do people like him always get so little out of life? His mentor, who was sitting silently next to the student, ironically remarked, whose cow would low and his silent. Jack asked her if she liked this Thanos guy. The necromancer replied that he was quite cute, and she felt a little sorry for him. As her disciple, he should also know how much hatred and greed overwhelmed him. It may seem that they are leading him forward. However, the opposite is true. If you don't know how to control them, they will lead to a complete collapse. It's growing, of course, but it's also regressing. Don't you feel sorry for him? Jack Ballantyre has already seen enough of this guy, and it's time to decide whether to take him with you or not. Thanos has no talent. The young man turned to him and asked why he was raising his sword. Wiping the sweat from his brow, he said that he really wanted to become the continent's best swordsman. Jack laughed and Thanos said seriously that he could laugh all he wanted at his dream. Jack Ballantyre replied that he wasn't laughing at a dream. He couldn't understand how great the greed in his heart was, but now he understood. He went up to the knight and asked him if he was ready to be his new chicken. Charla was in a hurry. She was carrying water to Thanos and Jack Ballantyre, rightly assuming that they must be thirsty. Jack repeated his question again, and Thanos told him if he thought he was a chicken. Jack confirmed his guess and asked the young man if he would be his chicken. Thanos put his head in his hands and said that he didn't understand what was being said and that he didn't think it was a good thing. Jack thought the guy was pretty smart. Then he suggested that he become a dependent instead of chicken. Thanos thought for a moment, then asked, Does the word dependent mean something like a vassal? He's a commoner. He has nothing. I don't even have any money. He's heard about the Ballantyre family, and he doesn't look like the person from those rumors at all. Jack realized that Thanos must have heard something about him at the academy. The guy kept saying that not only did he have no money, but also no talent, and the young master had better find someone more worthy of him. He doesn't think he can be of any use to him. Jack Ballantyre looked Thanos in the eye and said that he wanted to be the best swordsman on the continent. How could he not use such a warrior? Or is he not sure that he can achieve this goal? Thanos repeated that he had no talent. Jack corrected him and said he knew some things and didn't. He has something better, a talent for mana. There are already a lot of mana holders. Even farmers have a talent for mana, but they can't develop it properly, so they die without ever realizing what they kept inside of them. He, Jack Ballantyr, also has a talent for mana, and he didn't know about it until he met his mentor. The world he sees is not the same as others see it. With his own eyes, he could see the mana hovering around and surrounding his body. But as a child, he didn't know what it meant, so he couldn't develop properly. No need to be frivolous in this matter. Everything is very complicated. He has suffering. And there are not so many people who are ready to go to the end for the sake of their goal. And it's true. No need to doubt yourself. Of all the people he's ever met, he thinks Thanos is the one who's going to make it. At that moment, three students approached them. One of them turned to Thanos and asked him, pointing at Jack, if he had a homeless boyfriend. Jack Ballantyre reflected that the semester hadn't started yet, and he hadn't expected to meet anyone else at the academy. He thought with regret that he would have to deal with them for the sake of peace in the house. Aloud, he said that he had to go. However, the impudent student did not lag behind and called Thanos a deaf idiot. After all, he had told him not to behave badly with the others. He also called the guy a dirty commoner who ignored his words.
Apparently, he didn't get enough. Thanos turned to Jack Ballantyr and said that these people had come to him and he had to leave. The young master guessed that all the terrible wounds inflicted on Thanos were the work of these three. The leader of the trio continued to mock. He guessed that the elixir that Thanos had had was given to him by Jack. He wondered how he knew about the elixir. Did they take him? Thanos looked at Jack and said that he would pay him back for it. Jack Ballantyr asked him if they had taken his present. Why does he allow the wretched scum of society to behave like this to him? The leader of the trio was outraged by Jack Ballantyr's words. Did he call them trash? He suggested that he leave immediately, so as not to get hurt along with Thanos. Jack apologized and said he wasn't going to leave. They've taken his elixir, so we'll have to deal with them. He gave his two accomplices five seconds to escape while they still had a chance. The leader laughed and said they were with him. Jack Ballantyr nodded in satisfaction and said it was their business and he would have to help them get out of here. We should show them not to touch the future best swordsmen of the continent. There are five Marquises in the Teslin Empire. They are real aristocrats with lands, not those who got the title for achievements and magic circles. Of the five Marquises, Marquis Herman lives in the East. His family has one problem child, the future young master, Dietrich Herman, who will soon graduate from the academy. It all started with the murder of a maid at the age of 13. He'd been addicted to drugs since he was 14, and to women of questionable parentage since he was 15. It was rumored that he not only uses, but also sells substances. The future of the Herman family was predetermined, because Dietrich is the eldest son. However, at the academy, he was not allowed such liberties. Here the offspring of the emperor and duke study. Too many eyes are watching all the action, so he had to create toys for himself. More precisely, find them. A commoner, a student who ended up in the academy for some unknown reason. It was Thanos. Dietrich and his friends were constantly beating him up. One day, when they were making fun of him as usual, kicking his body, they found a bottle of elixir in his possession. The hooligans were surprised. Where did a filth like Thanos come from with such an expensive elixir? They had taught him a lesson for his impudence. Jack Ballantyr was determined to teach Dietrich Herman and his team a lesson now. He immediately knocked out Dietrich and dealt with his cronies. Charlotte, watching the fight, noticed that the boss was once again behaving as he had in her house. The mentor said that she was not at all surprised by this. The bandits were lying at his feet, and Jack felt that he was beginning to stretch a little. Then he asked them if they were all so tired that they couldn't get to their feet. Dietrich, crawling on the ground, whispered angrily and asked how he dared to touch him. Jack asked him if his idiotic servants weren't going to interfere even now. Young Master Herman promised to contact his father immediately. However, Jack Ballantyr kicked him twice in the head and saw out of the corner of his eye two shadows, rushed towards him from around the corner, shouting at him to stop. Dietrich asked the young man if he understood who he was contacting. Jack expressed doubts that it was important and finally knocked Herman out. Then he turned to the servants and gave them three seconds to explain why they allowed Thanos to be beaten up. Jack Ballantyr noticed the bright red mana that was mixing with the dark black darkness. He knew it was a spell. Primal Blast is the best magic for the sixth circle. Long range explosion magic. Exploited. He wants to destroy Thanos, this playground, the little one, and the mentor. Jack, looking at these stupid servants, thought what idiots they were. Jack Ballantyr concentrated all the mana in his hand, clenching his fist, and then put all the strength and energy of it into a great punch. One of the servants tried to hit him with his right hand, but the young man easily parried it and seemed to break his arm. He turned to the bandit and said, apparently, he has a headache, so he's not thinking straight. After that, he grabbed it by the neck and turned its head around until it cracked. Jack thought about the fact that his mana was now blocked in his body. It is unlikely that he will be able to restore it. That bastard could have blown up the entire academy. Crawling at Jack's feet, the man asked him how he was able to remove his magic. The young man told him that there was no need to know. After that, he wanted to ask him why they were bullying Thanos. He offered to explain. 
Although there is no point in listening to their explanations, because for them Thanos is just a toy, because he is a commoner. He won't even be able to complain about them. Jack Ballantyre sighed heavily and suggested a simple start. They must first pay him back for the elixir. The person lying at his feet whispered angrily, Is the elixir so important when it has become the enemy of the Herman family? The young man replied that he did not care about his family, but the elixir was his property. And it was worth 40 gold pieces, and since they took it away five days ago, they now owe him 5,000 gold pieces. He urged the man to pray that the others would have the money, since he didn't have it. Then he turned to Dietrich Herman and asked him to relax, because he wasn't going to hit him again. He just has to give it his all. Young Master Herman had $2,000 in cash and 60 gold coins on him. Jack leaned in and told Herman that he was lucky. If they had no money at all, they would definitely be finished. Dietrich asked him who he was. He had never seen him in the academy. The young gentleman introduced himself and said his name was Jack Ballantyr. Everyone already knows about him like he's a celebrity. Dietrich squeaked, how is this possible? Was he Palon's younger brother? Jack thought indifferently that his older brother had disgusting friends. Now it would be even more pleasant for him to mock them. He told Herman that he didn't touch ordinary kids, but people like them were an exception. After that, he kicked Dietrich in the teeth with his shoe and said that they only had the family name, and without it, they were nobody. Dietrich asked, grimacing in pain, didn't he use the mana of higher level magic holders to transfer it into himself? The young man replied that he could do nothing there but mock those who meant nothing. He told young Master Herman that he and his friends were very lucky. When they turned 20, he would definitely dump their corpses in the lake behind the academy. He reminded him that his name was Jack and that he lived in a mansion near the academy. If he wanted to take revenge on him, he would wait for him there. But next time, it won't stop. Then he turned to Charlotte and asked her to come with him. He also reminded Thanos of his offer. He said it was still valid and he could come to his house. They have a very good cook and he can eat meat every day and he's going to the fireworks festival tonight. Magic of exploding in the sky, fun, and all that stuff. He doesn't have anything to do anyway, so he goes to see it. In the province of Double, a fireworks festival is always held two or three days before the start of the seminar. This is a great opportunity to welcome new students and transfer students. Even though Jack Ballantyr had seen some disgusting things today, it wasn't usually that bad at the academy. Most of the cream of the empire came from here. The emperor, the two dukes, the emperor's wife, and the princesses are all graduates of the academy. Usually, graduation from the academy guarantees a successful job placement, and if you create problems, the exception will not keep you waiting. Jack wondered if it was four years or five years. In the past, during this time, the name of the Teslin Empire was erased from the face of the earth. Jack Ballantyre was sitting at an open-air table with Charlotte, eating delicious food. Suddenly, Valentine Milos, who was also there, said it was terrible. When the young man asked her what she meant, the mentor replied that she was talking about what happened today. She was talking about the attack on Thanos. She expressed bewilderment as to why security is needed at all, if it allows such behavior of some students. It wasn't that she didn't expect this, but she was upset because she was once one of the founders of this academy, and according to the first paragraph of the first article of the social law on behavior on the territory of the academy, all students are equal. There is also a group of inspectors who regulate the internal discipline of students. The second paragraph of the first article states that everyone should be neutral about their political views. Jack said that such attitudes would really be useful but ideologies are distorted over time, and the norm is set by those who have time to settle in. His mentor winked at him and told him that she had hidden something, however. To the boy's surprised look, Mila said that she was talking about dragon blood, dragon bone, and the Tukin Empire. Jack said he could talk about it, but it would take a long time. The mentor replied that this should not be done. Just then, the night sky lit up with thousands of fireworks. The celebration has begun. The three of them went out onto the balcony, which had a beautiful view, and the young man happily said that he had not lived in such a world for a long time. After a while, Charlotte asked Jack how he was able to fight so well. 
The girl asked if that meant he had killed a lot of people. Jack Ballantyre nodded his head and said a lot. Charlotte asked the question again. She asked if it was true that he came from the future. The young man took a glass of tomato juice and replied that to be more precise, he had gone back 20 years. I think he talked to Ron about it. He said at the time that he died by accident. Jack looked into Charlotte's eyes and asked her if she wanted to know the truth. It was the first time he had ever seen her in this life. I've been to that city often enough, but I've never seen her. To be more precise, he only met vampires in the monster forest. He asked the girl if she understood what he was talking about. When Vivian died, Philactus told him that he had come to kill Charlotte. So the Charlotte from her previous life had died when she was only 10 years old. Then Jack asked the girl why she was interested. He asked her to tell him what had happened. Charlotte blushed and said that she also wanted to fight well. Just like the boss, the young man replied that he knew the feeling. A painful past and a heart that wants to change something. He smiled cheerfully and told her that then they would start training with her from tomorrow. Charlotte was both delighted and surprised. Jack asked her why she was so surprised, didn't she want to learn? They would definitely start tomorrow, and he would make her a man of heart, and then they would see how she managed it. The girl thanked her boss and stared up at the sky in awe, at the scattering of magnificent fireworks. Jack Ballantyre sighed and whispered that he could imagine what was coming next. In the Herman's house, young Herr Dietrich was raging in his room, and the servants couldn't calm him down. The young man smashed furniture and swore. The subject of such irritation and anger was Jack Ballantyre, who incredibly humiliated him. Even if it was only for a second, he was very intimidating that day. Why did this happen? He even wet himself in front of everyone. His hatred for this man was incredible. No one had ever humiliated him so much in his life. Dietrich decided that he must do to this Ballantyre what he had done to him. It was already the second day of the semester. Jack and Charlotte were on their way home from school. Many non-resident students have already arrived. Jack Ballantyr really wanted to see Ron because his steaks are so delicious. Suddenly, he felt himself trembling. He felt dizzy. Charlotte knew the reason for this dizziness because the red sauce that Jack used was her blood. At the gate of the house where they lived, the young people saw Thanos. Jack Ballantyre asked the young man what he was doing here. Thanos got awkwardly to his feet and asked Jack for a favor. A minute later, they were sitting at an ornate table inside the house, and Jack Ballantyre told Thanos in a masterly way that there was nothing fancy here, but he could take whatever he wanted. The young master suggested that he start eating, and then they would pick out a room for him. Thanos nodded gratefully to Jack and sat down at the table, enjoying the warmth and hospitality. Suddenly Jack noticed tears in the hero's eyes. He turned to Guinness and pointed out to him that he had put too many bows this time, because it made the young knight's eyes water. He advised the cook to improve next time. After lunch, Jack Ballantyre asked Thanos how he was feeling. Is he feeling better now? He apologized for his behavior, but Jack stopped him and told him that everything happens in life. He understands it perfectly. Thanos was surprised and asked the young master if he wasn't going to ask him about the reasons for his behavior at the table. The young man replied that he was a little interested, but he might have his own secrets and didn't want to push him. Privately, Jack thought it might earn his loyalty. Then he wondered why his mentor was looking at him so intently. The necromancer looked sadly at her disciple, who suddenly tried to act like a hero. Jack Ballantyre, meanwhile, asked Thanos if he was aware that he wasn't required to attend classes at the academy. He can just stay here in the house. Now he has his own room, and if he is hungry, he can go to cook Guinness. Then he pointed to the five people who were sitting in the garden and in the summer house, and told the knight that he could call those five so, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. They're looking out for him, so it's best to make friends with them. Thanos asked the young master, isn't this the Marcus's manor? Jack Ballantyre replied that it was originally the Duke of Ramble's guest house, and now this house is a gift that he received from the old man. The hero thanked Jack for explaining everything to him. After that, Thanos picked up the sword and expressed a desire to practice, because if he missed even one day, he would become weaker.
Jack, sitting in a cozy gazebo with a cup of fragrant tea in his hands, surrounded by lush greenery, was deep in thought. He watched Thanos train with such zeal and dedication that it just amazed him. Raising his cup of tea to his lips, Jack smiled contentedly. He believed that Thanos was ready for any challenges and challenges. At this time, he was called out by Charlotte, who was ready to start the first lesson that the young master had promised her. Jack Ballantyre happily agreed and told her that they would start by creating a mana circle. The young vampire lay exhausted on the ground not far from the manor. It was late afternoon and Charlotte complained to Jack Ballantyre that she couldn't move anymore. The young master praised her for how hard she had tried today. The girl turned to the boss and asked him, so now she knows how to use mana. The young master praised her and said that she could do it now. He knew it, of course, but this girl was really amazing. She makes excellent use of mana, which is at a high level. It's like she's been practicing with it for a long time. In 10 hours, being able to create the first mana circle is a good result. He looked at the exhausted girl at the end and informed her that the training session was over for the day. The girl barely made it to the bench in the courtyard of the manor, sat down on it in impotence, declaring that she was really very tired. Night fell. The mentor asked Jack Ballantyr if he was going to tell her everything. Create a circle in 10 hours. Usually for beginners, it takes two to three days. Milos didn't understand Jack at all. He thought that if he were Thanos, he would immediately ask for Charlotte as an apprentice. Jack Ballantyre noted that without his help, it would have taken her at least one day. This magic circle draws mana from the air. You can use it to collect mana and use it to create a barrier. After collecting the mana inside it, he simply passes it to Charlotte. It's easier this way, but it won't work for everyone. So she's still a good girl since she was able to create such a clean circle in so many years. His mentor asked him if he wanted anything in return for his help. When Jack returned to the manor, he noticed that Thanos was crying again. The young master asked him, does he feel that he has already reached the limit? The hero sadly replied that this was true. Jack Ballantyre asked him if he was going to give up. The little one was able to complete one lap in just 10 hours. Is he jealous of her? It probably is. Hoping she doesn't seem to have a talent for swordsmanship. The big guy answered with a question to the question. Did he think that it was so easy to become the best knight of the continent? He hates himself so much at times like this. Thanos then fell to his knees and sobbed. Jack wondered how anyone could be such a sucker. He asked him if he was giving up. The continent's best knight is going to give up on girls. Jack put his hand on Thanos' head and told him with confidence that he could still fulfill his dream. But it won't be easy. He can't give up. He needs to keep trying. Thanos looked hopefully into his master's eyes and asked, does he really believe in his dream of becoming the best knight on the continent? This dream of his was never taken seriously by anyone. Everyone laughed at him for being so stupid. I thought about how it used to be like that in his family too. Thanos then thanked his master for believing in him. Jacka again advised the knight to try harder. All his experience shows later that only skills never betray. The young master thought that he was the best knight on the continent so far, but how could he refuse this small child the body of a big man? He told Thanos that he would try to help him too. At that moment, he felt something. Jack wondered uneasily who it might be at this time. Jack Ballantyre had a familiar feeling, a menacing energy present nearby. Her strength was considerable, and her intentions were deadly, and he didn't like it anymore. He informed Thanos that he had an uninvited guest. Jack Ballantyre ordered the knight to immediately take the baby and go to him. After Thanos rushed to do his bidding, the young master turned in the dark and said that he had certainly invited Dietrich to his death, but he didn't think he would actually come. Where is he? Jack walked across the terrace. There he found five guards who were breathing but not moving. They remained unconscious. At this time, Thanos returned with Charlotte in his arms. Her mentor also arrived, and Charlotte rubbed her eyes and told her boss to go to dinner. She probably didn't take the situation seriously. Behind the house, they saw Dietrich Herman with a band of warriors. This young master said that they haven't seen each other for a long time. Jack Ballantyre said with annoyance that he had warned him earlier about the consequences and now let him not be offended. 
A few hours earlier, the future Marcus had proudly told his men that his name was Dietrich Hermann. He is the future Marcus of the great eastern province. The world is ruled by power, and the power of his family will soon be his, so why leave the annoying Jack Ballantyre alive? Of course, there may be problems with Duke Ship, but it was Jack who struck first, and there are witnesses to that. This will be the reason for the second skirmish between their families. With him is the Fentanyl Guildmaster, Bedman. No matter how strong that Jackus Jack Ballantyre is, he can't beat a master with a knight's circle. He smiled broadly and said that he had explained the matter. Their target is Jack Ballantyre. Just him. Where is the target now? On a vacant lot near the mansion with a girl named Charlotte, who was specially admitted to the academy yesterday, and Thanos, a fourth-year student. What else do you need to know? His spies reported that Charlotte was making a man a heart. They've been there for nine hours, and they'll be there for a while longer. No matter how talented she was, it would take at least two days for her mana to reach her heart. His staff consists of a cook and five servants. The bandits reported to Dietrich that they had checked their location, and when the master ordered, they would kill them all. But it's best to avoid running into the Fall family for as long as possible. Dietrich asked, what is the probability of mobilizing the Knights of Omble? He was told that it was not there, because before they arrived, a fire started in the basement of the Duke's estate. Everyone is busy fighting and will not be able to allocate a squad to remove them. Everything worked out perfectly. His team was ready. It was time to advance. Their target is Jack Ballantyr, and they start the mission. And so it was. A special order for 500,000 gold pieces. Satisfied, Dietrich told Jack that he was finished. Thanos bravely offered to help his master. He advised them to hide while he detained them. He added that he was very grateful to him for believing in him. It's his fault, so Jack doesn't need to get involved. He would definitely delay them so that they could escape. Chiralta also expressed a desire to take the first blow. Jack Ballantyre was grateful that these two men had volunteered to protect him. He thought they were cute fools, but where else would he find them? It's actually a nice feeling. He turned to his friends and told them not to worry about him, but to stand behind him. Dietrich Hermann said that if he wanted to die so badly, there was nothing he could do. If that's the case, we'll have to kill them all. At this time, the mentor stopped Jack. The young man asked her, does she really want to remove these bastards herself? Dietrich was surprised that a simple toy could move and talk. Suddenly, an incredible storm broke out before the eyes of the enemy. The bandits couldn't see anything in front of them and didn't understand what was going on. As the storm gradually subsided, the bandits saw that the little toy had turned into a human. Thanos was surprised to recognize her as the great heroine who in the past was able to raise this continent and all of humanity to the top level of the pyramid. Dietrich Hermann was also surprised. The toy became a person. This heroine is back after a 400-year hiatus. Jack Ballantyre uttered words of joy when he saw this transformation. He told her that he had always been waiting for her, another mentor. Unexpectedly, he received a slap on the cheek from her and asked her why she did it. She said that she did this so that he would remember how he ignored her opinion and forcibly dragged her out of the cave after waking up. He didn't care what she said or what she thought. He thought that she was always so beautiful. He missed her very much. The mentor said that this is his punishment for bad behavior. Jack agreed with her and turned to Dietrich, ordering him to give him his coat. After he did this, the young man threw the coat over his mentor's shoulders, noticing that it was very cold right now. Then he turned to his mentor and told her that he didn't regret dragging her out of the cave at all. He had to do it his own way, but everything turned out as well as possible. Valentine asked him if she wanted to die peacefully in that place. Jack Ballantyre replied that he knew that she didn't want to do this because he was her student. The mentor said that maybe she was wrong. After all, humans are not animals that go along with their desires. She thought that the world created by humans would be different from all other worlds. But she was wrong. There is no difference between humans and other races. So he pulled her out that day because she'd subconsciously wanted to. Jack agreed with her and said that he was aware that his mentor had made no wrong choices in the past, but by trusting someone he shouldn't have, 
He'd never been able to fully see what she'd been trying to achieve for so long. The mentor went on to say that this cave eventually became a prison that she had created for herself. It seems that she is now in debt to her disciple. Then she turned to Dietrich Herman and his team. She said that since they had come to eliminate her disciple, let them hate her when there was nothing left of them. Dietrich ordered his men to kill them all now. The preceptor calmly said that the black tar that would cover the earth and cover the sky would return to this world at her command. The vacant lot at the manor was painted black and purple. The sky was blazing with a brown dawn. And somewhere in the Tulpan Empire, in a magnificent palace, a master, after drinking a sip of good wine from a thin glass, suddenly felt a strange indisposition. Those present asked Mr. Beggerman what was wrong with him. He caught his breath and said he was fine. It seems that he already had the same unpleasant feeling recently. On one of the islands in the Black Sea, where magical beasts live, the demoness said with annoyance that there can be no doubt. Past soul energy and present energy obviously belong to Valentine Milos. The black dragon replied that there was still a hole in his heart left by that woman. I wish I could forget her, but I can't. Maybe because she's still alive. The demoness objected and said that a person couldn't live for 400 years. How much longer would this woman rule their world? At this time, serious events were taking place in the vacant lot behind the house where Jack Ballantyre lived. An eerie black energy formed in the air. A skeletal figure in a long cloak and a hood over a bare skull kept appearing in the dirty, dead-colored light. Dietrich Herman and his soldiers felt an incredible fear. They had never seen anything like it in their lives. A terrible sight suddenly broke out. The people around them began to experience something unimaginable. Their legs and arms began to crumble like dust. The bones that had once been the skeleton of their bodies were reduced to fine dust. Dietrich was also among those who suffered this terrible fate. He stared at his hand, which was already beginning to disintegrate into tiny particles, slowly disappearing. A sense of helplessness and terror gripped him. He suddenly realized that this might be the end of his life. The sight was so grim and terrifying that Dietrich wondered if this was how he was going to die. He could feel the mysterious magic of the necromancer enveloping him, destroying his essence, and he couldn't do anything to stop it. He began to cry and said that he would give money just to stay alive. He offered fifty gold pieces, then hundred. He was begging for mercy. After all that had happened, Valentine Milos put her hands on Charlotte's head and on Thanos' shoulder. Looking at them, she slowly said that Charlotte de Royal, who inherited the noble blood of her ancestors and Thanos, a warrior who moves forward, do not give in to anger and your desires. Her name is Valentine Milos. She's the mentor of that stupid student from before. She hopes that they will take care of him. Thanos turned to the necromancer and noticed that she had said everything correctly, except for one thing. Jack Ballantyre isn't stupid. Milos nodded and said she was wrong. He was right this time. Then she asked to be left alone with her student because she needed to talk to him. Before Charlotte left, Jack told her that if she was hungry, there was his blood in the kitchen that she could drink before going to bed, and he asked Thanos to find the unconscious servants, wake them up, and go to bed too. Then he turned to his mentor and asked her if they were loyal and good guys, weren't they? They're really fun to play with. Then he asked her what she wanted to talk to her smart student about. When the immortal necromancer Valentine Milos was left alone with her apprentice Jack Ballantyre, she told him that she had seriously thought about it. The young master asked the teacher what she was seriously thinking. Milos was surprised and asked him if he had forgotten what he had said about the dragon's blood and bones about immortality. It is natural for a person to want to live forever and never grow old. It was the heterogeneous system that became a continuation of the study of immortality. Does this mean that the dragon's blood and bones are related to this? Jack Ballantyre nodded in agreement and said that was correct. All people want to live long, but of course, this is not enough. I want to live long and at the same time be healthy and young. During the study of immortality, which was conducted in the distant past, one of the scientists expressed an interesting opinion. It's impossible to live forever, so why not just start living like dragons for thousands of years? Races that lived many centuries ago, such as vampires and dragons, are different from species that have short-lived blood, organs, and even bones.
The rate of body aging, the number and quality of cells, sensitivity to mana intake. After that, the experiment became an intraspecific communication experiment. Heterogeneous mating was only half successful. It was a complete failure on the path to eternal life, but people were able to use the power of orcs and elves. But there was still one problem. After receiving the power, you only have 5 to 10 years to live. However, an experiment conducted more than 400 years ago is now being conducted in the Tolkien Empire. In two years, she would complete it, and the Half-Blood's lifespan would increase to 30 years. She thought she killed them all 400 years ago, but apparently that wasn't the case. Valentine found out about this experiment too late, so she burned all the documents related to it and killed all the Half-Blood monsters that were created. Scientists, magicians, knights, and so on, she destroyed all the documents, killed everyone connected with the experiment, but missed one point. Jack Ballantyre suggested that the mentor should have killed the Dragon Lords. Milos nodded and said thoughtfully that the Dragon Lords had most likely passed on their own as test subjects. The two lords are very keen to enter the human world. The young master asked the mentor if she knew who exactly became the test material. The necromancer replied that she did not know. Jack Ballantyre sighed and told her that she didn't need to explain for long that these future half-breeds could use soul energy, just like he was with her. Valentine Milos concluded that the dragon that became the experimental material was the child of two lords. Jack nodded and said that among the existing dragons, only these two lords can use soul energy, and of course their hair also has a talent for it. A heterogeneous combination of the owners of the Tenth Circle of the Tolkien Empire and the child of two dragon lords. With their talents, they can easily break through the mana wall and use soul energy. The teacher looked her student in the eye and said that she had a question for him. She asked him what he was aiming for. He couldn't understand what she was talking about. Mila said that she was a person from the distant past. She doesn't want to be connected to the world, but she can't stop being interested in it. If he knows about the future, then he must have something on his mind. That's what interests her. Jack Ballantyre shrugged and said he didn't know. In any case, the experiment will be completed in two years. In a year, he will grow to the fifth or sixth circle and plans to go to the Tolkien Empire during the holidays. And of course, they will have to destroy all the laboratories and kill everyone associated with this experiment. Just then, Thanos was reviving the servants and moving them into the house. The mentor didn't seem surprised, but she asked Jack Ballantyr if it was true that he was planning to go with her to the Tolkien Empire on vacation and blow up the lab with all those associated with it. Do you have to wait for the holidays? The young master looked at Valentine in surprise and said that she only said recently that she wouldn't interfere in the world's affairs. The necromancer replied that it was up to her to make sure everything was finished, so she thinks it's only right for her to step in this time. Jack Ballantyr thought worriedly, which meant that his mentor wanted to go to the Tolkien Empire right now, and he couldn't even stop her, since she was his mentor. And she's right, for the Tolkien Empire, blowing up the lab will be a huge problem. To be more precise, for radicals who want to unite the continent. The reason is that the radicals are experimenting with race relations. Now she does not remember the resentment from the past, which forever remained only with him. In fact, if you think about it now, they'd really annoy him. Jack asked Milos if she could open up another space. He explained his question by saying that he needed one sword. Very good. The immortal necromancer was surprised that the young man knew about this as well. She said that he was indeed her disciple. After that, it broke through the space, and Jack Ballantyre saw in front of him the thing he dreamed of. It was a famous ball that had been crafted by mermaids in the past and personally forged by the Dwarf King. It was called the Salarian. But apart from this wonderful sword, the teacher took another item from the open space. It was a special mask that helped hide one's face. When Jack picked up this artifact, he felt the magic that covers and opens the face, as well as a strange flow of mana. He asked his mentor what kind of mask it was. She said she didn't remember. She bought it long ago at some market. Jack was surprised and asked, so she has subjects that he doesn't even know? The mentor got angry and said that she needed the coordinates for teleportation. It turned out to be the capital of the Gunner Empire.
400 years ago, humans were at the bottom of the racial pyramid, but even they had their own country. The Gunnar Empire was the Mentor's homeland. Milos told Jack that the lab was located under the landmark. That was a good idea. Then she asked the young man if he was ready to teleport. He put a mask on his face and said he was always ready. In that world, two people were conversing. The first one told his interlocutor that he was just a genius. The union of man and dragon, this is brilliant. The doctor grinned and said it was an honor to have been praised by Hinky's beggarman himself. The first one asked the doctor why he had just done this. He suddenly stopped the glass of wine he was raising. The doctor said that he just had a feeling that something had appeared in their world that didn't belong here. Bedroman said it was impossible. It's not even worth talking about. The doctor asked him to ignore it. Hank his beggarman asked the doctor when he started experimenting on humans. The doctor thought for a moment and said that he originally had an idea and experiments on cattle showed excellent results. So far, he is most concerned about reducing the life expectancy of the subjects, but if you experiment with activating cells, this problem can be solved. The other person asked him when he could start doing this. The doctor was pleased with Beggerman's interest, as well as the crown princes, in the experiment. He cautiously remarked that it was difficult to find materials for experiments right now. If he had them, he would have started them immediately. The interlocutor asked the doctor, so he needs test subjects. He nodded and added that he was better than those with a talent for magic. The man got up from the couch and said that this is great, and he only had one question left. What will the doctor call the person who will be created from the union of a dragon and a human? He replied that he would call him a half-breed. The other person liked it. The man who had been talking to the doctor, adjusting his fur-colored cloak, asked him if he had made an appointment to meet anyone here. The doctor replied in the negative and said that he had never intended to do anything of the sort. Beggerman asked him whose mana flow he was sensing. This is clearly the master's energy. Suddenly, everyone present felt a powerful fire strike. It was a fierce magic attack that everyone in the palace was subjected to. Beggerman asked the doctor in charge of the study what was going on right now. It was truly a hellfire, sweeping away everything in its path. On the third floor of the building, Jack Ballantyre and Valentine Milos were standing in front of a dragon suspended by magic chains. The teacher said after a minute that she had cleaned up everything and asked Jack if there was anything else left. The young man replied that he wasn't anymore. Then he walked over to the crucified dragon and thought that it could still growl. It was cute enough. In his previous life, he was the same. At this time, the dragon asked Jack Ballantyre to kill him. The young master thought wistfully that even in his previous life, this dragon had repeatedly asked to be killed. Of course, this time everything has changed, but something needs to be done. He drew his sword and forcefully cut through the chains holding the dragon in limbo. The animal clattered to the floor. Jack Ballantyre sat down next to him and said that somehow he thought it was for the best. He patted the dragon's face and said that it had been 18 years, so he probably had something to say. He looked into the dragon's eyes once more and said that it looked rather exhausted. Jack Ballantyre, stroking the dragon's face, said that this was the man who had begged him to die. Does he want to live now? Abandoned material for experiments by parents. When he fell into the wrong hands, he gave up his own flesh and blood. Jack, bending over the dragon, asked him if he knew what his position was called, and he answered the question for the sacrifice. He is no better than livestock. They make their own armor out of its skin. Blood and bones were used for interracial experiments. If it didn't work, they tried again and again. And of course, no one was interested in his opinion. In the end, he will go mad. One day he will lose his will, forget his grievances, and just wait and wish for death. Does he want it? Do you want to be used and die? Tears welled up in the huge dragon's eyes. Jack Ballantyre said he could live a different life, a little dragon with no name, but his will mattered most. He will ask him one last time if he wants to live somewhere else. The dragon whispered something unintelligible, and Jack asked him to speak louder. If he wants something, let him shout from the bottom of his heart, so that even those who left him can hear. Then the dragon let out a loud roar and shouted that it wanted to live.
Jack Ballantyre nodded in satisfaction. He was the one who killed him in the past. In this life, this is also a possible option. But then he didn't want to kill him, he just had to do it. What could be better than being sent to eternal rest for someone who has lost his soul? But this dragon isn't the dragon from his past. He asked me to kill him, but now he's begging for his life. Of course, he had to save him. Jack Ballantyre leaned over and said in his ear that they were going home together. Then he asked his mentor if she would mind. For some reason, he thought she liked the dragon too. The mentor replied that let him do as he knows how. Jack said that even if she hadn't said that, he would have done it anyway. With that, he charged at Jack Ballantyr with his sword. When their blades collided, the young man thought that Beggarman was at the same level at that time. Beggarman was surprised to see the masked young man smiling at him. He angrily declared that the youngster did not dare to smile in front of him. The man called him a fearless idiot and said it was the tenth round. Even among the masters, he is one of the best mana holders. It is not for nothing that he is considered one of the strongest on the continent. However, the masked man named Jack told him that he was still not strong enough. Bedroman really felt a huge amount of energy and thought that this was exactly the pressure that he had felt so recently. His own feelings were significant. He actually felt an enormous pressure, an energy that seemed to be nothing more than an incredible, unearthly power. One of his punches broke Bagerman's sword in half. Without a weapon, he fell to the ground and lost consciousness. Jack Ballantyre approached the fallen opponent and asked him if he could lose consciousness so easily. He's a little disappointed. Bagerman leaned heavily on his broken blade and asked the young man who he was. He had never seen it. Jack asked him in turn, why would he want to know? He asked the man to listen to his prophecies. Jack said he knew someone. So far, he is still very simple and strong in his dreams, but the day he becomes the best knight on the continent will be the day Beggarman dies. This infuriated Beggarman, and he charged at the masked man again. Jack Ballantyre easily parried his blow with a broken blade and reminded him that he was still a weakling. It's amazing, and even he feels a little sorry for him. Soon, badly wounded, Beggarman was on the floor again, and Jack asked him to get a little stronger. He knew that Beggarman served the crown prince of Tolkien, and the prince is the head of the faction of supporters of cruelty, the source of all things. In just a few years, all their heads will fly off their shoulders. Jack Ballantyre thought that if it was too easy, he wouldn't be interested. He turned to Beggarman and said that he is also too weak now. Beggarman's disciple, his name is Marengos. Jack Ballantyre remembered how in his previous life, when he was killing Beggarman, he was attacked by a knight. Of course, he immediately cut off his head and didn't remember it clearly, but he should know that mentor and disciple are literally one. You can't cut off his teacher's hand and leave it to him, can you? With that, Jack chopped off his opponent's arm. His mentor, who was watching the whole action, asked him if he had finished or not. The young man replied that they could go. At this time, the dragon turned to them and said that there was one thing that should be taken away. With the help of teleportation, Jack and his mentor returned to the cozy walls of the Magic Academy. For Jack, it was a place where he spent many years learning and developing his skills. He looked like a man who was already used to this world and its mysteries. The mentor looked at Jack carefully and noticed that there was a certain bored melancholy on his face. The teacher told Jack that he looked bored. What's wrong with him being so thoughtful? They can always find new adventures so that he doesn't get bored. Removing the mask from his face, the young man said that he was already used to it. The mentor nodded respectfully, understanding that everyone has their own way of expressing themselves and finding their place in the world. Jack Ballantyre walked over to the rescued but still very weak dragon and patted it on the head. Then he looked him in the eye and asked him his name. He replied that his name was Sal Bahamut. The dragon repeated its name several times, Sal Bahamut. Jack Ballantyre stroked its face and said that was enough. What's the point of the last name of the parents who abandoned him? His name is Sal. After that, the young man offered to treat his wounds, to which the dragon dutifully agreed. After certain medical procedures, the dragon was given a room in the house and fell asleep. The mentor asked Jack what he planned to do with the dragon lords. He replied that whoever needs to bow, he comes first and bows. 
It will be strange if the strong one finds the weak one by himself. Valentine Milos asked the young man with interest, is it really that he cares so much about her? He confirmed her guess and reflected that his mentor was already 400 years old. In the past, she did a lot and created the basis for the existence of the human world, which now does not even remember her name. For the sake of such people, she shouldn't have interfered at all. He told her that he would deal with the two lords when the time came. She doesn't have to sacrifice herself for people anymore. The mentor bowed her head and said that they would do so. After that, she got up from her seat and said that they were all covered in a layer of dust and smoke. She's going to go to the bathroom and wash up. After Valentine left the bathroom, she advised Jack to wash up too, because he looks so untidy. Jack Ballantier undressed and stood in front of the mirror. There were many wounds on his body. He drank the elixir to ease the pain and thought that this way he might develop an addiction to these elixirs. When he returned to the room, his mentor was lying in bed. She noticed that Jack wasn't wearing his sleeping clothes. His mentor asked him where he was going. Jack sat down in the chair next to the bed and said he wasn't going anywhere. She asked him how much his wounds hurt, and he replied that he even thought he was going to die from the pain. Even now, after taking the elixir, his whole body aches. Milas told Jack that judging by his clothes, he wasn't going to sleep tonight. The student replied that he had heard that she had been looking after him during the three days he was lying down. Ron had told him that. During the three days he was unconscious, his mentor was with him. Then Ron said that he thought the mentor was a well-made doll. That's what he said. Now he had to look after her, and she always liked to sleep. As he spoke, Valentine Milos was already asleep. Jack Ballantier thought about what would have happened if they had met earlier. What would have happened if he had met his mentor 400 years ago, when she was born? A few hours ago, there was a man chained up in the underground prison of the Dukedom of Osenbol. He was being interrogated by the master of the Magic Tower, Bellamy Craig. This man had been spying on the head for 10 years. Craig couldn't believe it, so he asked the prisoner directly. He said, is that a bad thing? Bellamy Craig replied that the head had taken great care of him, and of course that was a bad thing. He took him in and raised him, and he stabbed him in the heart, so all his hard work and sincerity were just a game. There is no evidence or evidence. He asked the prisoner how much longer he thought he could keep quiet. He asked him one last time to tell him everything he knew. Does he really not know about this, or is he just pretending? Bellamy Craig was puzzled. Surprisingly, even in this situation, Marco Blutus feels too confident. He'd even heard that the circle had been destroyed for him. Where does he get such confidence? Craig leaned over Marco and told him to think about everything that had happened in the last 10 years. Does he really think it was an accident? Why did the previous owner of the tower decide to become a citizen of the Tolkien Empire? Why did so many 10th Circle holders abandon this country without hesitation? And why were so many mages summoned under the pretext of clearing the forest of monsters? Bellamy Craig straightened up and said he would speak when the torture started. Bluthus asked the Tower Master why they hadn't tortured him yet. Why is Duke Osnable still keeping him here despite being a traitor to the motherland? Was it because they weren't sure they'd get him to talk? To prove your loyalty to the king, Bellamy Craig thought that this man really didn't look like someone who had been tortured. He's been in jail for five days, but he hasn't lost any weight. Marco Bluetooth looked at the owner of the tower with distaste and advised him to think carefully about whether this kingdom really has a future. Bellamy Craig left the prison, but he couldn't help wondering why the man was so confident. Was the kingdom already completely rotten? That's why Blutus is so-so. Tomorrow he will be transferred to the castle and probably officially there will be no trial. Surely everything will be decided inside. But Bluthus is completely unafraid, absolutely confident. Does he really believe that he will survive? Four hours later, a fire started in the underground prison. When Craig ran to the cell where Bluthus was being held, he found that the prisoner had died. He's definitely dead. The tower master couldn't understand what was going on. In the morning, no matter how much Jack Ballantyre thinks about this problem, the dragon stands out too much from the rest of his allies. He thought happily, since when did he have so many allies? Thanos cautiously asked the young master, 
Is this really a real dragon? Jack said it was the real thing. The dragon that should have died, disappeared, is here now. The amazing realization that not everything people know is true. Jack put his hand on Charlotte's head and told her not to look so viciously at the dragon. He's not the Valactus, she remembers. Then he turned to Sal and asked him if he thought someone was going to eat him here. Why is he so worried? Can a normal sword harm a dragon? No way. No wonder dragons are called blessed animals. Most likely for the sake of experiments, it was Beggarman who used Sal's body. Jack Ballantyre looked thoughtful. He was able to give him a good kick. Naturally, Saul is afraid of him now. Does it look different after sleeping? Of course, he's a hunk. The young master saw the dragon bow its head low. He wondered if this was the dragon's way of expressing its submission. In his previous life, Sal almost lost himself. But now he will be better off than ten years ago, although this is not entirely true. As far as he knows, he should be about eight years old now. Come to think of it, there were only unfortunate creatures gathered around him. Jack noticed the dragon's paws. Suddenly, the animal raised its head and asked, How is this possible? His paws healed from the terrible injury in a second. Jack Ballantyre thought again that this ally was very different from the others, and it wouldn't hurt to change its appearance. Charlotte and Thanos were amazed at how suddenly the dragon turned into a human. It was a polymorph and it was a girl, and now it didn't stand out so much from the others. Jack Ballantyr folded his arms in satisfaction. The mentor now looks like an ordinary person and wants to look at this light. She asked Jack, isn't it the start of the semester ceremony? The young man replied that he should go to the ceremony. Jack told Saul to stay in the house until they got back. Then he asked her what dragons ate. They have some preferences, don't they? Fish, meat, they are hardly vegetarians. Then he asked her if she liked steak. Sal didn't seem to know what it was. Jack thought he'd like to ask her what she'd been fed in the dungeon, but it was best not to. He told her that he would ask the cook to cook something for her. Then he said there was a task for her. The view from the roof of their house is very steep. If she gets bored, let her go up there and think about what she'll do next. At the academy, the director spoke to students on the eve of the opening of the semester. He said that many years ago, there was a country called Teslin. The academy was also founded in those days and managed to cultivate many talents. There is nothing eternal in the world. Everything comes and goes with time. The same goes for the current generation. It can't be seen from the outside, but the kingdom casts a very dark shadow. Sitting in the classroom, Jack thought that this wasn't something he'd heard about in his previous life. The director continued. He told the students that they were the hope of the kingdom. He encouraged them to be confident and focus on their studies. Jack thought about the fact that his mentor had blown up the lab yesterday, but two-thirds of the tenth circle holders in Tolkien were still hardliners. Of course, in the battle for the throne of Tolkien, they will win, and in a few years there will definitely be a war. Jack Ballantyre thought that the old man knew a lot. Did he hear that from Bluthus? The director continued. The kingdom was built thanks to the blood and sweat of noble ancestors who gave their lives for them. They were very resilient, and that's what they are now. Therefore, they must remain just as resilient throughout their journey. They are all dear students of this academy. That was the end of the old man's speech. There was a commotion in front of the academy building. Carriages with students' luggage were arriving. Their parents moved between them. There are no classes or events on the opening day of the semester, and Jack Ballantyre wondered if he should go visit the old man. We need to thank him for the house that he provided and which he liked very much. At that moment, he saw his brother Palon. Jack walked up to him and asked when he had arrived at the academy. The man grudgingly replied that he had arrived yesterday. Jack Ballantyre put his arm around his shoulders and told him that he looked good, and would probably be able to drink water again without fear. Then the young master suggested that his brother at least greet him in the academy because they share the same blood. Panlon was silent, confused. Jack asked him why he didn't answer. Maybe he should roll up some limbs. My older brother asked me not to do this. Jack promised him not to and remarked that if he hadn't answered him, he would have killed him on the spot. Then he apologized for keeping him late and sent him to his friends, who were probably waiting for him.
Charla asked Jack if this guy was from his family by any chance. The young master said no, and the girl asked why he said they were blood brothers. Jack Ballantier replied that not everyone you are connected to by blood is your family. Then he asked Charlotte what she was thinking so seriously about. The girl asked who she was to him. Jack Ballantier thought hard. What kind of nonsense is this? Was she already going through puberty? Then he patted the girl's head and told her that she was his family. These are not empty words, but the absolute truth. When he considers someone his own person, they are like family to him. The ones he cares about, the ones he's responsible for, of course, are the family. He should not be with that idiot, but with the people around whom the mentor is standing. At the same time, Palin's friends asked him what kind of strange guy was standing with him. Is he really his little brother? He looks like an imbecile, but if you look at the two of them together, you can also mistake Palin for an imbecile. Normally, he would have been furious at such an attitude. Palon really thought that thinking about Jack annoyed him. Why was he even afraid of him? The bastard had once been his plaything. Suddenly, he left his friends and went somewhere. His friends were concerned about what was happening to him. Palon went over to Jack, who was standing with his friends, and called him an idiot. Did Jack ask if he was the one who'd spoken to him? He also asked if he wanted to hit him. But the older brother didn't have the courage. He hesitated and sat down on his ass from a light push from Jack. He thought that he had definitely overcome his fear of water, but why was his heart beating so fast? He had never felt anything like this before, so he didn't know that he was injured. Jack Ballantier did visit the academy's headmaster. Rommel said who Bluthus died for. Jack said he didn't care if he was dead or alive. Then Jack asked the old man if he had nothing more to say. The headmaster thought that it was strange that the young man didn't react to Bluthus' death in any way. At this time, the young master was about to leave, but the duke stopped him and told him to wait. He said that he was aware that he had entered the first year of the fencing department. Would he like to go to the magic department? Jack laughed and said it looked like the owner of the tower had asked him to. The old man replied that it just so happened. The young man replied that he had no intention of attending classes anyway. It's just that the academy's laws will be revised sooner or later. The principal noticed that the students from the student council had informed him that there were students like him who used the simplified method and did not attend classes. Jack Ballantier thought that the academy's laws would be revised in the second semester of next year, and the conversation was already starting now. The headmaster of the academy turned to Jack and said that he would have to attend absolutely all classes, but if he moved to the magic department, it would reduce the time he would spend on classes. Jack Ballantier looked thoughtful. What an old man. Of course, he needs a certificate of graduation from the academy, but he really doesn't want to attend classes. Would it help the rest of the students to have someone like him study with them? They would have to put up with his temper. The old man agreed with his opinion and said that then he would ask him to attend classes once a week. Jack asked the principal exactly how long he would be taking classes. The old man asked if it was too small. Three days a week sounds better. The young master turned to the principal and said that he had no plans to attend the academy's classes at all. He has nothing to teach and he has the best mentor. Isn't it funny that he can't learn anything here? The Duke asked him why he had joined them and even looked for a house nearby. Jack said he needed a certificate, and that was all. The old man was very surprised. Does he need a certificate to enter the Academy's treasury? Treasury of the Academy In the Teslin Empire, a graduate of the Academy is given not only a certificate of graduation, but also armor, a cloak, a staff, a sword, a spear, a shield, and so on. Inside the treasury is a magical weapon with a 400-year history. Each generation of graduates can take one of the weapons with them. The headmaster said that it had already been stripped of all its worth, and it was unlikely that the sore he needed was still there. And in the duchy, in principle, it does not exist. But from an ordinary sword, he can make a sword worthy of a squad captain. In terms of level, it will be better than any weapon in the vault. Jack asked, but it wouldn't be free, would it? Bellamy Craig is a man who, as everyone knows, has been devoted to the director for more than 30 years. He needs a student. Initially, it was his personal wish, 
but now they want to make him their subordinate. Jack told the old man that since he was going to graduate anyway, it would be good to arrange it early. The principal laughed and asked, now he already wants to jump through the school year? He promised to discuss it later and go back to the previous condition. He said they would choose between three and one day visits per week. He suggested two days. Jack saw no point in refusing the offer, so he agreed. The headmaster said that then today would be the beginning of his first year in the magic department. Jack nodded, but said that in return, he would not become the tower master's apprentice for the time being. The headmaster asked why, and the young man replied that he had a sharp eye and needed to see his man first. He will see how talented he is, how much he has grown. His skills in magic are far beyond what you can imagine. Rommel Einhardt Assemble smiled and said that he had a talent for separating good and bad. And if that's true, he'll take responsibility and make him a Marcus. The young man burst out laughing and said that he definitely didn't need it. Jack Ballantyr's visit to the headmaster of the academy was long enough, and the young man decided to leave. Finally, the old man asked him what had happened at the villa yesterday. Jack said nothing had happened. He wondered if the director was questioning him. The old man wanted to know the truth. Jack replied that he had gone to check on the boys because they hadn't prepared a meal, but found them all unconscious. He didn't ask what happened between them, but apparently they were just fighting among themselves. Surely the Duke must know that children grow up when they fight. Then Jack said goodbye and said he really had to go. When he walked out of the office door, he let out a sigh of relief. His eyes fell on a painting that hung on the wall. He was attracted to a woman with a sword and wings on her back. If one looked closely, this woman looked exactly like his mentor. The headmaster remained in the office, thinking. He's been on the political scene for decades, and his instincts are hard to fool. He had seen hundreds of nobles, knights, and even kings, but he had never felt anything like this. Her every little movement is unusual. He is sure that she is a unique woman. She stood at the window with her back to him, then turned around and said that the rank of general was more suitable for him than the headmaster. The old man replied that he had fought on the battlefield before, however briefly. Milos noticed that so was the child named Bellamy. Teslin has a lot of talent. Can he protect them? And does he think about it in principle? At that moment, the door in the cab swung open and Jack Ballantyr exclaimed, What are they doing here? Why isn't she coming? The mentor quietly said that their hindrance had returned. Then she turned to the young man and told him not to be so careless. She was just about to go out. Jack said he was just worried about why she'd been gone so long. As they walked down the street of the city, Jack noticed that his mentor's eyes were drawn to her. The vendors asked her to try the bread from their shop, but Valentine said she was allergic to flour starting today. When asked to drink tea at a local cafe, the mentor replied that she had just had it. Jack noticed that the attention they were giving her didn't bother her. Apparently, she was used to such stares. The young master asked the teacher if the headmaster wanted to make her his disciple. It's written all over her face. Miles asked him if he believed Director Rommel, and he said he didn't trust anyone but his own people. He has a different relationship with the old man. They just need each other. He asked his mentor not to worry about it. She nodded in agreement, noting that he definitely wouldn't let himself be used. Jack Ballantyr glanced at the house in front of them and said they were here. The teacher asked why they were here. Jack pointed to a sign that said it was the Arabesque Guild and said they were here for his money. The Arabes Guild was a guild of mercenaries, hunters, and the like. You can hire anyone in this place. Jack Ballantyr knocked on the guild's door and said that he was sure that if they needed a Ninth Circle Mage, they would need a lot more money than they might think. Most likely, the Ninth Circle Mage is the one Dietrich hired to kill him. However, what happens if both the person who paid and the person who took the order die? Inside, they were met by a woman who asked how she could help. Jack Ballantyr expressed a desire to see the guild leader. He told the woman that she could tell him the following words. Last night, the Ninth Circle, murder. The woman screamed and asked if it was Jack. The man next to her called her a fool and covered her mouth with his hand. Jack turned to this woman and said in surprise, does she really know him? Why was she so surprised? Jack Ballantyr guessed that Dietrich had ordered here. 
He didn't face him one-on-one, -on -one, but tried to kill him with the guild's hands. Now everything has changed. Jack gave them five minutes, and they were supposed to bring the supervisor here immediately. He picked up an hourglass with a five-minute control on the table, turned it over, and began his report. He warned them that otherwise, he wouldn't look at the fact that they were the Erebus Guild and would wipe them off the face of this continent. When the woman and the man ran off to find their leader, the mentor asked Jack if he was serious about destroying this guild. The young master said that many groups that call themselves guilds in the Empire and guilds that use the word adventurers are intermediaries, not independent institutions. They can be considered informants. The mentor noticed that the world has changed a lot. Jack Ballantier went on to say that he actually came here to find out who exactly Dietrich paid to kill him. In addition, the mentor herself saw the reaction of that employee. Valentine agreed that she knew about him and was surprised that he was still alive. Jack said that if an aristocrat submits a request to kill another aristocrat through an agency, it literally means that he is telling the whole world that he will be killed. That's why he thought Dietrich and the killer had met in person. Who knew that he would use the services of an intermediary? He's even more of an idiot than he thought. The mentor looked around at the staff who were watching them from afar and said that everyone here was looking at him as if they had seen a dead man come back to life. Jack said that those who tried to kill him, those who wanted to make some extra money and showed Dietrich this place, they were all the same to him. As the Harglass drew to a close, the mentor told the young man that she was beginning to understand a little about what his life had been like. At this time, the employee entered the office of her supervisor, who, seeing the woman's frightened face, asked what happened. The woman replied that Jack Ballantier was there. The supervisor exclaimed, is he still alive? Maybe she misunderstood. However, the woman replied that this person did not introduce himself, but she was sure that it was him. Jack Ballantier asked me to give him these words. Last night, the Ninth Circle murder. He also said that if he didn't show up in five minutes, the Arabesque Guild would disappear from the face of the earth. The man thought that he had heard a lot in his 34 years on the path to becoming a guild leader, but this was the first time this was happening to him. The Fentanyl Guild is a secret and dark group of assassins whose reputation is impeccable. Their methods are unwavering, and they never make mistakes. This is an elite brotherhood that has gathered in its ranks assassins with unique skills and an arsenal of knowledge. The head of the Fentanyl Guild is a mage of the Ninth Circle. His true name is hidden in the darkness of mystery, and his essence is hidden behind a cloak of invisibility that allows him to operate in the shadows. But their target is still alive. The supervisor thought that he didn't have time to think. He asked the woman, where is this young master? When the last grain of sand in the watch fell into the glass flask, he appeared in front of Jack Belang's eyes and apologized for waiting. He said he was glad to meet you and introduced himself to Abir, the head of the Arabesque Guild. Abiru was very kind and offered them tea, which, however, Jack Ballantier declined, preferring to get straight to the point. The guild leader made innocent eyes and asked if the young man had come to leave a request. Jack Ballantier said yes to begin with. A bear was an experienced executive, and Jack could tell by the look in his eyes that he was already feeling the money that would soon be in his pocket, but it was in vain. He said they tried to kill him last night. The order to kill him was issued through the Arabesque Guild. The guild leader agreed with this statement, and Jack noticed that the man's face showed no remorse, so he doesn't have to hide it. Jack Ballin asked, It seems that according to the Empire's law, an adventurer's guild is an intermediary that connects a client and a mercenary, receiving a fee for this. So, a bearer replied that this was not entirely true, but the young man understood the point. Legally protected. A mercenary needs a job, and there are still those who want to do their work with someone else's hands. For this purpose, we created connecting clients of performers across the country. The Arabis Guild is the largest medium-sized organization in the Teslin Empire, and its head is in hiding. Rumor has it that it might even be a member of the Imperial family. Jack noticed that he was imagining how much the man who wanted to kill him had paid. Abiru agreed that it was quite a lot. After all, it was a mercenary from the Fentanyl Guild, but they don't know exactly what the amount was.
Jack Ballantyre emphasized that this is what he came to talk about. They need complete information about the amount and payment. Abiru was surprised and outraged, but the young man said he didn't like to say it twice. But the guild leader was an experienced person. He said that it seemed like he wanted to assign the task to the Arabus Guild, but he wasn't an employee or a mercenary, so he would need to sign a contract. And not just in words, but a real treaty with the Empire. For its information, the provision mentioned above is the content of the first paragraph, and the provision of this agreement is the content of the second. Client Jack Ballantyre will have to determine the exact amount of payment for his request, specifically the initial payment, advance, and commission. Jack Ballantyre listened patiently to Abiru's monologue and said threateningly that he probably didn't understand him. He didn't come to leave a request. The person who wanted to kill him and the person who helped him with it are the same. Commission? He's got it all mixed up. They did not reject Dietrich's request, although they had a choice. Jack got up from his seat and told the guild leader that if he didn't follow his orders, he would kill all the guild employees. Abeiru said they were under the protection of the Empire. Jack told him that he'd better find out who he was talking to now, before he destroyed his cheeky face. He ordered him to do everything possible to find his money. He gave him a week to do all this. If he didn't have the money by then, the Arabesque Guild would disappear from the face of the continent on the same day. After that, he turned to the mentor, and they went outside. But before that, he repeated his demand to a bear one more time. He will conduct his own investigation later, and he must guess what will happen if he sees the difference between Dietrich's payment and the amount received. Even if it was one gold, it would be very fraught for him personally. And let him not dare to think that there is a reward for his efforts or work. When the guests left the guild, Abiru put his head in his hands and said that he was so fucked. He shouldn't have taken this order. An aristocrat kills an aristocrat. Was he even in his right mind when he came to them on such a case? He didn't want to take on such a job. The head of the Arabs guild, Abiru, continued to punish himself for his recent decision to take this man's order. When he first read Dietrich's request, he immediately thought that he didn't want to comply with it, and only a psycho could ask the guild to do such a thing. However, when he reported this to the top officials, he was told that young Master Herman could not be refused. The head promised to cover it. He introduced Dietrich to the Fentanyl Assassin's Guild, and it should have ended very simply. But it turned out like this. So, they are now being blackmailed by the youngest lord, who is not even in the line of succession to the title. Abeiru called Taliso, his employee, and asked him if the Marquises were friends of his. Or can he not even understand what you can say and what you can't say, because he is still a beginner. He remembered that they had hired Taliso a couple of months ago. He has really outstanding information gathering skills, but it's not clear what else he was chosen for. It can't be that Vedman suddenly became a raven and gathered the most elite members near Osin Bell. It would have cost 30 silvers, but what if the target was still alive? Jack Ballantyre doesn't know the amount of the contract, and there's no evidence that the killer got out of the province. Maybe he was caught, but then he would have known the amount. He asked Taliso if that idiot Dietrich Herman was at the semester opening ceremony today. Toliso said he hadn't been in today. Abiru asked him to tell me more about it. The clerk said that only his servants were staying at the inn where he was staying, and the accompanying guards hadn't shown up since last night. The guild leader held his head again and asked, is he really missing? This is all very strange. He invited his employee to think together. He suggested that he imagined that he was attacked by a ninth circle magic owner and 30 professional sixth circle assassins. They are professionals among professionals. There is no escape from them, but the missing Dietrich Herman died, and the entire Fentanyl Guild was destroyed. Tolisso agreed that the mission was a complete failure. Abeiru was outraged and said that the target of the mission had returned alive. The employee couldn't understand what had happened and asked the boss, is it normal that he came back without a scratch? He didn't understand why Abeiru was asking him all this. Abeiru thought and reasoned. Even if with someone else's protection, he was able to protect himself from the killer, then there should be at least a hint of emotion on his face. And he was completely calm. There was no one special among the last recruits in the fall. Let the Marcus have several nights. 
But this again does not add up in time. Maybe it was one of the locals. Did the Duke himself fall? After all, Jack Ballantyre even lives in his residence, a high-ranking guest of the dukedom, and that's a good reason to protect him. But yesterday's fire in the duchy breaks everything down. The army couldn't have done such a thing. A bearer thought that he was missing something in his reasoning. He told Talizo to contact the representative of the Marquises of Ballantyr immediately. He told me to find out everything I could about Jack Ballantyr and bring it to him. He also ordered to gather the guys and search everything, but to find a place where Ventiman could hide the money. He also ordered a letter to be sent up to say that Dietrich Herman's mission had failed, that the fate of the Fentanyl mercenaries was unknown, and that Jack Ballantyr might be under the protection of the Duke of Omble. As the servant left, a Beiru wondered wistfully who the woman next to Jack Ballantyr had been. Their eyes had briefly met recently, and an instinctive fear had enveloped him. He decided that he would not look for this woman and mention her. Fortunately, Abiru liked to rely on his intuition, which rarely failed him. When Jack Ballantyre and Valentine Milos came home, they saw an interesting sight. In the wasteland, Thanos and Charlotte were fighting with swords. Jack wondered if they were really fighting. Apparently, this is just a training session. It seems that they both got their first man around. When he got a closer look at this battle, he wasn't so sure that it was a training session anymore. The teacher noticed that it was all very strange. Did Thanos really think he could beat that kid last night? Jack Ballantyr knew she was talking about Hank his beggarman. The mentor turned to Jack and said that he should have known even by the look of it that Charlotte had never held a sword in her hand. The young master noticed that she was still unsure of him and didn't know how to keep her distance. Milos shook her head and said, even so, she can remove Thanos from his position. It looks like Charlotte is losing ground, but it's actually Thanos. He's stronger than Charlotte, but you can't say for sure who will win in the end. Jack thought the girl was clumsy, but she was good at attacking. She didn't study swordsmanship, so how did that happen? Then he turned to his mentor and offered her a bet. She asked what it was all about. The young master replied that he would make it so that Thanos could defeat Beggarman in just nine years. The mentor objected, wouldn't Beggarman himself become stronger during this time? Jack Ballantyre suggested that she was afraid to argue with him. Still, the necromancer agreed and made a bet. Jack added that they had a bet on a wish. The loser will do the winner's will. The mentor replied that she was curious about how he would make this child so strong. Jack said there were many ways. Then he approached the fighters and stopped the fight. He advised them to rest better. The girl resentfully said that they did not quarrel, but only trained. Jack told Charlotte that she had a talent for fencing. Even though he hadn't seen the whole fight, she had succeeded three times. She hit Thanos' sword three times. More precisely, two times out of three. What to do if the opponent is stronger than you? The answer is simple. Be like Charlotte. If he hadn't interrupted their fight, she would have definitely hit Thanos. He complimented the girl again and said that we should see if she was also talented in magic. Then he suggested that the girl go up to the roof and play with Cell. He also passed her a cake. Jack said he needed to talk to Thanos one on one. When Charlotte was gone, looking very happy, Jack Ballantyre turned to Thanos and asked if he knew that he had lost. He answered in the affirmative. The young master said that Charlotte was very good at it. She has a talent for close combat, unlike him. You can easily figure out exactly how to replay the situation when you lose positions. Charlotte did it, and even twice. He was confused and didn't know how to fend off her attack. In another minute, if he hadn't intervened, Thanos would have been on the ground. He asked the guy if it was stubbornness or selfishness. Charlotte is physically small. But such a little thing was able to realize his strength, come up with tactics, and deflect his blow. He asked the big man what he should do in this situation. Everything is simple. He must change his sword technique or strength so that he doesn't lose control so easily. But he didn't and just kept swinging his sword like before. This won't do. He suggested that Thanos try to kill him just once. Thanos asked in surprise, does the young master really want him dead? Jack Ballantyre confirmed his desire to kill his friend once if he wants to train properly.
He wanted to be the strongest on the continent, didn't he? To do this, you will have to try hard. The knight suddenly blushed and said that he was making everyone uncomfortable, and Jack was obviously laughing at him. Jack Ballantyre put a hand on the giant's shoulder and told him that he would have to try, which means he should be prepared to even die. Then he looked him in the eye and seriously asked if he was willing to try so hard that he would even risk dying. Thanos confidently replied that he was ready for it. Jack turned to his mentor and asked her not to leave, but to help them. Mylas asked how she could help them. Jack Ballantyre replied that he would like to use the illusion inside the magic circle. Valentine Mylas nodded in understanding. He wants to change the path of magic and create a training partner for this kid. An illusion that looks like a real person. My mentor said that I would have to spend a lot of mana on this. Jack Ballantyre agreed with her and drew a magic circle. Valentine looked at him and said with interest, Is this a combination of the rules of death and illusions? Rules of Death is a tenth circle dark magic spell. It controls a limited space, spreads black magic in it, and changes the mana path according to the caster's will. In this space, you can drive your opponent crazy and force them to panic. This is a spell that creates an illusion that looks like a real person. But if you combine both spells, you get something interesting. Jack Ballantyre wondered what he and his mentor had come up with in their previous lives and it brings back certain memories. After that, Jack turned to his mentor and Thanos. He said that the battles have difficulty levels from 1 to 10. The higher the number, the stronger the opponent. He asked the knight what level he wanted to start at. Thanos wanted to start with the first level, and Jack agreed with him. He announced that they would start with the easiest one, and thought that when Thanos died a hundred times, he would definitely learn how to hold a sword. After all the preparations were completed, the mentor told Thanos to go inside the circle. Then she asked Jack who he made his opponent. The young man leaned down and whispered the name of Thanos' opponent in his mentor's ear. Valentine shook her head in surprise. Jack winked at her and told her that they would do it in less than nine years. The teacher looked him in the eye and said that he was not a good person, to which the student replied that he often hears this. Meanwhile, Thanos found himself in a place he'd never been before. He wondered what it was. Right in front of him, a man whose face was vaguely familiar to the knight stepped out of the darkness. He'd seen it somewhere. He soon realized it was Jack Ballantyre. Thanos thought that this was probably what training was all about. Illusory Jack went on the attack, and Thanos realized that he needed to stop him with his sword. Thanos kept a close eye on his illusory partner, Jack. Thanos no longer remembered that this was a training session. He felt tense, and this was more than what he was looking for, an opportunity to train with such a strong opponent. The enemy's attacks didn't just inspire Thanos to improve his reflexes, coordination, and swordsmanship. These attacks were really life-threatening. He was aware that this duel was not only a test of Thanos' strength and determination, but could actually end in his actual death. At the moment when everything seemed to slow down, Knight B realized that Jack was about to cut off his head. When Thanos woke up, the first thing he did was put his hands to his neck. The Knight was sitting in the vacant lot behind the manor, and Jack Ballantyre was standing over him with an ironic smile on his lips. He asked him what he was doing. Thanos looked fearfully at the young master, who gave him a hand to help him up. He asked the Knight why he was afraid. Saw a ghost. Thanos, getting to his feet, asked Jack who was in the circle just now. The young man replied that it was an illusion. It was illusion magic. He had little experience yet, and he wasn't in a situation where he had to risk his life. Jack knew that this was just the beginning of Thanos' training, and Thanos had to realize that the longer he could hold out in this training session with the illusory Jack, the stronger he would become. The pursuit of excellence was his driving force, and he knew that the experience and skills gained in this training could be crucial in future battles. He must understand that the lack of certain talents or abilities can be made up for by experience and perseverance. He worked on himself, improving his swordsmanship, improving his reflexes, and strategic thinking. He knew that the more he trained and improved, the closer his dream of becoming the continent's best swordsman would come to fruition. Jack told the young man that it was in this circle that he had seen Jack Ballantyre at the age of 18.
He had already tried it and should have figured it out for himself, but he would still say that he would have to fight him, Jack Ballantyre, from a previous life. The longer he could hold on, the stronger he would become. Lack of talent can be made up for by experience. Magic is not used there, only swordsmanship, so the difficulty was at the level of the first round. Jack advised Thanos to try to win. The young man nodded in agreement, but asked what kind of past life was this. Jack thought about the fact that he really hadn't told Thanos about his rebirth, but decided that he would do it another time. Jack asked the knight if he was sure of himself. He replied that he would try to win. Jack Ballantyr looked him in the eye and thought that even though it was an illusion, the feeling of death was very clear. If you die several times, you can go crazy. However, Thanos is different, and it's not just empathy. He really believes in it. Even with broken bones and damaged muscles, he practiced with the sword day after day. When he'd asked last time, Thanos had said that when he wasn't sleeping, he worked out all the time. The problem is that this huge amount of mental power was being spent in the wrong direction. So he just has to die and learn from his mistakes. He can definitely beat Beggarman. And he will help him in this. Jack asked Thanos how much longer he would call him the Marcus. He asked me to call him boss. It would be less formal. He thought about how originally he was just thinking of playing with this chicken. But over time, his plans changed. He'll make a man out of a chicken. Thanos asked him if he could call him young master. And Jack agreed to that. Charlotte, after the duel with the knight so abruptly interrupted by Jack Ballantyre, went up to the roof and wondered what she had done wrong. She was waiting for the boss after the ceremony was over, but he still didn't show up, and then she saw Thanos nearby. She wanted to ask him to teach her swordsmanship, but when the boss came, even though she received a compliment, something was wrong. He seemed a little angry, maybe because they had a duel without his permission. Obviously, I'll have to apologize to him. Just then, she met Saul, who dropped to her knees in front of her and apologized for not seeing the girl coming here. Charlotte was shocked by Dragon Cell's action. She hated dragons. Phylactus, the dragon who used her and her mother as toys and was called her uncle. But the boss said she wasn't like Phylactus at all. Charlotte stood there for a moment, puzzled, and then hugged Saul. She thought that until now, she hadn't told him what had happened to her, but maybe she can help her somehow. Jack Ballantyr and Valentine Milos entered the kitchen and learned from Guinness, the cook, that Sal had been on the roof since early morning. Just as Charlotte was hugging Sal, Jack and his mentor came up to them. Jack Ballantyr asked them why they were both there, hugging each other on the floor. Were they really that close? Milos asked him if it wasn't just one side that became friends. He thought that if he looked closely, for some reason Saul was shaking all over, and Charlotte was crying. Charlotte saw the young gentleman, went up to him, and apologized. Then she told me what had happened. She said she went through a lot in that lab. Jack asked the girl what she had apologized for. She replied that she had apologized because he was angry about having a fight without permission. Charlotte said she wouldn't do it again. But the young master said that she can have fights whenever she wants and she doesn't need his permission. Besides, he's not mad at her at all. If she didn't hit him on the head with a wooden sword, then he would definitely be angry. So, don't let him do it. Charla exclaimed happily, so the young master isn't mad at her. And she felt sorry for Thanos, who had fought stupidly. Jack looked at her with respect and said that they were convinced of her talent as a swordsman. He suggested that she test her magic at night. Charlotte happily agreed. He asked Saul if she liked the steak for breakfast, and what else did she want to try? Jack asked her why she didn't have the strength. Yesterday, after all, she resisted so much, a day passed, but she managed to change a lot. Is she ill? She replied that the blackened demon that changed the earth and sky would soon destroy the world. Jack asked her, is it because of the destruction of the world? Dragon agreed with him. This is the third Dragon Lord's prediction. 400 years ago, the third Dragon Lord, who was stronger than the fourth and fifth combined, went against the will of the Mentor and died. Of course, her victory was obvious. He could predict the future using the power of souls, so he left a prediction behind before he died. In the near future, a blackened demon will appear, which will change the sky and earth, and destroy the whole world.
Jack Ballantyre looked fondly at Sal and asked her if she was afraid that he, Jack Ballantyre, was a blackened demon who would destroy the world. Jack Ballantyre firmly told Sal that this prediction was complete nonsense. Real nonsense. What's the end of the world? Sal contradicted him and said that this was the Third Lord's prediction, and he was never wrong. Jack thought she must be energetic. He told the dragon that apparently her parents hadn't told her that the Third Lord liked to change his predictions. He often did this to protect the dragon race. Jack Ballantyre patted her on the head and told her not to worry about being stupid. Now she must calm down. Sal pulled herself together and asked the young master, are you sure he won't eat her? He replied that he didn't need it at all, because dragons weren't his type at all. Then Jack reminded her that it was almost lunchtime, and she'd better tell him straight out if she liked that steak. Sal replied sheepishly that it was delicious. Then Jack promised that they would all have steaks together for lunch, but not the same as in the morning. He will ask the chef to prepare something new from tomorrow. He advised Saul to eat a delicious meal and not be sad. Jack Ballantyre remembered that he hadn't actually introduced the girls. Even though they've already met, of course, he wants to make it official. He introduced Charlotte, who would soon be the Vampire Queen, and Saul, the future Dragon Lady. Sal asked how she could become a mistress. Jack added that he would introduce Thanos to her at lunch. He suggested that Charlotte go into the kitchen and arrange for dinner. In turn, the girl suggested that Sal go there together. They held hands and went to the kitchen. After they left, the mentor said to Jack that he was a good liar. The third lord was very special. He didn't use soul energy as mana like them, but only for psychic skills, and all his predictions were short. Tomorrow it will rain, the day after tomorrow there will be a battle, and so on. But all his prophecies turned out to be true. Only one thing didn't come true. In the not-too-distant future, a blackened demon will appear that will change the heavens and earth and destroy the entire world. Jack Ballantyre asked his mentor, does she also think he can destroy the world? She replied that as far as she could see, he was the only one who would talk about it. Jack said he didn't think that was true. If the prediction was correct, he would have destroyed the world in his previous life. The teacher asked him, so it didn't work out in the previous life? Jack replied, he managed to destroy one country, and then he died. He had no reason to move on, and he didn't want to. He sighed and said that it was definitely a fake prediction. He believes that the blackened demon is definitely someone else. He turned to his mentor and said that the future fate was not determined. It's going to rain tomorrow, and then there's going to be a battle somewhere. If you close the sky, stop any conflicts, then you cannot let the prediction come true. So, the future is undefined. He thought about it. The fate in which the mentor was left to live for 13 years. If that really happens, he'll be very angry. After that, he invited his mentor to lunch. After a while, all the allies gathered together at the same table to have lunch. The kids finally got to know each other. Thanos was 17, Charlotte was 11, and Saul was 10. Jack Ballantyre looked about 14. They were like a bunch of little kids. Jack noticed that Guinness was a much better cook than he had expected. The cook said that he worked as an imperial chef for four years. Who knew that such a talent was so close? His food was really delicious. The young master also noticed that Saul was afraid of blood, which was amazing. However, today the steak was without blood. Children open up quickly and learn. Charlotte will be the vampire queen, and Saul will be the dragon lady. At lunch, his mentor asked Jack why he wasn't working out. He told her that two laps were enough for him, and she didn't have to worry about him. Valentine asked what was going on with Bluthus and the mercenary guild. Did he think she didn't know anything? In fact, he doesn't trust them, but only himself. Of course, he has a small body right now, but he only needs time to easily get the third and even the fourth round. Is not it so? The young man replied that if he tried, he would even get a fifth. The physical component is very important. I hate to admit it, but biologically he's a little boy. His body isn't what it used to be. There is a difference in the size and length of the veins, and even the size of his heart is different. At Thanos' age, he could easily have gotten around every day. But he needs more time, and do not forget about vigilance.
The mentor noticed that if someone hurts a person during the creation of the circle, it will collapse and the person will receive a big shock. So he's worried that he might be in danger while creating the circle. Jack noticed that the mentor was impossible to deceive. After being reborn in the body of a 14-year-old self, he first made his circle right in the Marcus prison, because no one could get through to him, and when he created the second circle, Ron was there. Someone he could trust. He needs to protect his mentor while she's a puppet, which means he doesn't have time to create a circle. Jack Ballantyre thought about the fact that she only returned to her normal form once a month, and that was today. He can't waste time because of the circle. The sources of his power are not in circles, but in energy. The mentor said that it was stupid to get protection from a student when you were their mentor. Maybe once a month, but she can do her duty as a mentor. It will protect him while he creates the circle. Jack thought he already had plans for the evening. He, with so many responsibilities and concerns, sometimes felt exhausted and in need of rest. He replied that there was nothing to do, it was one o'clock in the afternoon, so he would have to do everything in five hours. And in the evening, they will all go to the theater. In the Arabas Guild building, Abero was given the 500,000 gold figure that was stipulated in the contract for the murder of Jack Ballantyre. The guild leader couldn't believe his ears at first. He asked Taliso if so much money had been offered for the murder of one man. Taliso confirmed and said that he personally made the order. Abeiru realized that young Master Herman was a real and complete lunatic. 500,000 gold pieces. That's how much Dietrich was willing to pay for the murder of Jack Ballantyre. And this is despite the fact that the annual budget of the Marcus is about 300,000. How did young Marcus Herman manage to pay out so much money in one go? For the sake of killing one person too. Abeiru put his head in his hands thoughtfully. He borrowed 200,000 in the name of the house of Herman and received the remaining 300,000 immediately. That's $500,000. How did he get so much money? Maybe he sells illegal drugs. Talisa replied that there were rumors that Dietrich had started a business, but he couldn't find anything about him. It is not unusual for aristocrats to lead an idle lifestyle and use drugs. But who will start a business related to this? Normally, this should just be the young master's hobby, but in Herman's case, it's not like that at all. As far as he knows, Dietrich Herman doesn't do business alone. It seems that all the Marquises Hermans are engaged in it. Maybe Dietrich is just acting on their behalf, but he doesn't do anything on his own. They have sales routes all over the country. Just how far did they go? Toliso asked his master if he understood so much just by looking at the document. Abeira replied that he knew everything. So how far did they go? His servant suggested another investigation. This applies to elixirs. The business of selling forbidden elixirs is impossible without the support of the duke or royal family. But Abeiru forbade further investigation. It is important for him to make a payment. Did he find it? Toliso said he'd only found half of it. A bear suddenly understood. The assassination attempt failed, and the Fentanyl Assassin's Guild was destroyed. Otherwise, their informants would have found out long ago and wouldn't have let them go just like that. Veneman hid his money after splitting it. That's why they only found half of it. The second one won't be hard to find. Abeiru told Taliso to continue his search and order the boys to join him. The servant asked the master why they had to hide all this from the top. Abeiru replied that they did not hide it. They just have to decide for themselves so as not to add to their problems. They're such busy people. When Taliso went to the market to buy lunch, Abeiru thought that he couldn't trust the upper echelons. Jack Ballantyre's threat was real, so he needs to find the money to keep his head. Later, he will decide whether to report to the top management or not. Anyway, even though he's the head of the branch, there's no point in giving his life to the guild. Then he thought about how he had never even seen the top of the guild, not even when he became the head of the guild. He doesn't know their age or gender. He is only sure that it is not one person, and how can you be loyal to people who hide their identity? It was strange trying to subjugate the forest to a monster. He even feels a little sorry for the people who give their lives in this place, and this battle could have been avoided. In addition, this is not just a battle, 
but a war between humans and monsters. Monsters can't get out of the forest, but that doesn't change the point. Besides, warriors are created to throw society into chaos, and the kingdom is quiet right now. The Arabesque Guild is stronger than it looks. It is not difficult to control the mood in the country with the help of information. Their faction supports the king, so it's only natural that the guild is protected by the king's law, and the number of enslaved mana users that weren't necessary has drastically decreased. Although there is a high probability that the king will lose the support of the aristocrats. But why was their guild involved in all this horror? So many strange things have been happening lately. Abeiru did not stop thinking about the difficult situation and the possible business of Dietrich Herman associated with it. A business that uses illegal drugs. Come to think of it, it wouldn't have been possible without the Empire's support. Then maybe those 300,000 gold coins were used to push that idiot Dietrich forward and make him responsible. Then they should definitely have made a fortune. But even without saying the amount, how could the guild not know about the transfer of such money? Is one day of investigation enough to find out everything? He wasn't even aware that their superiors were deliberately hiding it. That's why he received a reply earlier asking him to accept Dietrich's offer. Why would the top brass go so far? Is it really stolen money from the authorities? No, it's not that amount. Then for military expenses, are they planning to start a war? But whose money is it? The top ones, or the people even higher up who have their backs? It's definitely not money for clearing monsters in the forest. Most of the money was paid by Count Mentis. But why and why? Abiru was lying on the couch, his thoughts like a raging hurricane. Lately, it seemed to him that someone was deliberately undermining the power of this city, or rather the entire country. Both the number of drug addicts and the crime rate are growing. That's why so many mercenaries are being hired for protection now. He certainly doesn't think so. In addition, two years ago, there were rumors that the Tolkien Empire was conducting experiments on dragons. They may have said that dragons are extinct, but they're just words. Of course, there must be a reason for these rumors. Then he immediately wanted to check if they were true, but a message came from above. They ordered him not to investigate anything about rumors related to the Tolkien Empire. If it was just a rumor, then he wouldn't have been given such an order. Of course, this is only his premonition, but still. He should stop thinking about it, but his life is all about getting information, and he can't just stop thinking about it. Abiru thought that this terrible feeling might take over his entire body. The guess that he created using only the information in his head is something like this. The top of the Aravis Guild is either connected to the Tolkien Empire, or one of its members is from there. The Adventurer's Guild actively helps with the extraction and control of information. I need to think again. Experiments on the dragon. If this is true, then where did they get the dragon from in the first place? Perhaps dragons still live in the monster forest. If in fact a hunt is conducted to find their tracks, it will be very likely. The Tolkien Empire has absolutely no regard for soldiers and is willing to use them as consumables. If there is a result, great. If not, they will simply be glad that they have reduced the country's military power. It is the person from the Tolkien Empire who should have more power and control over what is happening. If his guess is correct, the Teslin Empire won't last long. Even so, it barely holds its borders and could easily become a Tolkien colony. So what they really want is war. The Teslin Empire is helpless. Abeiru, summing up all his conjectures and conjectures, came to the conclusion that this is true, perhaps. Surely there are people from Tolkien at the top of the Arabas Guild and in the Imperial government, which means they want to unite the continent. There isn't much time left. 20 years. 30. Abiru, analyzing the current state of affairs in the Empire, decided that at best 10 years. He liked this country. But when the time comes, what will happen to the guild and to him? He doesn't want to become a hunting dog thrown out after catching rabbits. It needs to create new threads, strong threads that will never break. Sal Bahamut's head was filled with equally heavy thoughts. She wondered who this person really was. She hates people. They cut off her limbs, pumped out her blood, and held her in magical shackles. She may not love them, but ironically, it was one of them who saved her. Her parents abandoned her, and they also recorded on her body knowledge about xenobiotics or something.
They left her in the middle of the land in a country called Tolkien. In the beginning, she was afraid that strong people like him could eat dragon meat. However, this man didn't want anything in return. Such a good person can't be a demon who will destroy the world. Sa wanted to believe, and she was almost certain that the Third Lord was definitely wrong in his prediction. As a human, he was able to reach the Third Circle in just an hour, and in another hour, he will reach the Fourth. And now, two hours later, he was able to reach the Fifth. Charlotte admired the young master and said that the boss was very cool, and Saul knew exactly how the girl felt. Anyone would have been thrilled to see it. Milos turned to Sal and asked her if she was worried about Jack. Seeing everything in her eyes, she reassured her and said that the two of them had excellent talents. Let him watch carefully. This is the most impressive state of the circle. The difference of one lap is already very large. This is exactly the case. It is quite strong, and each of its circles is in perfect harmony. The form in which the body and mana become one is sometimes called mana unity. If you can control this state, you can open all the borders. She told Sal not to think about anything stupid. She told Sal that she could tell her about herself, but not about her student. Sal thought it was because she was a stranger to them. Valentine admitted that she doesn't know much about her student either. She knows exactly what happened to Sal in that lab. She asked me to trust her student in everything. As long as he was around, no one in the whole world would touch her. When Jack Ballantyre finished perfection, he was pleased to think that the fifth round at 14 sounded like something to be proud of. This is truly unprecedented. Had his body always been like this? He thought that he was able to create circles very quickly because he was near Ron and in prison, but his energy is so pure not because of his young age. Is it a matter of soul energy? It is higher than mana in level. And since he is good at controlling soul energy, he can handle mana as well. Maybe he can even become stronger than in his previous life, when he first discovered inner energy. Jack Ballantyre found the idea very funny. Become stronger than yourself. Perhaps he really has the power to destroy the world. In the evening, Jack Ballantyre and his friends went to the theater. Sitting in the hall, Jack noticed that Saul was very close to her mentor. He couldn't understand the nature of this phenomenon. The dragon is smiling cheerfully, but the mentor, he thought she had forgotten how to do it. Now they sit together and are very happy. Jack thought that if he'd known they'd like it so much, he would have brought Thanos here too, but he preferred the theater to training. He left him at home because he didn't want to come. It is very difficult to become a better continent swordsman. After the performance, the mentor asked the young man if she thought he didn't like the performance. He said she was wrong, and he was very interested, and the turns were interesting. His mentor asked him what he meant by that. Wasn't it the part where Kristen turned out to be a theater ghost? Jack answered in the affirmative and said, who knew that the ghost is the main character? Everyone was very surprised by his words, and the mentor said that the ghost was not Kristen, but a man named Eric. Jack felt awkward and asked if it was time for them to go eat. Valentine told him that he was confused and trying to change the subject. After finishing the performance at the Osenbell Theater, Jack and his group decided to grab a bite to eat at a small, cozy place nearby. Lunch in the restaurant was a moment of exchange of impressions and a pleasant conversation after the performance. The variety of culinary masterpieces and the atmosphere of the place created a pleasant memory that they could share. When everyone sat down at the table, everyone admitted that they had a lot of fun. Suddenly, Jack saw Abera enter the restaurant and talk to the owner. When he saw Jack, he went up to him and told him that he hadn't expected to see him here. The young master wondered if he was following him. The head of the Arab's guilt replied that he just came to eat and the information collector wouldn't give himself away so much. Jack pointed out to him that he must have plenty of time to go to a restaurant and he should be busy looking for his money. A bearer replied that he had already found half of it. It's his job. After that, he casually sat down at their table. Jack realized that the young man wanted something from him and asked a bearer directly about it. He confirmed his guess but said he wouldn't talk about it here. Glazabiru's gaze rested on her mentor's face with admiration. He turned to her. If she doesn't mind, let him have the honor of sitting next to her.
Charlotte was very much surprised by this courtesy, and even noticed that this man had played the part of a ghost in a recent performance at the theater. Valentine glanced at a bear and said she was busy today. The chief remarked that it meant she had things to do, and he would look forward to getting to know her. Abeiru soon prepared to leave, promising Jack Ballantyre that he would find all his money very soon. Valentine Milas suddenly invited him to sit down and eat together. Jack agreed to her offer, but just in case, he asked if he had any money. He didn't think it would be free, did he? He doesn't buy food for people who are bigger than him. Abeiru assured Jack that he had the money. Abiru was unusually generous. He ordered a fancy table and lots of goodies for the young people. He asked them to eat more. If necessary, he would order something else for them. Jack thought approvingly that the man was treating the little ones better than he'd expected. He asked Abera why he had decided to accept Dietrich's request. The guild head replied because it was an order from the management. The young master asked him, so he was a puppet to them. Is that what he's trying to say? Abera replied that he was just a convenient tool for them. Jack Ballantyre noticed that this man was also suffering. He asked him if he had actually found half the amount that was promised under the contract. Abera replied that it was a sum of 500,000 gold pieces. Dr. Ballantyre almost choked on his food. 500,000 for him alone? Where did he get such a talent for making money? Why did he decide to spend as much as 500,000 gold? Abera replied that he seems to have had several businesses. Jack asked him he wasn't checking it now, was he? After all, his answer is too vague not to follow his reaction. Abero noted that there must be something in these businesses that Dietrich is involved in. But he can't tell Jack that for free. The young master said that he didn't ask for it. Then he advised the guild head to eat faster and pay half for the meal. He already said that he doesn't buy food for those who are bigger than him. Abeiru asked in surprise, but shouldn't he pay for one person out of five? Jack replied that he was originally going to eat one, but he had intervened, so he would have to pay half of it. Then the young master laughed and said that he was joking. He'll pay for it himself. Let Abeiru think of it as a gift from the underworld where he lives. Of course, if he finished it right, then the gift from the underworld might not be necessary. When the mentor quietly said that time was up, it sounded like an unexpected end to a pleasant dinner in a restaurant. Jack and his friends looked around, surprised, and looked at their mentor, waiting for an explanation. But in the next moment, something incredible happened. The mentor slowly began to transform right in front of their eyes. Her figure was disappearing, and a small doll appeared in its place. Abeiru was taken aback by this unexpected and mysterious metamorphosis. He couldn't believe his eyes. A moment ago, she was sitting in the company of a charming adult woman, and now there was a small doll in front of her. Abeiru almost fell out of his chair and asked what had happened to the girl. Jack Ballantyre picked up his mentor and told her that he didn't care if she told him about it, but that he should try to keep quiet as much as possible. Jack looked at his mentor and thought that no one would take his and his mentor's word for it. Although he doesn't care if everyone in the world finds out about it, he thinks Abiru thought she was just using a transformation. Confused, Abiru said he was leaving, and Jack advised him to be careful. Looking after the young man, the teacher said that even in her previous life, she did not talk about this. Jack tried to find out what she was talking about. Mila said that maybe it was just her intuition, or maybe it was because she'd spent her entire life facing death. But she can smell death from people who are about to die. Jack asked her if she thought Abeiru was going to die soon. His mentor confirmed his guess and said that it was unlikely that he would kill him. Jack Ballantyre thought ruefully that many talented people had died in the Empire at this time and apparently he was one of them. The mentor asked Jack if he had any doubts. He said he doubted it and to be honest, he didn't even know. He doesn't know what kind of person he is. He only knows his name and title. He doesn't seem completely untalented, but he has nothing to give. Over time, it will become clear whether it can be used or not. After that, they went home. Abeiru, as he approached his guild, thought that he was working overtime again. You'll have to chew the awakening fruit to stay awake. Jack Ballantyre was surprised by the freshness of the morning. He looked up at the clear sky and sighed happily.
The morning came with a clean and fresh breath. The morning breeze caressed his face, bringing the aroma of freshly baked bread from the local bakery and blooming flowers. Birds chirped in the bushes and trees, creating a pleasant atmosphere nature. The morning was full of promise of a new day and new opportunities. Jack felt a sense of joy and hope as he waited for what the day would bring. Then he heard the voice of his mentor, who was standing next to the stairs in front of a special round daze in the house. She asked him if he didn't have anywhere else to do it. Initially, this place was intended for meditation and prayers. The young man replied, what kind of weekend is it then? He asked her to join him, but the immortal necromancer refused. Jack went up to the roof, where Saul was sitting alone. He asked her if she thought about what he'd said. What will it do in general from now on? Saul paused and said that she had made up her mind. Revenge. She wants and will seek revenge. To the parents who left her there and to the beggarmans who bullied her. Jack Ballantyr thought that Thanos had a rival. Sal asked the young master that it would definitely be difficult. Jack told her to hurry, because they might all be out of this world before she got her revenge. The girl asked, then what should she live for? Jack said she have to figure that out for herself. Then he asked her where Charlotte and Thanos were. Saul replied that they were at the academy. Jack explained to her that the academy not only fights, but also learns. That's why they go there, she asked him, so they were learning something different from him. Jack Ballantyre replied that he couldn't teach them anything other than combat. Relationships with other people, the communication process, and so on. This is something he cannot teach them in a small circle. There are people from all over the country in the academy, and if you are surrounded by people, there will be more space for thoughts. He'd like to send her there, but I don't think she's ready yet. Sal admitted that she doesn't get along well with people. He told her not to get so attached to the past. Her past is just the past, nothing more. Sal asked her boss if he was attached to his past. He said he was him, she was her. They are completely different from her. She is still a child, so let her continue to live freely. And let her tell him if she wants to go to the academy. Sal looked at Jack and thought that he was also a child. Suddenly, Guinness called Jack and told him that he had a visitor. Jack was a little surprised. Who could it be? Guinness replied that the man had introduced himself as the head of the Arabesque Guild. When Jack came out to see a bear, a bear claimed that he had brought his money. Jack Ballantyre wondered how he'd managed to find the other half in just 24 hours. A bear who placed an envelope containing anonymous checks from the Continental Exchange in front of the young gentleman. He said that Jack could immediately exchange them for gold. The envelope contained five checks of 100,000 each and one check for 5,000. Jack Ballantyre asked the guild head about the $5,000. He replied that this half was what he could pay now. Then he said he had a few questions. If he answers, he will give another 5000 Jack immediately said that he couldn't answer confidential questions about himself, but he could ask the rest. Jack Ballantyre looked with interest at the head of the city's Arabesque guild, Abera, and asked him what he was interested in. Abera asked the young master if it was true that he, Jack Ballantyre, had actually killed all the mercenaries in the Fentanyl Guild. Jack thought the guy was wondering who was behind him and if he killed them himself. Although they were actually killed by their mentor, the young master replied that he had removed them from the face of the world so that even corpses could not be found. Abero then asked a second question. Is Jack Ballantyre somehow connected to the struggle for the throne in the Tolkien Empire? Jack was genuinely surprised. What did Tolkien have to do with it? How can it be connected to them? An interesting thought crossed the young man's mind, and he said that this time he would ask a bear the question himself. He turned to the guild head and said that it was a good thing that he was looking for information for him. It's also great that he kept his word and returned the money. He likes everything, but the Tolkien Empire? 5,000 gold pieces and another 5,000 in addition. This is not a small amount of money. For them, you can take everything you have from him. Stay up all night because of the urgency, but what does the Tolkien Empire have to do with it? Jack Ballantyr stared into Abir's eyes and asked him, is he obviously looking for new connections? Jack knocked him to the floor and stamped on his chest. 
The young master leaned over the guild leader and asked if he really thought that his minions could become his informants. He knows Abeiru is good at handling things, but now he's made up some extra ones. Jack Ballantyre told a bear bluntly that he had no patron. Then he took his foot off his chest and said that someone had told him that he was going to die soon. But it doesn't look like he's going to kill him, not Jack Ballantyre. He really doesn't need to kill him because he did everything he asked. He feels it himself. What he notices, he doesn't need to know at all. And what he has already noticed, his owners will soon find out. It's a wonder the Tolkien aren't smart enough to figure that out. Jack Ballantyre liked Abiru's professional skills. He thought for a while and asked the youth, can we save him? It could be his new rope to get him out of the shit. Only he has to ask for mercy, and he will. And even if he was killed, he could make him a death knight and give him a chance to avenge himself. The big question is, can Jack Ballantyr use it at all? Jack remembered his mentor saying that he wasn't fit for normal life at all. Of course, he agreed with her because he didn't need to. Charlotte, Thanos, and Cell are all part of the future he will build. Can Abiru be a part of it too? Abiru recoiled in fear and asked the young master who he really was. Jack Ballantyr laughed and said he was ashamed to say it himself. Let him understand for himself. Jack then asked Abera if he liked fishing. He's not talking about boring fishing by the stream, but real fishing. When Taliso entered the Arabesque Guild building, the employee told him that it seemed that the manager was looking for him and he should show up soon. Taliso wondered why the supervisor would suddenly need him. Yesterday, he had such a serious face after working all night. What happened?